Section zero of the Red and the Black. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Peter Dan. The Red and the Black by Stendhal. Translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. Introduction. Some slight sketch of the life and character of Stendhal is particularly necessary to an understanding of Le Rouge et Le Noir, the red and the black, not so much as being the formal stuffing of which introductions are made, but because the book, as a book, stands in the most intimate relation to the author's life and character. The hero, Julien, is no doubt, viewed superficially, a cad, a scoundrel, an assassin, albeit a person who will alternate the moist eye of the sentimentalist with the ferocious grin of the beast of prey. But Stendhal, so far from putting forward any excuses, makes a specific point of wallowing defiantly in his own alleged wickedness. Even assuming that Julien is a villain and that it is my portrait, he wrote shortly after the publication of the book, why quarrel with me? In the time of the emperor, Julien would have passed for a very honest man. I lived in the time of the emperor, so... But what does it matter? Henri Bale was born in 1783 in Grenoble in Dauphiny, the son of a royalist lawyer, situated on the borderland between the gentry and that bourgeoisie which our author was subsequently to chastise with that malice peculiar to those who spring themselves from the class which they despise. The boy's character was a compound of sensibility and hard rebelliousness, virility and introspection. Orphaned of his mother at the age of seven, hated by his father and unpopular with his schoolmates, he spent the orthodox unhappy childhood of the artistic temperament. Winning a scholarship at the École Polytechnique at the age of sixteen, he proceeded to Paris, where, with characteristic independence, he refused to attend the college classes and set himself to study privately in his solitary rooms. In 1800, the influence of his relative, Monsieur Daru, procured him a commission in the French army, and the Marengo campaign gave him an opportunity of practising that Napoleonic worship to which, throughout his life, he remained consistently faithful, for the operation of the philosophical materialism of the French sceptics on an essentially logical and mathematical mind soon swept away all competing claimants for his religious adoration. Almost from his childhood, moreover, he had abominated the Jesuits, and papism is the source of all crimes was, throughout his life, one of his favourite maxims. After the army's triumphant entry into Milan, Bale returned to Grenoble on furlough, whence he dashed off to Paris in pursuit of a young woman to whom he was paying some attention, resigned his commission in the army, and set himself to study with the view of becoming a great man. It is in this period that we find the most marked development in Bale's enthusiasm of psychology. This tendency sprang primarily, no doubt, from his own introspection. For, throughout his life, Bale enjoyed the indisputable and at times dubious luxury of a double consciousness. He invariably carried inside his brain a psychological mirror which reflected every phrase of his emotion with scientific accuracy. And simultaneously, the critical spirit, half genie, half demon inside his brain, would survey, in the semi-detached mood of a keenly interested spectator, the actual emotion itself, applaud or condemn it as the case might be, and ticket the verdict with ample commentations in the psychological register of its own analysis. But this trend to psychology, while, as we have seen to some extent, the natural development of mere self-analysis, was also tinged with a spirit of self-preservation. With a mind which, in spite of its natural physical courage, was morbidly susceptible to ridicule and was only too frequently the dupe of the fear of being duped, Stendhal would scent an enemy in every friend and, as a mere matter of self-protection, set himself to penetrate the secret of every character with which he came into contact. One is also justified in taking into account an honest intellectual enthusiasm which found its vent in deciphering the rarer and more precious manuscripts of the human document. With the exception of a stay in Marseille with his first mistress, Melanie Guillet, a charming actress who had the most refined sentiments and to whom I never gave a sou, 
and a subsequent sojourn in Grenoble, Stendhal remained in Paris till 1806, living, so far as was permitted by the modest allowance of his niggard father, the full life of the literary temperament. The essence, however, of his character was that he was at the same time a man of imagination and a man of action. We consequently find him serving in the Napoleonic campaigns of 1806, 1809 and 1812. He was present at the Battle of Jena, came several times into personal contact with Napoleon, discharged with singular efficiency the administration of the state of Brunswick, and retained his sang-froid and his bravery during the whole of the panic-stricken retreat of the Moscow campaign. It is, moreover, to this period that we date Stendhal's liaison with Madame Daru, the wife of his aged relative Monsieur Daru. This particular intrigue has, moreover, a certain psychological importance in that Madame de Roux constituted the model on whom Matilda de la Mole was drawn in The Red and the Black. The student and historian, consequently, who is anxious to check how far the novelist is drawing on his experience and how far on his imagination, can compare with profit the description of the Matilda episode in The Red and the Black with those sections in Stendhal's journal entitled the Life and Sentiments of Silentious Harry, Memoirs of My Life During My Amour with Comtesse Palfrey, and also with the posthumous fragment Le Consultation de Bonte, a piece of methodical deliberation on the pressing question Dois-je ou dois-je pas avoir la duchesse? written with all the documentary coldness of a government report. It is characteristic that both Bancy and Julien decide in the affirmative as a matter of abstract principle, for they both feel that they must necessarily reproach themselves in after life if they miss so signal an opportunity. Disgusted by the restoration, Stendhal migrated in 1814 to Milan, his favourite town in Europe, whose rich and varied life he savoured to the full, from the celebrated ices in the entreat of the opera to the reciprocated interest of Madame Angelina Petra Grua, the Duchess de San Severina of the Chartreuse of Parma, a sublime wanton a la Lucrezia Borgia, who would appear to have deceived him systematically. It was in Milan that Stendhal first began to write for publication, producing in 1814 The Lives of Haydn and Mozart, and in 1817 a series of travel sketches, Rome, Naples, Florence, which was published in London. It was in Milan also that Stendhal first nursed the abstract thrills of his grand passion for Matilda Countess Dunbovska, whose angelic sweetness would seem to have served at any rate to some extent as a prototype to the character of Madame de Renal. In 1821 the novelist was expelled from Milan on the apparently unfounded accusation of being a French spy. It is typical of that mixture of brute sensuality and rarefied sentimentalism, which is one of the most fascinating features of Stendhal's character, that even though he had never loved more than the lady's heart, he should have remained for three years faithful to this mistress of his ideal. In 1822, Stendhal published his treatise De l'Amour, a practical scientific treatise on the erotic emotion by an author who possessed the unusual advantage of being at the same time an acute psychologist and a brilliant man of the world, who could test abstract theories by concrete practice, and could coordinate what he had felt in himself and observe in others into broad general principles. In 1825, Stendhal, plunging vigorously into the controversy between the classicists and the romanticists, published his celebrated pamphlet Racine and Shakespeare, in which he vindicated with successful crispness the claims of live verse against stereotyped couplets and of modern analysis against historical tradition. His next work was The Life of Rossini, whom he had known personally in Milan, while in 1827 he published his first novel, Armands, which, while not equal to the author's greatest work, gives nonetheless good promise of that analytical dash which he was subsequently to manifest. After Armands comes the well-known Promenade Rome, while the Stendhalian masterpiece Le Rouge et le Noir was presented in 1830 to an unappreciative public. Enthusiasm for this book is the infallible test of your true Stendhalian. 
Some critics may prefer, possibly, the more Jamesian delicacy of Armand's, and others, fortified by the example of Goethe, may avow their predilection for the Chartreuse de Palme, with all the jeune premier charm of its amiable hero. But in our view, no book by Stendhal is capable of giving the reader such intellectual thrills as that work which has been adjudged to be his greatest by Balzac, by Taine, by Bourget. Certainly no other book by Stendhal than that which has conjured up Rougiste in all countries in Europe has been the object of a cult in itself. We doubt, moreover, if there is any other modern book, whether by Stendhal or anyone else, which has actually been learnt by heart by its devotees, who, if we may borrow the story told by Monsieur Paul Bourget, are accustomed to challenge the authenticity of each other's knowledge by starting off with some random passage, only to find it immediately taken up, as though the book had been the very Bible itself. The more personal appeal of what is perhaps the greatest romance of the intellect ever written lies in the character of Julien, its villain hero. In view of the identification of Julien with Stendhal himself, to which we have already alluded, it is only fair to state that Stendhal does not appear to have ever been a tutor in a bourgeois family, nor does history relate his ever having made any attempt at the homicide of a woman. So far, in fact, as what we may call the external physical basis of the story is concerned, the material is supplied not by the life of the author, but by the life of a young student of Bessinson of the name of Berthe, who duly expiated on the threshold that crime which supplied the plot of this immortal novel. But the soul, the brain of Julien, is not Berthe, but Bale. And what indeed is the whole book, if not a vindication of Baalism, if we may use that word, coined by the man himself for his own outlook on life? For the procedure of Stendhal would seem to have placed his own self in his hero's shoes, to have lived in imagination his whole life, and to have recorded his experience with a wealth of analytic detail, which, in spite of some arrogance, is yet both honest and scientific. And the life of this scoundrel, this ingrate, this assassin, certainly seems to have been eminently worth living. In its line, indeed, it constitutes a veritable triumph of idealism, a positive monument of self-help. For, guided by the code of the revolution, when the career was open to talents, the goodness or badness of a man was determined by the use he made of his opportunities. Efficiency was the supreme test of virtue as was failure, the one brand of unworthiness. And measured by these values, Julien ranks high as an ethical saint. For does he not sacrifice everything to the forgiving of his character and the hammering out of his career? He is by nature nervous. He forces himself to be courageous, fighting a duel or capturing a woman, less out of thirst for blood or hunger for flesh, than because he thinks it due to his own parvenu self-respect to give himself some concrete proof on his own moral force. Pose and affection will sneer those enemies whom he will have today as assuredly as he had them in his lifetime, the smug bourgeois and valeno of our present age. But the spirit of Julien will retort, I made myself master of my affectation, and I succeeded in my pose. And will he not have logic on his side? For what, after all, is pose but the pursuit of a subjective ideal, grotesque, no doubt, in failure, but dignified by its success? And, as M. Gautier has shown in his book on Bovarism, is not all human progress simply the deliberate change from what one is into what one is not yet, but what, nevertheless, one has a tendency to be? Viewed from this standpoint, Julien's character is what one feels justified in calling a bona fide pose. For, speaking broadly, his character is twofold half-sensitive tenderness, half-ferocious ambition, and his pose simply consists in the subordination of his softer qualities for the more effective realisation of his harder. Considered on these lines, Le Rouge et le Noir stands preeminent in European literature as the tragedy of energy and ambition, the epic of the struggle for existence, the modern Bible of Nietzschean self-discipline. And from the sheer romantic aspect also, the book has its own peculiar charm. 
How truly poetic, for instance, are the passages where Julien takes his own mind alone into the mountains, plots out his own fate, and symbolises his own solitary life in the lonely circlings of a predatory hawk. Julien's enemies will no doubt taunt him with his introspection, while they point to a character distorted, so they say, by the eternal mirror of its own consciousness. Yet it should be remembered that Julien lived in an age when introspection had, so to speak, been only recently invented, and Byronism and Werterism were the stock food of artistic temperaments. In the case of Julien, moreover, even though his own criticisms of his own acts were to some extent as important to him as the actual acts themselves, his introspection was more a strength than a weakness, and never blunted the edge of his drastic action. Compare, for instance, the character of Julien with the character of Robert Greyloux, the hero of Bourget's Le Disciple, and the nearest analogue to Julien in fin de siècle literature, and one will appreciate at once the difference between health and decadence, virility and hysteria. One of the most essential features of the book, however, is the swing of the pendulum between Julien's ambition and Julien's tenderness for our hunter is quite frequently caught in his own traps, so that he falls genuinely in love with the woman whom, as a matter of abstract principle, he had specifically set himself to conquer. The book, consequently, as a romance of love, ranks almost as high as it does as a romance of ambition. The final ideal in prison with Madame de Reynal, in particular, is one of the sweetest and purest in literature, painted in colours too true ever to be florid, steeped in a sentiment too deep ever to be mawkish. As, moreover, orthodox and suburban minds tend to regard all French novels as specifically devoted to obscene wallowings, it seems only relevant to mention that Stendhal, at any rate, never finds in sensualism any inspiration for ecstatic rhapsodies, and that he narrates the most specific episodes in the chastest style imaginable. Though, too, the sinister figure of the carpenter's son looms large over the book, the characterization of all the other personages is portrayed with consummate brilliancy. For Stendhal, standing first outside his characters, with all the sceptical scrutiny of a detached observer, then goes deep inside them, so that he describes not merely what they do, but why they do it, not merely what they think, but why they think it, while he assigns their respective share to innate disposition, accident and environment, and criticises his creations with an irony that is only occasionally benevolent. For it must be confessed that Stendhal approves of extremely few people. True scion of the middle classes, he hates the bourgeois because he is bourgeois, and is aristocrat because he is aristocrat. Nevertheless, as a gallery of the most varied characters, patricians and plebeians, prudes and profligates, Jesuits and Jansenists, kings and coachmen, bishops and bourgeois, whose mutual difference act as a most effective foil to each other's reality, Le Rouge et le Noir will beat any novel outside Balzac. We would mention in particular those two contrasted figures, Madame de Reynal, the bourgeois passionné, and Matilda de la Mole, the noble damoiselle who enters into her intrigue out of a deliberate wish to emulate the exploits of a romantic ancestress. But after all, these individuals stand out not so much because their characterization is better than that of their fellow personages, but because it is more elaborate. Even such minor characters, for instance, as de Frier, the lascivious Jesuit, Noirot, the avaricious jailer, Madame de Favarque, the amoristic prude, are all in their respective ways real, vivid, convincing, no mere padded figures of the imagination, but observed actualities swung from the lived life on the written page. The style of Stendhal is noticeable for its simplicity, clear and cold, devoid of all literary artifice, characteristic of his analytic purpose. He is strenuous in his avoidance of affection. Though, however, he never holds out his style as an aesthetic delight in itself, he reaches occasionally passages of a rare and simple beauty. We would refer in particular to the description of Julien in the mountains, which we have already mentioned, and to the short but impressive death scene. His habit, however, of using language as a means and never as an end, occasionally revenges itself upon him in places where the style, though intelligible, is nonetheless slovenly, anacoluthic, almost 
Thucydidean. After the publication of Le Rouge et le Noir, Stendhal was forced by his financial embarrassment to leave Paris and take up the post of consul at Trieste. Driven from this position by the intrigues of a vindictive church, he was transferred to Civita Vecchia, where he remained till 1835, solacing his ennui by the compilation of his autobiography and thinking seriously of marriage with the rich and highly respectable daughter of his laundress. He then returned to Paris, where he remained till 1842, where he died suddenly at the age of 59, in the full swing of all his mental and physical activities. His later works included La Chartreuse de Parma, Lucien, Luen and Lémiel, of which the Chartreuse is the most celebrated, but Lémiel certainly the most sprightly. But it is on Le Rouge et le Noir that his fame as a novelist is the most firmly based. It is with this most personal document, this record of his experiences and emotions, that he lives identified, just as D'Annunzio will live identified with Il Fuoco or Mr. Wells with the new Machiavelli. Le Rouge et le Noir is the greatest novel of its age and one of the greatest novels of the whole 19th century. It is full to the brim of intellect and adventure, introspection and action, youth, romance, tenderness, cynicism and rebellion. It is, in a word, the intellectual quintessence of the Napoleonic era. Horace B. Samuel, Temple October 1913 End of section 0Section 1 of The Red and the Black by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 1. A Small Town. Put thousands together less bad, but the cage less gay. Hobbes. The little town of Verrières can pass for one of the prettiest in Franche-Comté, its white houses, with their pointed red tile roofs, stretch along the slope of a hill whose slightest undulations are marked by groups of vigorous chestnuts. The Doubs flows to within some hundred feet above its fortifications, which were built long ago by the Spaniards, and are now in ruins. Ferrier is sheltered on the north by a high mountain, which is one of the branches of the Jura. The jagged peaks of the Vera are covered with snow from the beginning of the October frosts. A torrent which rushes down from the mountains traverses Verrier before throwing itself into the Doubs and supplies the motive power for a great number of sawmills. The industry is very simple and secures a certain prosperity to the majority of the inhabitants who are more peasant than bourgeois. It is not, however, the wood saws which have enriched this little town. It is the manufacture of painted tiles, called Mulhouse tiles, that is responsible for the general affluence which has caused the facades of nearly all the houses in Verrières to be rebuilt since the fall of Napoleon. One has scarcely entered the town before one is stunned by the din of a strident machine of terrifying aspect. Twenty heavy hammers which fall with a noise that makes the paved floor tremble are lifted up by a wheel set in motion by the torrent, each of these hammers manufactures every day I don't know how many thousands of nails. The little pieces of iron which are rapidly transformed into nails by these enormous hammers are put in position by fresh, pretty young girls. This labour, so rough at first sight, is one of the industries which most surprises the traveller who penetrates for the first time the mountains which separate France and Helvetia. If, when he enters Verrières, the traveller asks who owns this fine nail factory which deafens everybody who goes up the Grande Rue, he is answered in a drawling tone, Ah, it belongs to Monsieur le Maire. And if the traveller stops a few minutes in that Grande Rue of Verrières which goes on an upward incline from the banks of the Doubs to nearly as far as the summit of the hill, it is a hundred to one that he will see a big man with a busy and important air. When he comes into sight, all hats are quickly taken off. His hair is grizzled, and he is dressed in grey. He is a knight of several orders, has a large forehead and an aquiline nose, and if you take him all round, his features are not devoid of certain regularity. 
One might even think on the first inspection that it combines with the dignity of the village mayor that particular kind of comfortableness which is appropriate to the age of forty-eight or fifty. But soon the traveller from Paris will be shocked by a certain air of self-satisfaction and self-complacency mingled with an almost indefinable narrowness and lack of inspiration. One realises at last that this man's talent is limited to seeing that he is paid exactly what he is owed and in paying his own debts at the latest possible moment. Such is Monsieur de Renal, the mayor of Verrier. After having crossed the road with a solemn step, he enters the mayoral residence and disappears from the eye of the traveller. But if the latter continues to walk a hundred steps further up, he will perceive a house with a fairly fine appearance, with some magnificent gardens behind an iron grill belonging to the house. Beyond that is an horizon line formed by the hills of Burgundy, which seem ideally made to delight the eyes. This view causes the traveller to forget that pestilential atmosphere of petty money-grubbing by which he is beginning to be suffocated. He is told that this house belongs to Monsieur de Renal. It is to the profits which he has made out of his big nail factory that the mayor of Verrier owes this fine residence of hewn stone which he is just finishing. His family is said to be Spanish and ancient, and is alleged to have been established in the country well before the conquest of Louis XIV. Since 1815 he blushes at being a manufacturer. 1815 made him mayor of Verrier. The terraced walls of this magnificent garden, which descends to the Doubs, plateau by plateau, also represent the reward of Mr. de Renal's proficiency in the iron trade. Do not expect to find in France those picturesque gardens which surround the manufacturing towns of Germany, like Leipzig, Frankfurt, or Nuremberg, etc. The more walls you build in Franche-Comte, and the more you fortify your estate with piles of stone, the more claims you will acquire on the respect of your neighbours. Another reason for the admiration due to Monsieur de Renal's gardens and their numerous walls is the fact that he has purchased, through sheer power of the purse, certain small parcels of the ground on which they stand. That sawmill, for instance, whose singular position on the banks of the Doubs struck you when you entered Verrier, and where you noticed the name of Sorel, written in gigantic characters on the chief beam of the roof, used to occupy, six years ago, that precise space on which is now reared the wall of the fourth terrace in Monsieur de Renal's gardens. Proud man that he was, the mayor had nonetheless to negotiate with that tough, stubborn peasant old Sorel. He had to pay him in good, solid, golden louis before he could induce him to transfer his workshop elsewhere. As to the public stream which supplied the motive power for the sawmill, Monsieur de Renal obtained its diversion thanks to the influence which he enjoyed at Paris. This favour was accorded to him after the election of 1820 blank. He gave Sorel four acres for every one he had previously held, 500 yards lower down on the banks of the Doubs. Although this position was much more advantageous for his pine plank trade, Father Sorel, as he is called since he has become rich, knew how to exploit the impatience and mania for landed ownership which animated his neighbour to the tune of 6,000 francs. It is true that this arrangement was criticised by the wiseacres of the locality. One day, it was on a Sunday, four years later, as Monsieur de Renal was coming back from church in his mayor's uniform, he saw old Sorel smiling at him as he stared at him some distance away, surrounded by his three sons. That smile threw a fatal flood of light into the soul of the mayor. From that time on, he is of opinion that he could have obtained the exchange at a cheaper rate. In order to win the public esteem of Verrier, it is essential that, though you should build as many walls as you can, you should not adopt some plan imported from Italy by those masons who cross the passes of the Jura in the spring on their way to Paris. Such an innovation would bring down upon the head of the imprudent builder an eternal reputation for wrong-headedness, and he will be lost forever in the sight of those wise, well-balanced people who dispense public esteem in Franche-Comté. As a matter of fact, these prudent people exercise in the place the most offensive despotism. 
It is by reason of this awful word that anyone who has lived in that great republic which is called Paris finds living in little towns quite intolerable. The tyranny of public opinion, and what public opinion, is as stupid in the little towns of France as in the United States of America. End of section 1「Section 2 of The Red and the Black » by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 2. A Mayor. Importance! What is it, sir, after all? The respect of fools, the wonder of children, the envy of the rich, the contempt of the wise man. Barnav. Happily for the reputation of Monsieur de Renal as an administrator, an immense wall of support was necessary for the public promenade which goes along the hill, a hundred steps above the course of the Doubs. This admirable position secures for the promenade one of the most picturesque views in the whole of France. But the rainwater used to make furrows in the walk every spring, caused ditches to appear, and rendered it generally impracticable. This nuisance, which was felt by the whole town, put M. de Renal in the happy position of being compelled to immortalise his administration by building a wall twenty feet high and thirty to forty yards long. The parapet of this wall, which occasioned M. de Renal three journeys to Paris, for the last Minister of the Interior but one had declared himself the mortal enemy of the Promenade de Verrières, is now raised to a height of four feet above the ground, and as though to defy all ministers, whether past or present, it is at present adorned with tiles of hewn stone. How many times have my looks plunged into the valley of the Doubs as I thought of the Paris balls which I had abandoned on the previous night, and leant my breast against the great blocks of stone, whose beautiful grey almost verged on blue. Beyond the left bank there wind five or six valleys, at the bottom of which I could see quite distinctly several small streams. There is a view of them falling into the Doubs after a series of cascades. The sun is very warm in these mountains. When it beats straight down, the pensive traveller on the terrace finds shelter under some magnificent plane trees. They owe their rapid growth and their fine verdure, with its almost bluish shade, to the new soil which M. Le Maire has had placed behind his immense wall of support, for, in spite of the opposition of the municipal council, he has enlarged the promenade by more than six feet, and although he is an ultra, and I am a liberal, I praise him for it. And that is why both in his opinion, and in that of M. Valenod, the fortunate director of the workhouse of Verrières, this terrace can brook comparison with that of Saint-Germain-en-Laye. I find, personally, only one thing at which to cavil in the Cour de la Fidelité. This official name is to be read in fifteen to twenty places on those immortal tiles which earned M. de Renal an extra cross. The grievance I find in the Cour de la Fidelité is the barbarous manner in which the authorities have cut these vigorous plane trees and clipped them to the quick. In fact, they really resemble, with their dwarfed, rounded and flattened heads, the most vulgar plants of the vegetable garden, while they are really capable of attaining the magnificent development of the English plane trees. But the wish of Monsieur the Mayor is despotic, and all the trees belonging to the municipality are ruthlessly pruned twice a year. The local liberals suggest but they are probably exaggerating, that the hand of the official gardener has become much more severe since Monsieur the Vicar Maslon started appropriating the clippings. This young ecclesiastic was sent to Bessinson some years ago to keep watch on the Abbe Chalin and some cures in the neighbouring districts. An old surgeon major of Napoleon's Italian army who was living in retirement at Verrier and who had been in his time described by Monsieur the Mayor as both a Jacobin and a Bonapartiste, dared to complain to the Mayor one day of the periodic mutilation of these fine trees. "'I like the shade,' answered Monsieur de Renal, with just a tinge of that hauteur which becomes a Mayor when he is talking to a surgeon who is a member of the Legion of Honour. "'I like the shade. I have my trees clipped in order to give shade, and I cannot conceive that a tree can have any other purpose.' provided, of course, it is not bringing in any profit like the useful walnut tree. This is the great word which is all decisive at Verrières. 
bringing in profit. This word alone sums up the habitual trend of thought of more than three quarters of the inhabitants. Bringing in profit is the consideration which decides everything in this little town which you thought so pretty. The stranger who arrives in the town is fascinated by the beauty of the fresh deep valleys which surround it, and he imagines at first that the inhabitants have an appreciation of the beautiful. They talk only too frequently of the beauty of their country, and it cannot be denied that they lay great stress on it, but the reason is that it attracts a number of strangers whose money enriches the innkeepers, a process which brings in profit to the town, owing to the machinery of the octroi. It was on a fine autumn day that M. de Renal was taking a promenade on the Cour de la Fidelité with his wife on his arm. While listening to her husband, who was talking in a somewhat solemn manner, Madame de Renal followed anxiously with her eyes the movements of three little boys. The eldest, who might have been eleven years old, went too frequently near the parapet and looked as though he was going to climb up it. A sweet voice then pronounced the name of Adolphe, and the child gave up his ambitious project. Madame de Renal seemed a woman of thirty years of age, but still fairly pretty. "'He may be sorry for it, may this fine gentleman from Paris,' said Monsieur de Renal, with an offended air, and a face even paler than usual. "'I am not without a few friends at court.' But though I want to talk to you about the provinces for two hundred pages, I lack the requisite barbarity to make you undergo all the long-windedness and circumlocutions of a provincial dialogue. This fine gentleman from Paris, who was so odious to the mayor of Verrières, was no other than the Monsieur Appert, who had, two days previously, managed to find his way not only into the prison and workhouse of Verrières, but also into the hospital, which was gratuitously conducted by the mayor and the principal proprietors of the district. But, said Madame de Renal timidly, what harm can this Paris gentleman do you, since you administer the poor fund with the utmost scrupulous honesty? He only comes to throw blame, and afterwards he will get some articles into the liberal press. You never read them, my dear. But they always talk to us about those Jacobin articles. All that distracts us and prevents us from doing good. Personally, I shall never forgive the curé. End of section 2《Section Section Three of *The Red and the Black* by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter Three: The Poor Fund. A virtuous curé who does not intrigue is a providence for the village. Fleury. It should be mentioned that the curé of Verrières, an old man of ninety, who owed to the bracing mountain air an iron constitution and an iron character, had the right to visit the prison, the hospital, and the workhouse at any hour. It had been at precisely six o'clock in the morning that Monsieur Appert, who had a Paris recommendation to the curé, had been shrewd enough to arrive at a little inquisitive town. He had immediately gone to the curé's house. The curé Chalem became pensive as he read the letter written to him by the Monsieur le Marquis de la Mole, peer of France, and the richest landed proprietor of the province. "'I am old and beloved here,' he said to himself in a whisper. "'They would not dare.' Then he suddenly turned to the gentleman from Paris, with eyes which, in spite of his great age, shone with that sacred fire which betokens the delight of doing a fine but slightly dangerous act. "'Come with me, sir,' he said, "'but please do not express any opinion of the things which we shall see "'in the presence of the jailer, "'and above all not in the presence of the superintendents of the workhouse.' Monsieur Appert realised that he had to do with a man of spirit. He followed the venerable curé, visited the hospital and workhouse, put a lot of questions, but in spite of somewhat extraordinary answers, did not indulge in the slightest expression of censure. This visit lasted several hours. The curé invited Monsieur Appert to dine, but the latter made the excuse of having some letters to write. As a matter of fact, he did not wish to compromise his generous companion to any further extent. About three o'clock, these gentlemen went to finish their inspection of the workhouse and then returned to the prison. 
There they found the jailer by the gate, a kind of giant six feet high with bow legs. His ignoble face had become hideous by reason of his terror. Ah, monsieur, he said to the curé as soon as he saw him, is not the gentleman whom I see there monsieur Appert? What does that matter? said the curé. The reason is that I received yesterday the most specific orders, and Monsieur the Prefect sent a message by a gendarme, who must have galloped during the whole of the night, that Monsieur Appert was not to be allowed in the prisons. I can tell you, Monsieur Noirot, said the curé, that the traveller who is with me is Monsieur Appert, but do you or do you not admit that I have the right to enter the prison at any hour of the day or night, accompanied by anybody I choose? "'Yes, Monsieur the Curé,' said the jailer in a low voice, lowering his head like a bulldog, induced to a grudging obedience by fear of the stick. "'Only, Monsieur the Curé, I have a wife and children, and shall be turned out if they inform against me. I only have my place to live on. "'I, too, should be sorry enough to lose mine,' answered the good Curé, with increasing emotion in his voice. "'What a difference,' answered the jailer keenly. As for you, Monsieur le Curé, we all know that you have eight hundred francs a year, good solid money. Such were the facts which, commented upon and exaggerated in twenty different ways, had been agitating for the last two days all the odious passions of the little town of Verrières. At the present time they served as a text for the little discussion which Monsieur de Renal was having with his wife. He had visited the curé earlier in the morning, accomplished by Monsieur Valenod, the director of the workhouse, in order to convey their most emphatic displeasure. Monsieur Chalon had no protector, and felt all the weight of their words. "'Well, gentlemen, I shall be the third curé of eighty years of age who has been turned out in this district. I have been here for fifty-six years.' I have baptised nearly all the inhabitants of the town, which was only a hamlet when I came to it. Every day I marry young people whose grandparents I have married in days gone by. Very air is my family, but I said to myself when I saw the stranger, this man from Paris may, as a matter of fact, be a liberal. There are only too many of them about, but what harm can he do to our poor and to our prisoners?' The reproaches of Monsieur de Renal, and above all those of Monsieur Valenod, the director of the workhouse, became more and more animated. "'Well, gentlemen, turn me out, then,' the old curé exclaimed in a trembling voice. "'I shall still continue to live in the district. As you know, I inherited forty-eight years ago a piece of land that brings in eight hundred francs a year. I shall live on that income.' I do not save anything out of my living, gentlemen, and that is perhaps why, when you talk to me about it, I am not particularly frightened. Monsieur de Renal always got on very well with his wife, but he did not know what to answer when she timidly repeated the phrase of Monsieur le Curé, What harm can this Paris gentleman do to the prisoners? He was on the point of quite losing his temper when she gave a cry. Her second son had mounted the parapet of the terrace wall and was running along it, although the wall was raised to a height of more than twenty feet above the vineyard on the other side. The fear of frightening her son and making him fall prevented Madame de Renal speaking to him. But at last the child, who was smiling at his own pluck, looked at his mother, saw her pallor, jumped down onto the walk and ran to her. He was well scolded. This little event changed the course of the conversation. I really do mean to take Sorel, the son of the sawyer, into the house, said Monsieur de Renal. He will look after the children, who are getting too naughty for us to manage. He is a young priest, or as good as one, a good Latin scholar, and will make the children get on. According to the curé, he has a steady character. I will give him three hundred francs a year, and his board. I have some doubts as to his morality, for he used to be the favourite of that old surgeon major, member of the Legion of Honour, who went to board with the Sorels on the pretext that he was their cousin. It is quite possible that the man was really simply a secret agent of the Liberals. He said that the mountain air did his asthma good, but that is something which has never been proved. He has gone through all Bonaparte's campaigns in Italy, and had even, it was said, voted against the Empire in the plebiscite. This Liberal taught the Sorel boy Latin, and left him a number of books which he had brought with him. 
Of course, in the ordinary way, I should never have thought of allowing a carpenter's son to come into contact with our children, but the curate told me, the very day before the scene, which is just as strange as forever, that Sorel has been studying theology for three years with the intention of entering a seminary. He is, consequently, not a liberal, and he certainly is a good Latin scholar. This arrangement will be convenient in more than one way, continued Monsieur de Ranal, looking at his wife with a diplomatic air. That Valinod is proud enough of his two fine Norman horses which he has just bought for his carriage, but he hasn't a tutor for his children. He might take this one away from us. You approve of my plan, then, said Monsieur de Ranal, thanking his wife with a smile for the excellent idea which he had just had. Well, that's settled. Good gracious, my dear, how quickly you make up your mind. It is because I am a man of character, as the curé found out right enough. Don't let us deceive ourselves. We are surrounded by liberals in this place. All those cloth merchants are jealous of me. I'm certain of it. Two or three are becoming rich men. Well, I should rather fancy it for them to see Monsieur de Renal's children pass along the street as they go out for their walk, escorted by their tutor. It will impress people. My grandfather often used to tell us that he had a tutor when he was young. It may run me into a hundred crowns, but that ought to be looked upon as an expense necessary for keeping up our position. This sudden resolution left Madame de Renal quite pensive. She was a big, well-made woman, who had been the beauty of the country, to use the local expression. She had a certain air of simplicity and youthfulness in her deportment. This naive grace, with its innocence and its vivacity, might even have recalled to a Parisian some suggestion of the sweets he had left behind him. If she had realised this particular phase of her success, Madame de Renard would have been quite ashamed of it. All coquetry, all affectation, were absolutely alien to her temperament. Monsieur Valenot, the rich director of the workhouse, had the reputation of having paid her court, a fact which had cast a singular glamour over her virtue, for this Monsieur Valenod, a big young man with his square, sturdy frame, florid face and big black whiskers, was one of those coarse, blustering and noisy people who pass in the provinces for a fine man. Madame de Renal, who had a very shy and apparently a very uneven temperament, was particularly shocked by Monsieur Valenod's lack of repose and by his boisterous loudness. Her aloofness from what, in the very air jargon, was called having a good time had earned her the reputation of being very proud of her birth. In fact, she never thought about it, but she had been extremely glad to find the inhabitants of the town visit her less frequently. We shall not deny that she passed for a fool in the eyes of their good ladies because she did not wheedle her husband and allowed herself to miss the most splendid opportunities of getting fine hats from Paris or Besançon. Provided she was allowed to wander in her beautiful garden, she never complained. She was a naive soul, who had never educated herself up to the point of judging her husband and confessing to herself that he bored her. She supposed, without actually formulating the thought, that there was no greater sweetness in the relationship between husband and wife than she herself had experienced. She loved Monsieur de Renal most when he talked about his projects for their children. The elder he had destined for the army, the second for the law, and the third for the church. To sum up, she found Monsieur de Renal much less boring than all the other men of her acquaintance. This conjugal opinion was quite sound. The mayor of Verrier had a reputation for wit, and above all a reputation for good form on the strength of half a dozen chestnuts which he had inherited from an uncle. Old Captain de Renal had served before the Revolution in the infantry regiment of Monsieur the Duke of Orléans, and was admitted to the Prince's Salon when he went to Paris. He had seen Madame de Montesson, the famous Madame de Genlis, Monsieur Ducre, the inventor of the Palais Royal. These personages would crop up only too frequently in Monsieur de Renal's anecdotes. He found it, however, more and more of a strain to remember stories which required such delicacy in the telling, and for some time past it had only been on great occasions that he would trot out his anecdotes concerning the House of Orléans. As, moreover, he was extremely polite, except on money matters, he passed, and justly so, 
for the most aristocratic personage in Verrier. End of section 3《Sex and Four of the Red and the Black》by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter Four: A Father and Son. E Sara mia colpa se così è, Machiavelli. My wife really has her head on her shoulders," said the mayor of Verrieres at six o'clock the following morning, as he went down to the sawmill of Father Sorel. It had never occurred to me that if I did not take little Abbe Sorel, who they say knows Latin like an angel, that restless spirit, the director of the workhouse, might have the same idea and snatch him away from me. Though of course I told him that it had, in order to preserve my proper superiority. And how smugly, to be sure, would he talk about his children's tutor? The question is, once the tutor's mine, shall he wear the cassock? Monsieur de Renal was absorbed in this problem when he saw a peasant in the distance, a man nearly six feet tall, who since dawn had apparently been occupied in measuring some piece of wood which had been put down alongside the doube on the towing path. The peasant did not look particularly pleased when he saw Monsieur le Maire approach, as these pieces of wood obstructed the road and had been placed there in breach of the rules. Father Sorel, for it was he, was very surprised and even more pleased at the singular offer which M. de Renal made him for his son, Julien. Nonetheless, he listened to it with that air of sulky discontent and apathy which the subtle inhabitants of these mountains know so well how to assume. Slaves, as they have been since the time of the Spanish conquest, they still preserve this feature, which is also found in the character of the Egyptian Fala. Sorel's answer was at first simply a long-winded recitation of all the formulas of respect which he knew by heart. While he was repeating these empty words with an uneasy smile, which accentuated all the natural disingenuousness, if not indeed knavishness, of his physiognomy, the active mind of the old peasant tried to discover what reason could induce so important a man to take into his house his good-for-nothing of a son. He was very dissatisfied with Julien and it was for Julien that M. de Renal offered the undreamt-of salary of three hundred francs a year, with board and even clothing. This latter claim, which Father Sorel had had the genius to spring upon the mayor, had been granted with equal suddenness by M. de Renal. This demand made an impression on the mayor. It is clear, he said to himself, that since Sorel is not beside himself with delight over my proposal, as in the ordinary way he ought to be, he must have had offers made to him elsewhere, and whom could they have come from, if not from Valenod? It was in vain that Monsieur de Renal pressed Sorel to clinch the matter then and there. The old peasant, astute man that he was, stubbornly refused to do so. He wanted, he said, to consult his son, as if in the provinces forsooth a rich father consulted a penniless son for any other reason than as a mere matter of form. A water sawmill consists of a shed by the side of a stream. The roof is supported by a framework resting on four large timber pillars. A saw can be seen going up and down at a height of eight to ten feet in the middle of the shed, while a piece of wood is propelled against this saw by a very simple mechanism. It is a wheel whose motive power is supplied by the stream which sets in motion this double piece of mechanism the mechanism of the saw which goes up and down, and the mechanism which gently pushes the piece of wood towards the saw, which cuts it up into planks. Approaching his workshop, Father Sorel called Julien in his stentorian voice. Nobody answered. He only saw his giant elder sons, who, armed with heavy axes, were cutting up the pine planks which they had to carry to the saw. They were engrossed in following exactly the black mark traced on each piece of wood, from which every blow of their axes threw off enormous shavings. They did not hear their father's voice. The latter made his way towards the shed. He entered it and looked in vain for Julien in the place where he ought to have been by the side of the saw. He saw him five or six feet higher up, sitting astride one of the rafters of the roof. Instead of watching attentively the action of the machinery, Julien was reading. Nothing was more antipathetic to old Sorel. 
He might possibly have forgiven Julien his puny physique, ill-adapted as it was to manual labour, and different as it was from that of his elder brothers, but he hated this reading mania. He could not read himself. It was in vain that he called Julien two or three times. It was the young man's concentration on his book, rather than the din made by the saw, which prevented him from hearing his father's terrible voice. At last the latter, in spite of his age, jumped nimbly on to the tree that was undergoing the action of the saw, and from there on to the crossbar that supported the roof. A violent blow made the book which Julien held go flying into the stream. A second blow on the head, equally violent, which took the form of a box on the ears, made him lose his balance. He was on the point of falling twelve or fifteen feet lower down into the middle of the levers of the running machinery, which would have cut him to pieces, but his father caught him as he fell in his left hand. "'So that's it, is it, lazy bones? Always going to read your damn books, are you, when you're keeping watch on the saw? You read them in the evening, if you want to, when you go to play the fool at the cure's. That's the proper time.' Although stunned by the force of the blow and bleeding profusely, Julien went back to his official post by the side of the saw. He had tears in his eyes, less by reason of the physical pain than on account of the loss of his beloved book. "'Get down, you beast, when I am talking to you!' The noise of the machinery prevented Julien from hearing this order. His father, who had gone down, did not wish to give himself the trouble of climbing up onto the machinery again, and went to fetch a long fork used to bringing down nuts with which he struck him on the shoulder. Julien had scarcely reached the ground when old Sorel chased him roughly in front of him and pushed him roughly towards the house. "'God knows what he is going to do with me,' said the young man to himself. As he passed, he looked sorrowfully into the stream into which his book had fallen. It was the one that he held dearest of all, the memorial of St. Helena. He had purple cheeks and downcast eyes. He was a young man of eighteen to nineteen years old, and of puny appearance, with irregular but delicate features, and an aquiline nose. The big black eyes, which betokened in their tranquil moments a temperament at once fiery and reflective, were at the present moment animated by an expression of the most ferocious hate. Dark chestnut hair, which came down low over his brow, made his forehead appear small, and gave him a sinister look during his angry moods. It is doubtful if any face out of all the innumerable varieties of the human physiognomy was ever distinguished by a more arresting individuality. A supple, well-knit figure indicated agility rather than strength. His air of extreme pensiveness and his great pallor had given his father the idea that he would not live, or that if he did it would only be to be a burden to his family. The butt of the whole house, he hated his brothers and his father. He was regularly beaten in the Sunday sports in the public square. A little less than a year ago, his pretty face had begun to win him some sympathy among young girls. Universally despised as a weakling, Julien had adored that old surgeon major who had one day dared to talk to the mayor on the subject of the plane trees. This surgeon had sometimes paid Father Sorel for taking his son for a day, and had taught him Latin and history, that is to say, the 1796 campaign in Italy, which was all the history he knew. When he died, he had bequeathed his cross of the Legion of Honour, his arrears of half-pay, and thirty or forty volumes, of which the most precious had just fallen into the public stream, which had been diverted owing to the influence of Monsieur the Mayor. Scarcely had he entered the house when Julien felt his shoulder gripped by his father's powerful hand. He trembled, expecting some blows. "'Answer me without lying!' cried the harsh voice of the old peasant in his ears, while his hand turned him round and round, like a child's hand turns round a lead soldier. The big black eyes of Julien filled with tears, and were confronted by the small grey eyes of the old carpenter, who looked as if he meant to read to the very bottom of his soul. End of section 4《Section 5 of The Red and the Black by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 5 A Negotiation. Coctando restituit rem. Ennius. Answer me without lies, if you can, you damned dog. How did you get to know Madame de Renal? When did you speak to her? 
I have never spoken to her, answered Julian. I have only seen that lady in church. You must have looked at her, you impudent rascal. Not once. You know, I only see God in church, answered Julian, with a little hypocritical air, well suited, so he thought, to keep off the parental claws. Nonetheless, there's something that does not meet the eye, answered the cunning peasant. He was then silent for a moment. But I shall never get anything out of you, you damned hypocrite, he went on. As a matter of fact, I'm going to get rid of you, and my sawmill will go all the better for it. You have nobbled the curate or somebody else who has got you a good place. Run along and pack your traps, and I will take you to Monsieur de Renal's, where you are going to be tutor to his children. What shall I get for that? Board, clothing, and three hundred francs salary. I do not want to be a servant. Who's talking of being a servant, you brute? Do you think I want my son to be a servant? But with whom shall I have my meals? This question discomforted old Sorel, who felt he might possibly commit some imprudence if he went on talking. He burst out against Julien, flung insult after insult at him, accused him of gluttony, and left him to go and consult his other sons. Julien saw them afterwards, each one leaning on his axe and holding counsel. Having looked at them for a long time, Julien saw that he could find out nothing, and went and stationed himself on the other side of the saw in order to avoid being surprised. He wanted to think over this unexpected piece of news, which changed his whole life, but he felt himself unable to consider the matter prudently, his imagination being concentrated in wondering what he would see in Monsieur de Ranal's fine mansion. I must give all that up, he said to himself, rather than let myself be reduced to eating with the servants. My father would like to force me to it. I would rather die. I have fifteen francs and eight sous of saving. I will run away tonight. I will go across country by paths where there are no gendarmes to be feared, and in two days I shall be at Besançon. I will enlist as a soldier there, and if necessary I will cross into Switzerland. But in that case, no more advancement. It will be all up with my being a priest, that fine career which may lead to anything. This abhorrence of eating with the servants was not really natural to Julien. He would have done things quite, if not more, disagreeable in order to get on. He derived this repugnance from the Confessions of Rousseau. It was the only book by whose help his imagination endeavoured to construct the world. The collection of the bulletins of the Grand Army and the memorial of St. Helena completed his Koran. He would have died for these three works. He never believed in any other. To use a phrase of the old surgeon major, he regarded all the other books in the world as packs of lies written by rogues in order to get on. Julien possessed both a fiery soul and one of those astonishing memories which are so often combined with stupidity. In order to win over the old curé Chalon, on whose good grace he realised that his future prospects depended, he had learnt by heart the New Testament in Latin. He also knew Monsieur de Maistre's book on the Pope, and believed in one as little as he did in the other. Sorel and his son avoided talking to each other today as though by mutual consent. In the evening, Julien went to take his theology lesson at the cure's, but he did not consider that it was prudent to say anything to him about the strange proposal which had been made to his father. It is possibly a trap, he said to himself. I must pretend that I have forgotten all about it. Early next morning, Monsieur de Renal had old Sorel summoned to him. He eventually arrived after keeping Monsieur de Renal waiting for an hour and a half, and made as he entered the room a hundred apologies interspersed with as many bows. After having run the gauntlet of all kinds of objections, Sorel was given to understand that his son would have his meals with the master and mistress of the house, and that he would eat alone in a room with the children on the days when they had company. The more clearly Sorel realised the genuine eagerness of Monsieur the Mayor, the more difficulties he felt inclined to raise. Being, moreover, full of mistrust and astonishment, he asked to see the room where his son would sleep. It was a big room, quite decently furnished, into which the servants were already engaged in carrying the beds of the three children. This circumstance explained a lot to the old peasant. He asked immediately, with quite an air of assurance, to see the suit which would be given to his son. Monsieur de Renal opened his desk and took out one hundred francs. Your son will go to Monsieur Durand, the draper, with this money, and will get a complete black suit. 
And even supposing I take him away from you, said the peasant, who had suddenly forgotten all his respectful formalities, will he still keep this black suit? Certainly. Well, said Cyril in a drawling voice, all that remains to do is to agree on just one thing, the money which you will give him. What? exclaimed M. de Reynal indignantly. We agreed on that yesterday. I shall give him three hundred francs. I think that is a lot, and probably too much. That is your offer, and I do not deny it, said old Sorel, speaking still very slowly, and by a stroke of genius which will only astonish those who do not know the Franche Comte peasants, he fixed his eyes on M. de Renal and added, We shall get better terms elsewhere. The mayor's face exhibited the utmost consternation at these words. He pulled himself together, however, and after a cunning conversation of two hours' length, where every single word on both sides was carefully weighed, the subtlety of the peasant scored a victory over the subtlety of the rich man, whose livelihood was not so dependent on his faculty of cunning. All the numerous stipulations which were to regulate Julien's new existence were duly formulated. Not only was his salary fixed at four hundred francs, but they were to be paid in advance on the first of each month. Very well, I will give him thirty-five francs, said M. de Renal. I am quite sure, said the peasant in a fawning voice, that a rich, generous man like M. Mayer would go as far as thirty-six francs to make up a good round sum. Agreed, said M. de Renal, but let this be final. For the moment his temper gave him a tone of genuine firmness. The peasant saw that it would not do to go any further. Then, on his side, M. de Renal managed to score. He absolutely refused to give old Sorel, who was very anxious to receive it on behalf of his son, the thirty-six francs for the first month. It had occurred to M. de Renal that he would have to tell his wife the figure which he had cut throughout these negotiations. "'Hand me back the hundred francs which I gave you,' he said sharply. M. Durand owes me something. I will go with your son to see about a black cloth suit.' After this manifestation of firmness, Sorel had the prudence to return to his respectful formulas. They took a good quarter of an hour. Finally, seeing that there was nothing more to be gained, he took his leave. He finished his last bow with these words. I will send my son to the chateau. The mayor's officials called his house by this designation when they wanted to humour him. When he got back to his workshop, it was in vain that Sorel sought his son. Suspicious of what might happen, Julien had gone out in the middle of the night. He wished to place his cross of the Legion of Honour and his books in a place of safety. He had taken everything to a young wood merchant named Fouquet, who was a friend of his, and who lived in the high mountain which commands Verrier. "'God knows, you damned lazybones,' said his father to him when he reappeared, "'if you will ever be sufficiently honourable to pay me back the price of your board which I have been advancing to you for so many years.' Take your rags and clear out to Monsieur the Mayor's. Julien was astonished at not being beaten and hastened to leave. He had scarcely got out of sight of his terrible father when he slackened his pace. He considered that it would assist the role played by his hypocrisy to go and say a prayer in the church. The word hypocrisy surprises you? The soul of the peasant had had to go through a great deal before arriving at this horrible word. Julien had seen in the days of his early childhood certain dragoons of the sixth with long white cloaks and hats covered with long black plumed helmets who were returning from Italy and tied up their horses to the grilled window of his father's house. The sight had made him mad on the military profession. Later on he had listened with ecstasy to the narration of the battles of Lodi, Arcola and Rivoli with which the old surgeon major had regaled him. He observed the ardent gaze which the old man used to direct towards his cross. But when Julien was fourteen years of age, they commenced to build a church at Verrières, which, in view of the smallness of the town, has some claim to be called magnificent. There were four marble columns in particular, the sight of which impressed Julien. They became celebrated in the district owing to the mortal hate which they raised between the justice of the peace and the young vicar who had been sent from Bessinson and who passed for a spy of the congregation. The justice of the peace was on the point of losing his place, so said the public opinion at any rate. He had not dared to have a difference with the priest who went every fortnight to Bessinson, where he saw, so they said, my lord the bishop. 
In the meanwhile, the Justice of the Peace, who was the father of a numerous family, gave several sentences which seemed unjust. All these sentences were inflicted on those of the inhabitants who read the Constitutionnel. The right party triumphed. It is true it was only a question of sums of three or five francs, but one of these little fines had to be paid by a nail-maker who was godfather to Julien. This man exclaimed in his anger, What a change! And to think that for more than twenty years the justice of the peace has passed for an honest man. The surgeon major, Julien's friend, died. Suddenly Julien left off talking about Napoleon. He announced his intention of becoming a priest, and was always to be seen in his father's workshop, occupied in learning by heart the Latin Bible which the curé had lent him. The good old man was astonished at his progress, and passed whole evenings in teaching him theology. In his society, Julien did not manifest other than pious sentiments. Who could not possibly guess that beneath his girlish face, so pale and so sweet, lurked the unbreakable resolution to risk a thousand deaths rather than fail to make his fortune? Making his fortune, primarily meant to Julien, getting out of Verrières. He abhorred his native country. Everything that he saw there froze his imagination. He had had moments of exaltation since his earliest childhood. He would then dream with gusto of being presented one day to the pretty women of Paris. He would manage to attract their attention by some dazzling feat. Why should he not be loved by one of them just as Buonaparte, when still poor, had been loved by the brilliant Madame de Beauharnais? For many years past, Julien had scarcely passed a single year of his life without reminding himself that Buonaparte, the obscure and penniless lieutenant, had made himself master of the whole world by the power of his sword. This idea consoled him for his misfortune, which he considered to be great, and rendered such joyful moments as he had doubly intense. The building of the church and the sentences pronounced by the justice of the peace suddenly enlightened him. An idea came to him which made him almost mad for some weeks, and finally took complete possession of him with all the magic that a first idea possesses for a passionate soul which believes that it is original. At the time when Buonaparte got himself talked about, France was frightened of being invaded. Military distinction was necessary and fashionable. Nowadays, one sees priests of forty with salaries of a hundred thousand francs, that is to say, three times as much as Napoleon's famous generals of a division. They need persons to assist them. Look at that justice of the peace. Such a good sort and such an honest man up to the present, and so old, too. He sacrifices his honour through the fear of incurring the displeasure of a young vicar of thirty. I must be a priest. On one occasion, in the middle of his newfound piety, he had already been studying theology for two years, he was betrayed by a sudden burst of fire which consumed his soul. It was at Monsieur Chalon's. The good curé had invited him to a dinner of priests, and he actually let himself praise Napoleon with enthusiasm. He bound his right arm over his breast, pretending that he had dislocated it in moving a trunk of a pine tree, and carried it for two months in that painful position. After this painful penance, he forgave himself. This is the young man of eighteen, with a puny physique, and scarcely looking more than seventeen at the outside, who entered the magnificent church of Verrières, carrying a little parcel under his arm. He found it gloomy and deserted. All the transepts in the building had been covered with crimson cloth in celebration of a feast. The result was that the sun's rays produced an effect of dazzling light of the most impressive and religious character. Julien shuddered. Finding himself alone in the church, he established himself in the pew which had the most magnificent appearance. It bore the arms of Monsieur de Renal. Julien noticed a piece of printed paper spread out on the stool which was apparently intended to be read. He cast his eyes over it and saw details of the execution and the last moments of Louis Jean Rel, executed at Besançon. The, the paper was torn. The first two words of a line were legible on the back. They were the first step. Who could have put this paper there, said Julien. Poor fellow, he added with a sigh. The last syllable of his name is the same as mine, and he crumpled up the paper. As he left, Julien thought he saw blood near the host.
It was holy water which the priest had been sprinkling on it. The reflection of the red curtains which covered the windows made it look like blood. Finally, Julien felt ashamed of his secret terror. Am I going to play the coward, he said to himself. To arms! This phrase, repeated so often in the old surgeon major's battle story, symbolised heroism to Julien. He got up rapidly and walked to Monsieur de Renal's house. As soon as he saw it, twenty yards in front of him, he was seized, in spite of his fine resolution, with an overwhelming timidity. The iron grill was open. He thought it was magnificent. He had to go inside. Julien was not the only person whose heart was troubled by his arrival in the house. The extreme timidity of Madame de Renal was fluttered when she thought of this stranger, whose functions would necessitate his coming between her and her children. She was accustomed to seeing her son sleep in her own room. She had shed many tears that morning when she had seen their beds carried into the apartment intended for the tutor. It was in vain that she asked her husband to have the bed of Stanislas Xavier, the youngest, carried back into her room. Womanly delicacy was carried in Madame de Renal to the point of excess. She conjured up in her imagination the most disagreeable personage who was coarse, badly groomed, and in charge with the duty of scolding her children simply because he happened to know Latin and only too ready to flog her sons for their ignorance of that barbarous language. End of section 5Section 6 of The Red and the Black by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 6. Ennui. Non so più cosa son cosa faccio. Mozart. Figaro. Madame de Renal was going out of the salon by the folding window which opened on to the garden, with that vivacity and grace which was natural to her when she was free from human observation, when she noticed a young peasant near the entrance gate. He was still almost a child, extremely pale, and looked as though he had been crying. He was in a white shirt, and had under his arm a perfectly new suit of violet frieze. The little peasant's complexion was so white and his eyes were so soft that Madame de Renal's somewhat romantic spirit thought at first that it might be a young girl in disguise who had come to ask some favour of the Monsieur the Mayor. She took pity on this poor creature, who had stopped at the entrance of the door and who apparently did not dare to raise its hand to the bell. Madame de Renal approached, forgetting for the moment the bitter chagrin occasioned by the tutor's arrival. Julien, who was turned towards the gate, did not see her advance. He trembled when a soft voice said, quite close to his ear, "'What do you want here, my child?' Julien turned round sharply, and was so struck by Madame de Renal's look, full of graciousness as it was, that up to a certain point he forgot to be nervous. Overcome by her beauty, he soon forgot everything, even what he had come for. Madame de Renal repeated her question. "'I have come here to be tutor, madame,' he said at last, quite ashamed of his tears, which he was drying as best as he could. Madame de Renal remained silent. They had a view of each other at close range. Julien had never seen a human being so well dressed, and above all, he had never seen a woman with so dazzling a complexion speak to him at all softly. Madame de Renal observed the big tears which had lingered on the cheeks of the young peasant those cheeks which had been so pale and were now so pink. Soon she began to laugh with all the mad gaiety of a young girl. She made fun of herself and was unable to realise the extent of her happiness. So this was that tutor whom she had imagined a dirty, badly dressed priest who was coming to scold and flog her children. "'What, monsieur?' she said to him at last. "'You know Latin?' The word monsieur astonished Julien so much that he reflected for a moment. Yes, madame, he said timidly. Madame de Renal was so happy that she plucked up the courage to say to Julien, You will not scold the poor children too much? I scold them, said Julien in astonishment. Why should I? You won't, will you, monsieur? she added after a little silence, in a soft voice whose emotion became more and more intense. You will be nice to them. You promise me? 
to hear himself called Monsieur again in all seriousness by so well-dressed a lady was beyond all Julien's expectations. He had always said to himself in all the castles of Spain that he had built in his youth that no real lady would ever condescend to talk to him except when he had a fine uniform. Madame de Renal, on her side, was completely taken in by Julien's beautiful complexion, his big black eyes and his pretty hair, which was more than usually curly, because he had just plunged his head into the basin of the public fountain in order to refresh himself. She was overjoyed to find that this sinister tutor, whom she had feared to find so harsh and severe to her children, had, as a matter of fact, the timid manner of a girl. The contrast between her fears and what she now saw proved a great event for Madame Renal's peaceful temperament. Finally, she recovered from her surprise. She was astonished to find herself at the gate of her own house, talking in this way and at such close quarters to this young and somewhat scantily dressed man. "'Let us go in, monsieur,' she said to him with a certain air of embarrassment. During Madame de Renal's whole life she had never been so deeply moved by such a sense of pure pleasure. Never had so gracious a vision followed in the wake of her disconcerting fears. So these pretty children of whom she took such care were not, after all, to fall into the hands of a dirty, grumbling priest. She had scarcely entered the vestibule when she turned round toward Julian, who was following her trembling. His astonishment at the sight of so fine a house proved but an additional charm in Madame de Renal's eyes. She could not believe her own eyes. It seemed to her, above all, that the tutor ought to have a black suit. "'But is it true, monsieur?' she said to him, stopping once again, and in mortal fear that she had made a mistake, so happy had her discovery made her. "'Is it true that you know Latin?' These words offended Julien's pride and dissipated the charming atmosphere which he had been enjoying for the last quarter of an hour. "'Yes, madame,' he said, trying to assume an air of coldness. "'I know Latin as well as the curé, who has been good enough to say sometimes that I know it even better.' Madame de Reynal thought that Julien looked extremely wicked. He had stopped two paces from her. She approached and said to him in a whisper, you won't beat my children the first few days, will you, even if they do not know their lessons? The softness and almost supplication of so beautiful a lady made Julien suddenly forget what he owed to his reputation as a Latinist. Madame de Renal's face was close to his own. He smelt the perfume of a woman's summer clothing, a quite astonishing experience for a poor peasant. Julien blushed extremely and said with a sigh in a faltering voice, Fear nothing, madame, I will obey you in everything. It was only now, when her anxiety about her children had been relieved once and for all, that Madame de Renal was struck by Julien's extreme beauty. The comparative effeminacy of his features and his air of extreme embarrassment did not seem in any way ridiculous to a woman who was herself extremely timid. The male air, which is usually considered essential to a man's beauty, would have terrified her. "'How old are you, sir?' she said to Julien. "'Nearly nineteen. "'My elder son is eleven, went on Madame de Renal, "'who had completely recovered her confidence. "'He will be almost a chum for you. "'You will talk sensibly to him. "'His father started beating him once. "'The child was ill for a whole week, "'and yet it was only a little tap. "'What a difference between him and me,' thought Julien. "'Why, it was only yesterday that my father beat me. "'How happy these rich people are!' Madame de Renal, who had already begun to observe the fine nuances of the workings in the tutor's mind, took this fit of sadness for timidity and tried to encourage him. "'What is your name, monsieur?' she said to him, with an accent and a graciousness whose charm Julien appreciated without being able to explain. "'I am called Julien Sorel, madame. I feel nervous of entering a strange house for the first time in my life. I have need of your protection, and I want you to make many allowances for me during the first few days. I have never been to the college. I was too poor. I have never spoken to anyone else except my cousin, who was Surgeon Major, member of the Legion of Honour, and Monsieur the Curé, Chelin. He will give you a good account of me. My brothers always used to beat me, and you must not believe them if they speak badly of me to you. "'You must forgive my faults, madam. I shall always mean everything for the best.' Julien had regained his confidence during this long speech. He was examining Madame de Renal. 
Perfect grace works wonders when it is natural to the character, and above all when the person whom it adorns never thinks of trying to affect it. Julian, who was quite a connoisseur in feminine beauty, would have sworn at this particular moment that she was not more than twenty. The rash idea of kissing her hand immediately occurred to him. He soon became frightened of his idea. A minute later he said to himself, It will be an act of cowardice if I do not carry out an action which may be useful to me and lessen the contempt which this fine lady probably has for a poor workman just taken away from the sawmill. Possibly Julien was a little encouraged through having heard some young girls repeat on Sundays during the last six months the words, Pretty boy. During this internal debate, Madame de Renard was giving him two or three hints on the way to commence handling the children. The strain Julien was putting on himself made him once more very pale. He said with an air of constraint, I will never beat your children, madame. I swear it before God. In saying this, he dared to take madame de Renal's hand and carry it to his lips. She was astonished at this act, and after reflecting became shocked. As the weather was very warm, her arm was quite bare underneath the shawl, and Julien's movement in carrying her hand to his lips entirely uncovered it. After a few moments she scolded herself. It seemed to her that her anger had not been quick enough. Monsieur de Renal, who had heard voices, came out of his study, and assuming the same air of paternal majesty with which he celebrated marriages at the mayoral office, said to Julien, "'It is essential for me to have a few words with you before my children see you.' He made Julien enter a room and insisted on his wife being present, although she wished to leave them alone. Having closed the door, Monsieur Renal sat down. Monsieur the Curé has told me that you are a worthy person, and everybody here will treat you with respect. If I am satisfied with you, I will later on help you in having a little establishment of your own. I do not wish you to see, either, anything more of your relatives or your friends. Their tone is bound to be prejudicial to my children. Here are thirty-six francs for the first month, but I insist on your word not to give a sou of this money to your father. M. de Renal was piqued against the old man for having proved the shrewd a bargainer. Now, monsieur, for I have given orders to everybody here to call you monsieur, and you will appreciate the advantage of having entered the house of real gentlefolk. Now, monsieur, it is not becoming for the children to see you in a jacket. Have the servants seen him? said M. Renal to his wife. No, my dear, she answered with an air of deep pensiveness. "'All the better. Put this on,' he said to the surprised young man, giving him a frock-coat of his own. "'Let us now go to Monsieur Durand's, the draper.' When Monsieur de Renal came back with the new tutor in his black suit more than an hour later, he found his wife still seated in the same place. She felt calmed by Julien's presence. When she examined him, she forgot to be frightened of him. Julien was not thinking about her at all. In spite of all his distrust of destiny and mankind, his soul at this moment was as simple as that of a child. It seemed as though he had lived through years since the moment three hours ago when he had been all a-tremble in the church. He noticed Madame de Renal's frigid manner and realised that she was very angry because he had dared to kiss her hand. But the proud consciousness which was given to him by the feel of clothes so different from those which he usually wore transported him so violently, and he had so great a desire to conceal his exultation, that all his movements were marked by a certain spasmodic irresponsibility. Madame de Renal looked at him with astonishment. Monsieur, said Monsieur de Renal to him, dignity above all is necessary if you wish to be respected by my children. Sir, answered Julien, I feel awkward in my new clothes. I am a poor peasant, and have never worn anything but jackets. If you allow it, I will retire to my room. What do you think of this acquisition? said M. de Renal to his wife. Madame de Renal concealed the truth from her husband, obeying an almost instinctive impulse which she certainly did not own to herself. I am not as fascinated as you are by this little peasant. Your favours will result in his not being able to keep his place, and you will have to send him back before the month is out. Oh, well, we'll send him back, then. He cannot run me into more than a hundred francs, and Verrier will have got used to seeing Mr. de Renal's children with a tutor. That result would not have been achieved if I had allowed Julien to wear a workman's clothes. If I do send him back, I shall, of course, keep the complete black suit which I have just ordered at the draper's. 
All he will keep is the ready-made suit which I have just put him into at the tailor's. The hour that Julien spent in his room seemed only a minute to Madame de Renal. The children, who had been told about their new tutor, began to overwhelm their mother with questions. Eventually Julien appeared. He was quite another man. It would be incorrect to say that he was grave. He was the very incarnation of gravity. He was introduced to the children and spoke to them in a manner that astonished Monsieur de Renal himself. I am here, gentlemen, he said as he finished his speech, to teach you Latin. You know what it means to recite a lesson? Here is the Holy Bible, he said, showing them a small volume in thirty-two mo, bound in black. It deals especially with the history of our Lord Jesus Christ and is the part which is called the New Testament. I shall often make you recite your lessons, but do you make me now recite mine? Adolphe, the eldest of the children, had taken up the book. Open it anywhere you like, went on Julien, and tell me the first word of any verse. I will then recite by heart that sacred book which governs our conduct towards the whole world until you stop me. Adolphe opened the book and read a word, and Julien recited the whole of the page as easily as though he had been talking French. M. de Renal looked at his wife with an air of triumph. The children, seeing the astonishment of their parents, opened their eyes wide. A servant came to the door of the drawing-room. Julien went on, talking Latin. The servant first remained motionless and then disappeared. Soon Madame's housemaid, together with the cook, arrived at the door. Adolphe had already opened the book at eight different places, while Julien went on reciting all the time with the same facility. Great heaven, said the cook, a good and devout girl, quite aloud. What a pretty little priest! M. de Renal's self-esteem became uneasy. Instead of thinking of examining the tutor, his mind was concentrated in racking his memory for some other Latin words. Eventually he managed to spout a phrase of Horace. Julien knew no other Latin except his Bible. He answered with a frown, The holy ministry to which I destine myself has forbidden me to read so profane a poet. M. de Renal quoted quite a large number of alleged verses from Horace. He explained to his children who Horace was, but the admiring children scarcely attended to what he was saying. They were looking at Julien. The servants were still at the door. Julien thought that he ought to prolong the test. M. Stanislas Xavier also, he said to the youngest of the children, must give me a passage from the holy book. It was Stanislaus, who was quite flattered, read indifferently the first word of a verse, and Julien said the whole page. To put the finishing touch on M. de Renal's triumph, M. Valenod, the owner of the fine Norman horses, and M. Charcot de Montgiron, the sub-prefect of the district, came in when Julien was reciting. This scene earned for Julien the title of Monsieur. Even the servants did not dare to refuse it to him. That evening, all very air flocked to M. de Renal's to see the prodigy. Julien answered everybody in a gloomy manner and kept his own distance. His fame spread so rapidly in the town that a few hours afterwards, M. de Renal, fearing that he would be taken away by somebody else, proposed that he should sign an engagement for two years. No, monsieur, Julien answered coldly. If you wish to dismiss me, I should have to go. An engagement which binds me without involving you in any obligation is not an equal one, and I refuse it. Julien played his card so well that in less than a month of his arrival at the house, M. de Renal himself respected him. As the curé had quarrelled with both M. de Renal and M. Valenod, there was no one who could betray Julien's old passion for Napoleon. He always spoke of Napoleon with abhorrence. End of section 6《Section Seven》《Section Seven of the Red and the Black》by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter Seven: The Elective Affinities. They only manage to touch the heart by wounding it. A modern. The children adored him, but he did not like them in the least. His thoughts were elsewhere. But nothing which the little brats ever did made him lose his patience. Cold, just and impassive, and nonetheless liked, inasmuch as his arrival had more or less driven ennui out of the house, he was a good tutor. 
As for himself, he felt nothing but hate and abhorrence for that good society into which he had been admitted. Admitted, it is true, at the bottom of the table, a circumstance which perhaps explained his hate and his abhorrence. There were certain full-dress dinners at which he was scarcely able to control his hate for everything that surrounded him. One St. Louis feast day in particular, when M. Valenod was monopolising the conversation of M. de Renal, Julien was on the point of betraying himself. He escaped into the garden on the pretext of finding the children. What praise of honesty, he exclaimed. One would say that was the only virtue, and yet think how they respect and grovel before a man who has almost doubled and trebled his fortune since he has administered the poor fund. I would bet anything he makes a profit even out of the monies which are intended for the foundlings of these poor creatures whose misery is even more sacred than that of the others. Oh, monsters, monsters! And I too am a kind of foundling, haters as I am by my father, my brothers and all my family. Some days before the Feast of St. Louis, when Julien was taking a solitary walk and reciting his breviary in the little wood called the Belvedere, which dominates the Cour de la Fidelité, he had endeavoured in vain to avoid his two brothers, whom he saw coming along in the distance by a lonely path. The jealousy of these coarse workmen had been provoked to such a pitch by their brother's fine black suit, by his air of extreme respectability, and by the sincere contempt which he had for them, that they had beaten him until he had fainted and was bleeding all over. Madame de Renal, who was taking a walk with Monsieur de Renal and the sub-prefect, happened to arrive in the little wood. She saw Julien lying on the ground and thought that he was dead. She was so overcome that she made M. Valenot jealous. His alarm was premature. Julien found Madame de Renal very pretty, but he hated her on account of her beauty, for that had been the first danger which had almost stopped his career. He talked to her as little as possible in order to make her forget the transport which had induced him to kiss her hand on the first day. Madame de Renal's housemaid, Elisa, had lost no time in falling in love with the young tutor. She often talked about him to her mistress. Elisa's love had earned for Julien the hatred of one of the men servants. One day he heard the man saying to Elisa, You haven't a word for me now that this dirty tutor has entered the household. The insult was undeserved, but Julien, with the instinctive vanity of a pretty boy, redoubled his care of his personal appearance. M. Valenot's hate also increased. He said publicly that it was not becoming for a young abbé to be such a fop. Madame de Renal observed that Julien talked more frequently than usual to Mademoiselle Elisa. She learned that the reason of these interviews was the poverty of Julien's extremely small wardrobe. He had so little linen that he was obliged to have it very frequently washed outside the house, and it was in these little matters that Elisa was helpful to him. Madame de Renal was touched by this extreme poverty, which she had never suspected before. She was anxious to make him presents, but she did not dare to do so. This inner conflict was the first painful emotion that Julien had caused her. Till then, Julien's name had been synonymous with a pure and quite intellectual joy. Tormented by the idea of Julien's poverty, Madame de Renal spoke to her husband about giving him some linen for a present. "'What nonsense!' he answered. "'The very idea of giving presents to a man with whom we are perfectly satisfied, and who is a good servant. It will only be if he is remiss that we shall have to stimulate his zeal.' Madame de Renal felt humiliated by this way of looking at things, though she would never have noticed it in the days before Julien's arrival. She never looked at the young abbé's attire with its combination of simplicity and absolute cleanliness without saying to herself, "'The poor boy!' How can he manage? Little by little, instead of being shocked by all Julien's deficiencies, she pitied him for them. Madame de Renal was one of those provincial women whom one is apt to take for fools during the first fortnight of acquaintanceship. She had no experience of the world and never bothered to keep up the conversation. Nature had given her a refined and fastidious soul, while that instinct for happiness which is innate in all human beings caused her, as a rule, to pay no attention to the acts of the coarse persons in whose midst chance had thrown her. 
If she had received the slightest education, she would have been noticeable for the spontaneity and vivacity of her mind, but being an heiress, she had been brought up in a convent of nuns who were passionate devotees of the sacred heart of Jesus and animated by a violent hate for the French as being the enemies of the Jesuits. Madame de Renal had had enough sense to forget quickly all the nonsense which she had learned at the convent, but had substituted nothing for it, and in the long run knew nothing. The flatteries which had been lavished on her when still a child, by reason of the great fortune of which she was the heiress, and a decided tendency to passionate devotion, had given her quite an inner life of her own. In spite of her pose of perfect affability, and her elimination of her individual will, which was cited as a modest example by all the husbands in Verrières, and which made Monsieur de Renal feel very proud, the moods of her mind were usually dictated by a spirit of the most haughty discontent. Many a princess who has become a byword for pride has given infinitely more attention to what her courtiers have been doing around her than did this apparently gentle and demure woman to anything which her husband either said or did. Up to the time of Julien's arrival she had never really troubled about anything except her children. Their little maladies, their troubles, their little joys, occupied all the sensibility of that soul, who, during her whole life, had adored no one but God, when she had been at the sacred heart of Bessinson. A feverish attack of one of her sons would affect her almost as deeply as if the child had died, though she would not deign to confide in anyone. A burst of coarse laughter, a shrug of the shoulders, accompanied by some platitude on the folly of women, had been the only welcome her husband had vouchsafed to those confidences about her troubles, which the need of unburdening herself had induced her to make during the first years of their marriage. Jokes of this kind, and above all when they were directed at her children's ailments, were exquisite torture to Madame de Renal. And these jokes were all she found to take the place of those exaggerated, sugary flatteries with which she had been regaled at the Jesuit convent where she had passed her youth. Her education had been given her by suffering. Too proud even to talk to her friend, Madame de Ville, about troubles of this kind, she imagined that all men were like her husband, Monsieur Valenot, and the sub-prefect, Monsieur Charcot de Maugiron coarseness and the most brutal callousness to everything except financial gain, precedence or orders, together with blind hate of every argument to which they objected, seemed to her as natural to the male sex as wearing boots and felt hats. After many years, Madame de Renal had still failed to acclimatise herself to those moneyed people in whose society she had to live. Hence the success of the little peasant Julien, she found in the sympathy of this proud and noble soul a sweet enjoyment which had all the glamour and fascination of novelty. Madame de Renal soon forgave him that extreme ignorance which constituted but an additional charm, and the roughness of his manner which she succeeded in correcting. She thought that he was worth listening to, even when the conversation turned on the most ordinary events even, in fact, when it was only a question of a poor dog which had been crushed as he crossed the street by a peasant's cart going at a trot. The sight of the dog's pain made her husband indulge in his coarse laugh, while she noticed Julian frown with his fine black eyebrows, which were so beautifully arched. Little by little, it seemed to her that generosity, nobility of soul and humanity were to be found in nobody else except this young abbe, she felt for him all the sympathy and even all the admiration which those virtues excite in well-born souls. If the scene had been Paris, Julien's position towards Madame de Renal would have been soon simplified. But at Paris, love is a creature of novels. The young tutor and his timid mistress were soon have found the elucidation of their position in three or four novels, and even in the couplets of the Gymnase Theatre the novels which have traced out for them the part they would play and showed them the model which they were to imitate, and Julian would sooner or later have been forced by his vanity to follow that model, even though it had given him no pleasure, and had perhaps actually gone against the grain. If the scene had been laid in a small town in Aveyron or the Pyrenees, the slightest episode would have been rendered crucial by the fiery condition of the atmosphere. 
But under our more gloomy skies, a poor young man, who is only ambitious because his natural refinement makes him feel the necessity of some of those joys which only money can give, can see every day a woman of thirty who is sincerely virtuous, is absorbed in her children, and never goes to novels for her examples of conduct. Everything goes slowly, everything happens gradually in the provinces where there is far more naturalness. Madame de Renard was often overcome to the point of tears when she thought of the young tutor's poverty. Julien surprised her one day, actually crying. Oh, madame, has any misfortune happened to you? No, my friend, she answered. Call the children. Let us go for a walk. She took his arm and leant on it in a manner that struck Julien as singular. It was the first time she had called Julien my friend. Towards the end of the walk, Julien noticed that she was blushing violently. She slackened her pace. You have no doubt heard, she said, without looking at him, that I am the only heiress of a very rich aunt who lives at Besançon. She loads me with presents. My sons are getting on so wonderfully that I should like to ask you to accept a small present as a token of my gratitude. It is only a matter of a few louis to enable you to get some linen, but she added, blushing still more, and left off her speaking. "'But what, madame?' said Julien. "'It is unnecessary,' she went on, lowering her head, "'to mention this to my husband.' "'I may not be big, madame, but I am not mean,' answered Julien, stopping and drawing himself up to his full height, with his eyes shining with rage, "'and this is what you have not realised sufficiently.' I should be lower than a menial if I were to put myself in the position of concealing from Monsieur de Renal anything at all having to do with my money. Madame de Renal was thunderstruck. The mayor, went on Julien, has given me on five occasions sums of thirty-six francs since I have been living in his house. I am ready to show any account book to Monsieur de Renal and anyone else, even to Monsieur Valenot, who hates me. As the result of this outburst, Madame de Renal remained pale and nervous, and the walk ended without either one or the other finding any pretext for renewing the conversation. Julien's proud heart had found it more and more impossible to love Madame de Renal. As for her, she respected him, she admired him, and she had been suddenly scolded by him. Under the pretext of making up for the involuntary humiliation which she had caused him, she indulged in acts of the most tender solicitude. The novelty of these attentions made Madame de Renal happy for eight days. Their effect was to appease to some extent Julien's anger. He was far from seeing anything in them in the nature of a fancy for himself personally. "'This is just what rich people are,' he said to himself. "'They snub you, and then they think that they can make up for everything by a few monkey tricks.' Madame de Renal's heart was too full, and at the same time too innocent, for her not to tell her husband, in spite of her resolutions not to do so, about the offer she had made to Julien, and the manner in which she had been rebuffed. "'How on earth,' answered Monsieur de Renal, keenly piqued, "'could you put up with a refusal on the part of a servant?' And when Madame de Renal protested against the word servant, "'I am using, Madame, the words of the late Prince of Condé when he presented his chamberlains to his new wife,' All these people, he said, are servants. I have also read you this passage from the Memoirs of Bessonville, a book which is indispensable on all questions of etiquette. Every person, not a gentleman, who lives in your house and receives a salary is your servant. I'll go and say a few words to Monsieur Julien, and give him a hundred francs. Oh, my dear, said Madame de Renal, trembling, I hope you won't do it before the servants. Yes, they might be jealous, and rightly so, said her husband, as he took his leave thinking of the greatness of the sum. Madame de Renal fell on a chair, almost fainting in her anguish. He is going to humiliate Julien, and it is my fault. She felt an abhorrence for her husband and hid her face in her hands. She resolved that henceforth she would never make any more confidences. When she saw Julien again, she was trembling all over. Her chest was so cramped that she could not succeed in pronouncing a single word, in her embarrassment, she took his hands and pressed them. Well, my friend, she said to him at last, are you satisfied with my husband? How could I be otherwise, answered Julien with a bitter smile. He has given me a hundred francs. Madame de Renal looked at him doubtfully. 
Give me your arm, she said at last, with a courageous intonation that Julien had not heard before. She dared to go as far as the shop of the bookseller of Verrières, in spite of his awful reputation for liberalism. In the shop she chose ten louis worth of books for a present for her sons. But these books were those which she knew Julien was wanting. She insisted on each child writing his name then and there in the bookseller's shop in those books which fell to his lot. While Madame de Renal was rejoicing over the kind reparation which he had had the courage to make to Julien, the latter was overwhelmed with astonishment at the quantity of books which he saw at the bookseller's. He had never dared to enter so profane a place. His heart was palpitating. Instead of trying to guess what was passing in Madame de Renal's heart, he pondered deeply over the means by which a young theological student could procure some of those books. Eventually it occurred to him that it would be possible, with tact, to persuade Monsieur de Renal that one of the proper subjects of his son's curriculum would be the history of the celebrated gentleman who had been born in the province. After a month of careful preparation, Julien witnessed the success of this idea. The success was so great that he actually dared to risk mentioning to Monsieur de Renal in conversation a matter which the noble mayor found disagreeable from quite another point of view. The suggestion was to contribute to the fortune of a liberal by taking a subscription at the booksellers. Monsieur de Renal agreed that it would be wise to give his elder son a first-hand acquaintance with many works which he would hear mentioned in conversation when he went to the military school. But Julien saw that the mayor had determined to go no further. He suspected some secret reason, but could not guess it. I was thinking, sir, he said to him one day, that it would be highly undesirable for the name of so good a gentleman as a Renal to appear on a bookseller's dirty ledger. Monsieur de Renal's face cleared. It would also be a black mark, continued Julien, in a more humble tone, against a poor theology student if it ever leaked out that his name had been on the ledger of a bookseller who let out books. The liberals might go so far as to accuse me of having asked for the most infamous books. Who knows if they will not even go so far as to write the titles of those perverse volumes after my name? But Julien was getting off the track. He noticed that the mayor's physiognomy was reassuming its expression of embarrassment and displeasure. Julien was silent. I have caught my man, he said to himself. It so happened that a few days afterwards the elder of the children asked Julien, in Monsieur de Renal's presence, about a book which had been advertised in the Quotidienne. In order to prevent the Jacobin party having the slightest pretext for a score, said the young tutor, and yet give me the means of answering Monsieur de Adolphe's question, you can make your most menial servant take out a subscription at the bookseller's. That's not a bad idea, said Monsieur de Renal, who was obviously very delighted. You will have to stipulate all the same, said Julien, in that solemn and almost melancholy manner which suits some people so well when they see the realisation of matters which they have desired for a long time past. You will have to stipulate that the servants should not take out any novels. Those dangerous books, once they get into the house, might corrupt Madame de Renal's maids and even the servant himself. You are forgetting the political pamphlets, went on Monsieur de Renal with an important air. He was anxious to conceal his admiration with which the cunning middle course devised by his children's tutor had filled him. In this way, Julien's life was made up of a series of little acts of diplomacy, and their success gave him far more food for thought than the marked manifestation of favouritism which he could have read at any time in Madame de Renal's heart, had he so wished. The psychological position in which he had found himself all his life was renewed again in the mayor of Verrier's house. Here, in the same way as at his father's sawmill, he deeply despised the people with whom he lived and was hated by them. He saw every day in the conversation of the sub-prefect, Monsieur Valenot, and the other friends of the family, about things which had just taken place under their very eyes, how little ideas corresponded to reality. If an action seemed to Julien worthy of admiration, it was precisely that very action which would bring down upon itself the censure of the people with whom he lived. His inner mental reply always was, What beasts, or what fools! The joke was that, in spite of all his pride, he often understood absolutely nothing what they were talking about. Throughout his whole life he had only spoken sincerely to the old surgeon-major. 
The few ideas he had were about Buonaparte's Italian campaigns, or else surgery. His youthful courage revelled in the circumstantial details of the most terrible operations. He said to himself, I should not have flinched. The first time that Madame de Renal tried to enter into conversation independently of the children's education, he began to talk of surgical operations. She grew pale and asked him to leave off. Julien knew nothing beyond that. So it came about that, though he passed his life in Madame de Renal's company, the most singular silence would reign between them as soon as they were alone. When he was in the salon, she noticed in his eyes, in spite of all the humbleness of his demeanour, an air of intellectual superiority towards everyone who came to visit her. If she found herself alone with him for a single moment, she saw that he was palpably embarrassed. This made her feel uneasy, for her woman's instinct caused her to realise that this embarrassment was not inspired by any tenderness. Owing to some mysterious idea derived from some tale of good society, such as the old surgeon major had seen it, Julian felt humiliated whenever the conversation languished on any occasion when he found himself in a woman's society, as though the particular pause were his own special fault. This sensation was a hundred times more painful in tête-à-tête. His imagination, full as it was of the most extravagant and most Spanish ideas of what a man ought to say when he is alone with a woman, only suggested to the troubled youth things which were absolutely impossible. His soul was in the clouds. Nevertheless, he was unable to emerge from this most humiliating silence. Consequently, during his long walks with Madame de Renal and the children, the severity of his manner was accentuated by the poignancy of his sufferings. He despised himself terribly. If by any luck he made himself speak, he came out with the most absurd things. To put the finishing touch on his misery, he saw his own absurdity and exaggerated its extent, but what he did not see was the expression in the eyes, which were so beautiful and betokened so ardent a soul that, like good actors, they sometimes gave charm to something which is really devoid of it. Madame de Renal noticed that when he was alone with her, he never chanced to say a good thing except when he was taken out of himself by some unexpected event, and consequently forgot to try and turn a compliment. As the friends of the house did not spoil her by regaling her with new and brilliant ideas, she enjoyed with delight all the flashes of Julien's intellect. After the fall of Napoleon, every appearance of gallantry has been severely exiled from provincial etiquette. People are frightened of losing their jobs. All rascals look to the religious order for support, and hypocrisy has made firm progress even among the liberal classes. One's ennui is doubled. The only pleasures left are reading and agriculture. Madame de Renal, the rich heiress of a devout aunt and married at sixteen to a respectable gentleman, had never felt or seen in her whole life anything that had the slightest resemblance in the whole world to love. Her confessor, the good curé Chalon, had once mentioned love to her in discussing the advances of Monsieur de Valenot and had drawn so loathsome a picture of the passion that the word now stood for her for nothing but the most abject debauchery. She had regarded love, such as she had come across it in the very small number of novels with which chance had made her acquainted, as an exception, if not indeed as something absolutely abnormal. It was thanks to this ignorance that Madame de Renal, although incessantly absorbed in Julien, was perfectly happy and never thought of reproaching herself in the slightest. End of section 7section 8 of the red and the black by stendhal translated by horace barnett samuel this librivox recording is in the public domain read by peter dan chapter 8 the little episodes then there were sighs the deeper for suppression and stolen glances sweeter for theft and burning blushes though for no transgression don juan canto 1 stanza 74 it was only when Madame de Renal began to think of her maid Elisa that there was some slight change in that angelic sweetness which she owed both to her natural character and her actual happiness. The girl had come into a fortune, went to confess herself to the curé Chalin, and confessed to him her plan of marrying Julien. 
The curé was truly rejoiced at his friend's good fortune, but he was extremely surprised when Julien resolutely informed him that Mademoiselle Elise's offer could not suit him. "'Beware, my friend, of what is passing within your heart,' said the curé with a frown. "'I congratulate you on your mission, if that is the only reason why you despise a more than ample fortune. "'It is fifty-six years since I was first curé of Verrières, and yet I should be turned out according to all appearances. "'I am distressed by it, and yet my income amounts to eight hundred francs. "'I inform you of this detail so that you may not be under any illusions as to what awaits you in your career as a priest.' If you think of paying court to the men who enjoy power, your eternal damnation is assured. You may make your fortune, but you will have to do harm to the poor, flatter the sub-prefect, the mayor, the man who enjoys prestige, and pander to his passion. This conduct, which in the world is called knowledge of life, is not absolutely incompatible with salvation so far as a layman is concerned, but in our career we have to make a choice. It is a question of making one's fortune either in this world or the next. There is no middle course. Come, my dear friend, reflect, and come back in three days with a definite answer. I am pained to detect that there is at the bottom of your character a sombre passion which is far from indicating to me that moderation and that perfect renunciation of earthly advantages so necessary for a priest. I augur well of your intellect, but allow me to tell you, added the good curé with tears in his eyes, I tremble for your salvation in your career as a priest. Julien was ashamed of his emotion. He found himself loved for the first time in his life. He wept with delight and went to hide his tears in the great woods behind Verrières. Why am I in this position, he said to himself at last. I feel that I would give my life a hundred times over for this good curé Chalin, and he has just proved to me that I am nothing more than a fool. It is especially necessary for me to deceive him, and he manages to find me out. The secret ardour which he refers to is my plan of making my fortune. He thinks I am unworthy of being a priest. That, too, just when I was imagining that my sacrifice of fifty louis would give him the very highest idea of my piety and devotion to my mission. In future, continued Julien, I will only reckon on those elements in my character which I have tested. Who could have told me that I should find any pleasure in shedding tears? How I should like someone to convince me that I am simply a fool. Three days later, Julien found the excuse with which he ought to have been prepared on the first day. The excuse was a piece of calumny, but what did it matter? He confessed to the curé with a great deal of hesitation that he had been persuaded from the suggested union by a reason he could not explain inasmuch as it tended to damage a third party. This was equivalent to impeaching Elisa's conduct. Monsieur Chalin found that his manner betrayed a certain worldly fire which was very different from that which ought to have animated a young acolyte. "'My friend,' he said to him again, Be a good country citizen, respected and educated, rather than a priest without a true mission. So far as words were concerned, Julien answered these new remonstrances very well. He managed to find the words which a young and ardent seminarist would have employed, but the tone in which he pronounced them, together with the thinly concealed fire which blazed in his eye, alarmed M. Chalin. You must not have too bad an opinion of Julien's prospects invented with correctness all the words suitable to a prudent and cunning hypocrisy. It was not bad for his age. As for his tone and his gestures, he had spent his life with country people. He had never been given an opportunity of seeing great models. Consequently, as soon as he was given a chance of getting near such gentlemen, his gestures became as admirable as his words. Madame de Renal was astonished that her maid's new fortune did not make her more happy. She saw her repeatedly going to the curé and coming back with tears in her eyes. At last Elisa talked to her of her marriage. Madame de Renal thought she was ill. A kind of fever prevented her from sleeping. She only lived when either maid or Julien were in sight. She was unable to think of anything except them and the happiness which they would find in their home. Her imagination depicted in the most fascinating colours the poverty of the little house where they were to live on their income of fifty louis a year. 
Julien could quite well become an advocate at Bray, the sub-prefecture, two leagues from Verrières. In that case, she would see him sometimes. Madame de Renal sincerely believed she would go mad. She said so to her husband, and finally fell ill. That very evening, when her maid was attending her, she noticed that the girl was crying. She abhorred Elisa at that moment, and started to scold her. She then begged her pardon. Elisa's tears redoubled. She said if her mistress would allow her, she would tell her all her unhappiness. "'Tell me,' answered Madame de Renal. "'Well, madame, he refuses me. Some wicked people must have spoken badly about me. He believes them.' "'Who refuses you?' said Madame de Renal, scarcely breathing. "'Who else, madame, but Monsieur Julien?' answered the maid, sobbing. Monsieur the curé has been unable to overcome his resistance, for Monsieur the curé thinks that he ought not to refuse an honest girl on the pretext that she has been a maid. After all, Monsieur Julien's father is nothing more than a carpenter, and how did he himself earn his living before he was at Madame's? Madame de Renal stopped listening. Her excessive happiness had almost deprived her of her reason. She made the girl repeat several times the assurance that Julien had refused her with a positiveness which shut the door on the possibility of his coming round to a more prudent decision. "'I will make a last attempt,' she said to her maid. "'I will speak to Monsieur Julien.' The following day, after breakfast, Madame de Renal indulged in the delightful luxury of pleading her rival's cause and seeing Elisa's hand and fortune stubbornly refused for a whole hour. Julien gradually emerged from his cautiously worded answers, and finished by answering with spirit Madame de Renal's good advice. She could not help being overcome by the torrent of happiness which, after so many days of despair, now inundated her soul. She felt quite ill, but when she had recovered and was comfortably in her own room, she sent everyone away. She was profoundly astonished. "'Can I be in love with Julien?' she finally said to herself. This discovery, which at any other time would have plunged her into remorse and the deepest agitation, now only produced the effect of a singular, but, as it were, indifferent spectacle. Her soul was exhausted by all that she had just gone through, and had no more sensibility to passion left. Madame de Renal tried to work, and fell into a deep sleep. When she woke up, she did not frighten herself so much as she ought to have. She was too happy to be able to see anything wrong in anything. Naive and innocent as she was, this worthy provincial woman had never tortured her soul in her endeavours to extract from it a little sensibility to some new shade of sentiment or unhappiness. Entirely absorbed as she had been, before Julien's arrival, with that mass of work which falls to the lot of a good mistress of a household away from Paris, Madame de Renal thought of passion in the same way in which we think of a lottery, a certain deception, a happiness sought after by fools. The dinner bell rang. Madame de Renal blushed violently. She heard the voice of Julien, who was bringing in the children. Having grown somewhat adroit since her falling in love, she complained of an awful headache in order to explain her redness. "'That's just like what all women are,' answered Monsieur de Renal with a coarse laugh. "'Those machines have always got something or other to be put right.' Although she was accustomed to this type of wit, Madame de Renal was shocked by the tone of voice. In order to distract herself, she looked at Julien's physiognomy. He would have pleased her at this particular moment, even if he had been the ugliest man imaginable. Monsieur de Renal, who always made a point of copying the habits of the gentry of the court, established himself at Vergy in the first fine days of the spring. This is the village rendered celebrated by the tragic adventure of Gabriel. A hundred paces from the picturesque ruin of the old Gothic church, Monsieur de Renal owns an old chateau with its four towers and a garden designed like the one in the Tuileries, with a great many edging verges of box and avenues of chestnut trees, which are cut twice in the year. An adjacent field, crowded with apple trees, served for a promenade. Eight or ten magnificent walnut trees were at the end of the orchard. Their immense foliage went as high as perhaps eighty feet. Each of these cursed walnut trees, Monsieur de Renal was in the habit of saying, whenever his wife admired them, costs me the harvest of at least half an acre. Corn cannot grow under their shade. Madame de Renal found the sight of the country novel. Her admiration reached the point of enthusiasm. 
The sentiment by which he was animated gave her both ideas and resolution. M. de Renal had returned to the town for mayoral business two days after their arrival in Vergy. But Madame de Renal engaged workmen at her own expense. Julien had given her the idea of a little sanded path which was to go round the orchard and under the big walnut trees and render it possible for the children to take their walk in the very earliest hours of the morning without getting their feet wet from the dew. This idea was put into execution within twenty-four hours of its being conceived. Madame de Renal gaily spent the whole day with Julien in supervising the workmen. When the mayor of Verrières came back from the town, he was very surprised to find the avenue completed. His arrival surprised Madame de Renal as well. She had forgotten his existence. For two months he talked with irritation about the boldness involved in making so important a repair without consulting him, but Madame de Renal had it executed at her own expense, a fact which somewhat consoled him. She spent her days in running about the orchard with her children and in catching butterflies. They had made big hoods of clear gauze with which they caught the poor Lepidoptera. This is the barbarous name which Julien taught Madame de Renal, for she had had Monsieur Godard's fine work ordered from Bessinson, and Julien used to tell her about the strange habits of the creatures. They ruthlessly transfixed them by means of pins in a great cardboard box which Julien had prepared. Madame de Renal and Julien had at last a topic of conversation. He was no longer exposed to the awful torture that had been occasioned by their moments of silence. They talked incessantly and with extreme interest, though always about very innocent matters. This gay, full, active life pleased the fancy of everyone except Mademoiselle Elisa, who found herself overworked. Madame had never taken so much trouble with her dress. Even at carnival time, when there is a ball at Verrières, she would say, she changes her gowns two or three times a day. As it is not our intention to flatter anyone, we do not propose to deny that Madame de Renal, who had a superb skin, arranged her gowns in such a way as to leave her arms and her bosom very exposed. She was extremely well made, and this style of dress suited her delightfully. You have never been so young, madame, her very air friends would say to her when they came to dinner at Vergy. This is one of the local expressions. It is a singular thing, and one which few amongst us will believe, but madame de Renal had no specific object in taking so much trouble. She found pleasure in it, and spent all the time which she did not pass in hunting butterflies with the children and Julian in working with Elisa at making gowns, without giving the matter a further thought. Her only expedition to Verrières was caused by her desire to buy some new summer gowns which had just come from Mulhouse. She brought back to Vergy a young woman who was a relative of hers. Since her marriage, Madame de Renal had gradually become attached to Madame de Ville, who had once been her schoolmate at the Sacre Coeur. Madame de Ville laughed a great deal at what she called her cousin's mad ideas. I would never have thought of them alone, she said. When Madame de Renal was with her husband, she was ashamed of those sudden ideas which are called sallies in Paris, and thought them quite silly. But Madame de Ville's presence gave her courage. She would start to telling her thoughts in a timid voice, but after the ladies had been alone for a long time, Madame de Renal's brain became more animated, and a long morning spent together by the two friends passed like a second, and left them in the best of spirits. On this particular journey, however, the acute Madame de Ville thought her cousin much less merry, but much more happy than usual. Julien, on his side, had, since coming to the country, lived like an absolute child, and been as happy as his pupils in running after the butterflies. After so long a period of constraint and wary diplomacy, he was at last alone and far from human observation, he was instinctively free from any apprehension on the score of Madame de Renal, and abandoned himself to the sheer pleasure of being alive, which is so keen at so young an age, especially among the most beautiful mountains in the world. Ever since Madame de Ville's arrival, Julien thought that she was his friend. He took the first opportunity of showing her the views from the end of the new avenue, under the walnut tree. As a matter of fact, it is equal, if not superior, to the most wonderful views that Switzerland and the Italian lakes can offer. If you ascend the steep slope which commences some paces from there, you will soon arrive at great precipices fringed by oak forests, which almost jut onto the river. 
It was to the peaked summits of these rocks that Julian, who was now happy, free, and king of the household into the bargain, would take the two friends and enjoy their admiration of these sublime views. To me it's like Mozart's music, Madame de Ville would say. The country around Verrier had been spoilt for Julien by the jealousy of his brothers and the presence of a tyrannous and angry father. He was free from these bitter memories at Vergy. For the first time in his life he failed to see an enemy. When, as frequently happened, Monsieur de Renal was in town, he ventured to read. Soon, instead of reading at night-time, a procedure, moreover, which involved carefully hiding his lamp at the bottom of a flower-pot turned upside down, he was able to indulge in sleep. In the day, however, in the intervals between the children's lessons, he would come among these rocks with that book which was the one guide of his conduct and object of his enthusiasm. He found in it simultaneously happiness, ecstasy and consolation for his moments of discouragement. Certain remarks of Napoleon about women, several discussions about the merits of the novels which were fashionable in his reign, furnished him now for the first time with some ideas which any other young man of his age would have had for a long time. The dog days arrived. They started the habit of spending the evenings under an immense pine tree some yards from the house. The darkness was profound. One evening, Julien was speaking and gesticulating, enjoying to the full the pleasure of being at his best when talking to young women. In one of his gestures, he touched the hand of Madame de Renal, which was leaning on the back of one of those chairs of painted wood which are so frequently to be seen in gardens. The hand was quickly removed, but Julien thought it a point of duty to secure that that hand should not be removed when he touched it. The idea of a duty to be performed, and the consciousness of his stultification, or rather of his social inferiority if he should fail in achieving it, immediately banished all pleasure from his heart. End of section 8「Section 9 of The Red and the Black by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 9. An Evening in the Country. Monsieur Garin's Dido. A charming sketch. Strombeck. His expression was singular when he saw Madame de Renal the next day. He watched her like an enemy with whom he would have to fight a duel. These looks, which were so different from those of the previous evening, made Madame de Renal lose her head. She had been kind to him, and he appeared angry. She could not take her eyes off his. Madame de Ville's presence allowed Julien to devote less time to conversation, and more time to thinking about what he had in his mind. His one object all this day was to fortify himself by reading the inspired book that gave strength to his soul. He considerably curtailed the children's lessons, and when Madame de Renal's presence had effectually brought him back to the pursuit of his ambition, he decided that she absolutely must allow her hand to rest in his that evening. The setting of the sun which brought the crucial moment nearer and nearer made Julien's heart beat in a strange way. Night came. He noticed with a joy which took an immense weight off his heart that it was going to be very dark. The sky, which was laden with big clouds that had been brought along by a sultry wind, seemed to herald a storm. The two friends went for their walk very late. All they did that night struck Julian as strange. They were enjoying that hour which seems to give certain refined souls an increased pleasure in loving. At last they sat down, Madame de Renal beside Julian and Madame de Ville near her friend. Engrossed as he was by the attempt which he was going to make, Julien could think of nothing to say. The conversation languished. "'Shall I be as nervous and miserable over my first duel?' said Julien to himself, for he was too suspicious both of himself and of others not to realise his own mental state. In his mortal anguish he would have preferred any danger whatsoever. How many times did he not wish some matter to crop up which would necessitate Madame de Renal going into the house and leaving the garden?' The violent strain on Julien's nerves was too great for his voice not to be considerably changed. Soon Madame de Renal's voice became nervous as well, but Julien did not notice it. 
The awful battle raging between duty and timidity was too painful for him to be in a position to observe anything outside himself. A quarter to ten had just struck on the chateau clock without his having ventured anything. Julian was indignant at his own cowardice, and said to himself, At the exact moment when ten o'clock strikes, I will perform what I have resolved to do all through the day, or I will go up to my room and blow out my brains. After a final moment of expectation and anxiety, during which Julian was rendered almost beside himself by his excessive emotion, ten o'clock struck from the clock over his head. Each stroke of the fatal clock reverberated in his bosom and caused an almost physical pang. Finally, when the last stroke of ten was still reverberating, he stretched out his hand and took Madame de Renal's, who immediately withdrew it. Julien, scarcely knowing what he was doing, seized it again. In spite of his own excitement, he could not help being struck by the icy coldness of the hand which he was taking. He pressed it convulsively. A last effort was made to take it away, but in the end the hand remained in his. His soul was inundated with happiness. Not that he loved Madame de Renal, but an awful torture had just ended. He thought it necessary to say something to avoid Madame de Ville noticing anything. His voice was now strong and ringing. Madame de Renal's, on the contrary, betrayed so much emotion that her friend thought she was ill and suggested her going in. Julien scented danger. If Madame Renal goes back to the salon, I shall relapse into the awful state in which I have been all day. I have held the hand far too short a time for it really to count as the scoring of an actual advantage. At the moment when Madame de Ville was repeating her suggestion to go back to the salon, Julien squeezed vigorously the hand that was abandoned to him. Madame de Renal, who had started to get up, sat down again and said in a faint voice, I feel a little ill, as a matter of fact, but the open air is doing me good. These words confirmed Julien's happiness, which at the present moment was extreme. He spoke, he forgot to pose, and appeared the most charming man in the world to the two friends who were listening to him. Nevertheless, there was a slight lack of courage in all this eloquence which had suddenly come upon him. He was mortally afraid that Madame de Ville would get tired of the wind before the storm which was beginning to rise, and want to go back alone into the salon. He would then have remained tête-à-tête -tête with Madame de Renal. He had had, almost by accident, that blind courage which is sufficient for action, but he felt that it was out of his power to speak the simplest words to Madame de Renal. He was certain that, however slight her reproaches might be, he would nevertheless be worsted, and that the advantage he had just won would be destroyed. Luckily for him, on this evening, his moving and emphatic speeches found favour with Madame de Ville, who very often found him as clumsy as a child and not at all amusing. As for Madame de Renal, with her hand in Julien's, she did not have a thought. She simply allowed herself to go on living. The hours spent under this great pine tree, planted by Charles the Bold, according to the local tradition, were a real period of happiness. She listened with delight to the softening of the wind in the thick foliage of the pine tree, and to the noise of some stray drops which were beginning to fall upon the leaves which were lowest down. Julien failed to notice one circumstance, which, if he had, would have quickly reassured him. Madame de Renal, who had been obliged to take away her hand, because she had got up to help her cousin to pick up a flower-pot which the wind had knocked over at her feet, had scarcely sat down again before she gave him her hand, with scarcely any difficulty, and as though it had already been a pre-arranged thing between them. Midnight had struck a long time ago. It was, at last, necessary to leave the garden. They separated. Madame de Renal, swept away as she was by the happiness of loving, was so completely ignorant of the world that she scarcely reproached herself at all. Her happiness deprived her of her sleep. A leaden sleep overwhelmed Julien, who was mortally fatigued by the battle which timidity and pride had waged in his heart all through the day. He was called at five o'clock on the following day, and scarcely gave Madame de Renal a single thought. He had accomplished his duty— and a heroic duty too. The consciousness of this filled him with happiness. He locked himself in his room, and abandoned himself with quite a new pleasure to reading exploits of his hero. When the breakfast bell sounded, the reading of the bulletins of the great army had made him forget all his advantages of the previous day. 
he said to himself flippantly as he went down to the salon, I must tell that woman that I am in love with her. Instead of those looks, brimful of pleasure, which he was expecting to meet, he found the stern visage of Monsieur de Renal, who had arrived from Verrières two hours ago, and did not conceal his dissatisfaction at Julien's having passed the whole morning without attending to the children. Nothing could have been more sordid than this self-important man when he was in a bad temper and thought that he could safely show it. Each harsh word of her husband pierced Madame de Renal's heart. As for Julien... He was so plunged in his ecstasy, and still so engrossed by the great events which had been passing before his eyes for several hours, that he had some difficulty at first in bringing his attention sufficiently down to listen to the harsh remarks which M. de Renal was addressing to him. He said to him at last, rather abruptly, "'I was ill.' The tone of this answer would have stung a much less sensitive man than the mayor of Verrières. He half thought of answering Julien by turning him out of the house straight away. He was only restrained by the maxim which he had prescribed for himself of never hurrying unduly in business matters. The young fool, he said to himself shortly afterwards, has won a kind of reputation in my house. That man Valenod may take him into his family, or he may quite well marry Elisa, and in either case he will be able to have the laugh of me in his heart. In spite of the wisdom of these reflections, M. de Renal's dissatisfaction did not fail to vent itself any the less by a string of coarse insults which gradually irritated Julien. Madame de Renal was on the point of bursting into tears. Breakfast was scarcely over when she asked Julien to give her his arm for a walk. She leant on him affectionately. Julien could only answer all that Madame de Renal said to him by whispering, "'That's what rich people are like.' Monsieur de Renal was walking quite close to them. His presence increased Julien's anger. He suddenly noticed that Madame de Renal was leaning on his arm in a manner which was somewhat marked. This horrified him, and he pushed her violently away and disengaged his arm. Luckily, Monsieur de Renal did not see this new piece of impertinence. It was only noticed by Madame de Ville. Her friend burst into tears. M. de Renal now started to chase away by a shower of stones a little peasant girl who had taken a private path crossing a corner of the orchard. M. Julien, restrain yourself, I pray you. Remember that we all have our moments of temper, said Madame de Ville rapidly. Julien looked at her coldly with eyes in which the most supreme contempt was depicted. This look astonished Madame de Ville, and it would have surprised her even more if she had appreciated its real expression— she would have read in it something like a vague hope of the most atrocious vengeance. It is, no doubt, such moments of humiliation which have made Robespierre. "'Your Julien is very violent. He frightens me,' said Madame de Ville to her friend in a low voice. "'He is right to be angry,' she answered. "'What does it matter if he does pass a morning without speaking to the children, after the astonishing progress which he has made them make? One must admit that men are very hard.' For the first time in her life, Madame de Renal experienced a kind of desire for vengeance against her husband. The extreme hatred of the rich by which Julien was animated was on the point of exploding. Luckily, Monsieur de Renal called his gardener, and remained occupied with him in barring by faggots of thorns the private road through the orchard. Julien did not vouchsafe any answer to the kindly consideration of which he was the object during all the rest of the walk. M. de Renal had scarcely gone away before the two friends made the excuse of being fatigued, and each asked him for an arm. Walking, as he did, between these two women, whose extreme nervousness filled their cheeks with a blushing embarrassment, the haughty pallor and sombre resolute air of Julien formed a strange contrast. He despised these women, and all tender sentiments. "'What?' he said to himself. "'Not even an income of five hundred francs to finish my studies?' Ah, how I should like to send them packing! And absorbed as he was by these stern ideas, such few courteous words of his two friends as he deigned to take the trouble to understand, displeased him as devoid of sense, silly, feeble, in a word, feminine. As a result of speaking for the sake of speaking, and of endeavouring to keep the conversation alive, it came about that Madame de Renal mentioned that her husband had come from very air because he had made a bargain for the May straw with one of his farmers. In this district it is the May straw with which the bed mattresses are filled. 
My husband will not rejoin us, added Madame de Renal. He will occupy himself with finishing the restuffing of the house mattresses with the help of the gardener and his valet. He has put the maestro this morning in all the beds on the first story. He is now at the second. Julien changed colour. He looked at Madame de Renal in a singular way, and soon managed somehow to take her on one side, doubling his pace. Madame de Villa allowed them to get ahead. Save my life, said Julien to Madame de Renal. Only you can do it, for you know that the valet hates me desperately. I must confess to you, Madame, that I have a portrait. I have hidden it in the mattress of my bed. At these words, Madame de Renal, in her turn, became pale. Only you, Madame, are able at this moment to go into my room, feel about without their noticing in the corner of the mattress. It is nearest the window. You will find a small round box of black cardboard, very glossy. Does it contain a portrait? said Madame de Renal, scarcely able to hold herself upright. Julien noticed her air of discouragement, and at once proceeded to exploit it. I have a second favour to ask you, Madame. I entreat you not to look at that portrait. It is my secret. It is a secret, repeated Madame de Renal in a faint voice. But though she had been brought up among people who are proud of their fortune and appreciative of nothing except money, love had already instilled generosity into her soul. Truly wounded as she was, it was with an air of the most simple devotion that Madame de Renal asked Julien the questions necessary to enable her to fulfil her commission. So, she said to him, as she went away, it is a little round box of black cardboard, very glossy. Yes, madame, answered Julien, with that hardness which danger gives to men. She ascended the second story of the chateau as pale as though she had been going to her death. Her misery was completed by the sensation that she was on the verge of falling ill, but the necessity of doing Julien a service restored her strength. I must have that box, she said to herself as she doubled her pace. She heard her husband speaking to the valet in Julien's very room. Happily, they passed into the children's room. She lifted up the mattress and plunged her hand into the stuffing so violently that she bruised her fingers. But though she was very sensitive to slight pain of this kind, she was not conscious of it now, for she felt almost simultaneously the smooth surface of the cardboard box. She seized it and disappeared. She had scarcely recovered from the fear of being surprised by her husband than the horror with which this box inspired her came within an ace of positively making her feel ill. So Julien is in love, and I hold here the portrait of the woman whom he loves. Seated on the chair in the antechamber of his apartment, Madame de Renal fell a prey to all the horrors of jealousy. Her extreme ignorance, moreover, was useful to her at this juncture. Her astonishment mitigated her grief. Julien seized the box without thanking her or saying a single word, and ran into his room, where he lit a fire and immediately burnt it. He was pale and in a state of collapse. He exaggerated the extent of the danger which he had undergone. Finding Napoleon's portrait, he said to himself, in the possession of a man who professes so great a hate for the usurper, found too by Monsieur de Renal, who is so great an ultra, and is now in a state of irritation, and to complete my imprudence, lines written in my own handwriting on the white cardboard behind the portrait, lines too which can leave no doubt on the score of my excessive admiration. And each of these transports of love is dated. There was one the day before yesterday. All my reputation collapsed and shattered in a moment, said Julien to himself as he watched the box burn, and my reputation is my only asset. It is all I have to live by, and what a life too, by heaven. An hour afterwards, this fatigue, together with the pity which he felt for himself, had made him inclined to be more tender. He met Madame de Renal and took her hand, which he kissed with more sincerity than he had ever done before. She blushed with happiness, and almost simultaneously rebuffed Julien with all the anger of jealousy. Julien's pride, which had been so recently wounded, made him act foolishly at this juncture. He saw in Madame de Renal nothing but a rich woman. He disdainfully let her hand fall, and went away. He went and walked about meditatively in the garden. Soon a bitter smile appeared on his lips. "'Here I am walking about as serenely as a man who is master of his own time,' I am not bothering about the children. I am exposing myself to Monsieur de Renal's humiliating remarks, and he will be quite right. He ran to the children's room. 
The caresses of the youngest child, whom he loved very much, somewhat calmed his agony. He does not despise me yet, thought Julian. But he soon reproached himself for this alleviation of his agony, as though it were a new weakness. The children caress me just in the same way in which they would caress the young hunting hound which was bought yesterday. End of section 9《Section 10 of The Red and the Black》by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 10. A Great Heart and a Small Fortune. But passion most dissembles, yet betrays, even by its darkness, as the blackest sky foretells the heaviest tempest. Don Juan, Canto 4, stanza 75. M. de Renal was going through all the rooms in the chateau, and he came back to the children's room with the servants who were bringing back the stuffings of the mattresses. The sudden entry of this man had the effect on Julien of the drop of water which makes the pot overflow. Looking paler and more sinister than usual, he rushed towards him. M. de Renal stopped and looked at his servants. Monsieur, said Julien to him, do you think your children would have made the progress they have made with me with any other tutor? If you answer no, continued Julien so quickly that M. de Renal did not have time to speak, how dare you reproach me with neglecting them? M. de Renal, who had scarcely recovered from his fright, concluded from the strange tone he saw this little peasant assume that he had some advantageous offer in his pocket and that he was going to leave him. The more he spoke, the more Julien's anger increased. I can live without you, monsieur, he added. I am really sorry to see you so upset, answered Monsieur de Renal, shuddering a little. The servants were ten yards off, engaged in making the beds. That is not what I mean, monsieur, replied Julien, quite beside himself. Think of the infamous words that you have addressed to me, and before women, too. Monsieur de Renal understood only too well what Julien was asking, and a painful conflict tore his soul. It happened that Julien, who was really mad with rage, cried out, I know where to go, monsieur, when I leave your house. At these words, monsieur de Renal saw Julien installed with monsieur Valenod. Well, sir, he said at last with a sigh, just as though he had called in a surgeon to perform the most painful operation, I accede to your request. I will give you fifty francs a month, starting from the day after tomorrow, which is the first of the month. Julien wanted to laugh, and stood there dumbfounded. All his anger had vanished. "'I do not despise the brute enough,' he said to himself. "'I have no doubt that that is the greatest apology that so base a soul can make.' The children, who had listened to this scene with gaping mouths, ran into the garden to tell their mother that Monsieur Julien was very angry, but that he was going to have fifty francs a month. Julien followed them as a matter of habit without even looking at Monsieur de Renal, whom he left in a considerable state of irritation. "'That makes one hundred and sixty-eight francs,' said the mayor to himself, "'that Monsieur Valenon has cost me. I must absolutely speak a few strong words to him about his contract to provide for the foundlings.' A minute afterwards, Julien found himself opposite Monsieur de Renal. "'I want to speak to Monsieur Chalin on a matter of conscience.' I have the honour to inform you that I shall be absent some hours. Why, my dear Julien, said Monsieur de Renal, smiling with the falsest expression possible, take the whole day, and tomorrow too, if you like, my good friend. Take the gardener's horse to go to Verrieres. He is on the very point, said Monsieur de Renal to himself, of giving an answer to Valenot. He has promised me nothing, but I must let this hot-headed young man have time to cool down. Julien quickly went away, and went up into the great forest through which one can manage to get from Vergy to Verrieres. He did not wish to arrive at Monsieur Chalin's at once. Far from wishing to cramp himself in a new pose of hypocrisy, he needed to see clear in his own soul, and to give audience to the crowd of sentiments which were agitating him. "'I have won a battle,' he said to himself as soon as he saw that he was well in the forest and far from all human gaze. "'So, I have won a battle.' This expression shot a rosy light on his situation and restored him to some serenity. Here I am, with a salary of fifty francs a month. Monsieur de Renal must be precious afraid. But what of? 
this meditation about what could have put fear into the heart of that happy, powerful man against whom he had been boiling with rage only an hour back, completed the restoration to serenity of Julien's soul. He was almost able to enjoy for a moment the delightful beauty of the woods amidst which he was walking. Enormous blocks of bare rocks had fallen down long ago in the middle of the forest by the mountainside. Great cedars towered almost as high as these rocks, whose shade caused a delicious freshness within three yards of places where the heat of the sun's rays would have made it impossible to rest. Julien took breath for a moment in the shade of these great rocks, and then he began again to climb. Traversing a narrow path that was scarcely marked, and was only used by the goatherds, he soon found himself standing upon an immense rock with the complete certainty of being far away from all mankind. This physical position made him smile. It symbolised to him the position he was burning to attain in the moral sphere. The pure air of these lovely mountains filled his soul with serenity and even with joy. The mayor of Verrières still continued to typify in his eyes all the wealth and all the arrogance of the earth, but Julien felt that the hatred that had just thrilled him had nothing personal about it in spite of all the violence which he had manifested. If he had left off seeing M. de Renal, he would in eight days have forgotten him, his castle, his dogs, his children, and all his family. I forced him, I don't know how, to make the greatest sacrifice. What? More than fifty crowns a year, and only a minute before I managed to extricate myself from the greatest danger. So there are two victories in one day. The second one is devoid of merit. I must find out the why and the wherefore, but these laborious researches are for tomorrow. Standing up on his great rock, Julien looked at the sky, which was all afire with an August sun. The grasshoppers sang in the field about the rock. When they held their peace, there was universal silence around him. He saw twenty leagues of country at his feet. He noticed from time to time some hawk, which, launching off from the great rocks over his head, was describing in silence its immense circles. Julien's eyes followed the bird of prey mechanically. Its tranquil, powerful movements struck him. He envied that strength, that isolation. Would Napoleon's destiny be one day his? End of section 10。section 11 of the red and the black by Stendhal。translated by horace barnett samuel。this librivox recording is in the public domain。read by peter dan。chapter 11 。an evening。yet julia's very coldness still was kind。and tremulously, gently, her small hand withdrew itself from his, but left behind a little pressure, thrilling, and so bland and slight, so very slight, that to the mind t'was but a doubt. Don Juan, Canto One, Stanza 71 It was necessary, however, to put in an appearance at Verrier. As Julien left the curé house, he was fortunate enough to meet M. Valenot, whom he hastened to tell of the increase in his salary. On returning to Vergy, Julien waited till night had fallen before going down into the garden. His soul was fatigued by the great number of violent emotions which had agitated him during the day. What shall I say to them? he reflected anxiously as he thought about the ladies. He was far from realising that his soul was just in a mood to discuss these trivial circumstances which usually monopolise all feminine interests. Julien was often unintelligible to Madame de Ville, and even to her friend, and he, in his turn, only half understood all that they said to him. Such was the effect of the force, and, if I may venture to use such language, the greatness of the transports of passion which overwhelmed the soul of this ambitious youth. In this singular being it was storm nearly every day. As he entered the garden this evening, Julian was inclined to take an interest in what the pretty cousins were thinking. They were waiting for him impatiently. He took his accustomed seat next to Madame de Renal. The darkness soon became profound. He attempted to take hold of a white hand which he had seen some time near him, as it leant on the back of a chair. Some hesitation was shown, but eventually the hand was withdrawn in a manner which indicated displeasure. Julien was inclined to give up the attempt as a bad job, and to continue his conversation quite gaily when he heard Monsieur de Renal approaching. The coarse words he had uttered in the morning were still ringing in Julien's ears. 
Would not taking possession of his wife's hand in his very presence, he said to himself, be a good way of scoring off that creature who has all that life can give him? Yes, I will do it. I, the very man for whom he has evident so great a contempt. From that moment, the tranquillity which was so alien to Julien's real character quickly disappeared. He was obsessed by an absolute desire that Madame de Renal should abandon her hand to him. Monsieur de Renal was talking politics with vehemence. Two or three commercial men in Verrier had been growing distinctly richer than he was and were going to annoy him over the elections. Madame de Ville was listening to him. Irritated by these tirades, Julien brought his chair nearer Madame de Renal. All his movements were concealed by the darkness. He dared to put his hand very near to the pretty arm, which was left uncovered by the dress. He was troubled and had lost control of his mind. He brought his face near to that pretty arm and dared to put his lips on it. Madame de Renal shuddered. Her husband was four paces away. She hastened to give her hand to Julien and at the same time to push him back a little. As M. de Renal was continuing his insults against those ne'er-do-wells and Jacobins who were growing so rich, Julien covered the hand which had been abandoned to him with kisses, which were either really passionate or at any rate seemed so to Madame de Renal. But the poor woman had already had the proofs on that same fatal day that the man whom she adored, without owning it to herself, loved another. During the whole time Julien had been absent, she had been the prey to an extreme unhappiness which had made her reflect. What, she said to herself, am I going to love? Am I going to be in love? Am I, a married woman, going to fall in love? But, she said to herself, I have never felt for my husband this dark madness which never permits of my keeping Julien out of my thoughts. After all, he is only a child who is full of respect for me. This madness will be fleeting. In what way do the sentiments that I may have for this young man concern my husband? M. de Renal would be bored by the conversations which I have with Julien on imaginative subject. As for him, he simply thinks of his business. I am not taking anything away from him to give to Julien. No hypocrisy had sullied the purity of that naive soul, now swept away by a passion such as it had never felt before. She deceived herself, but without knowing it. But, none the less, a certain instinct of virtue was alarmed. Such were the combats which were agitating her when Julien appeared in the garden. She heard him speak, and almost at the same moment she saw him sit down by her side. Her soul was, as it were, transported by this charming happiness which had for the last fortnight surprised her even more than it had allured. Everything was novel for her. Nonetheless, she said to herself after some moments, the mere presence of Julien is quite enough to blot out all his wrongs. She was frightened. It was then that she took away her hand. His passionate kisses, the like of which he had never received before, made her forget that perhaps he loved another woman. Soon he was no longer guilty in her eyes. The cessation of that poignant pain which suspicion had engendered and the presence of a happiness that she had never even dreamt on gave her ecstasies of love and of mad gaiety. The evening was charming for everyone, except the mayor of Verrières, who was unable to forget his parvenu manufacturers. Julien left off thinking about his black ambition, or about those plans of his which were so difficult to accomplish. For the first time in his life he was led away by the power of beauty. Lost in a sweetly vague reverie, quite alien to his character, and softly pressing that hand which he thought ideally pretty, he half listened to the rustle of the leaves of the pine trees, swept by the light night breeze, and to the dogs of the mill on the doob who barked in the distance. But this emotion was one of pleasure, and not passion. As he entered his room, he only thought of one happiness, that of taking up again his favourite book. When one is twenty, the idea of the world and the figure to be cut in it dominates everything. He soon, however, laid down the book. As the result of thinking of the victories of Napoleon, he had seen a new element in his own victory. Yes, he said to himself, I have won a battle. I must exploit it. I must crush the pride of that proud gentleman while he is in retreat. That would be real Napoleon. I must ask him for three days' holiday to go and see my friend Fouquet. If he refuses me, I will threaten to give him notice, but he will yield the point. Madame de Renal could not sleep a wink. It seemed as though, until this moment, she had never lived. 
She was unable to distract her thoughts from the happiness of feeling Julien cover her hand with his burning kisses. Suddenly the awful word adultery came into her mind. All the loathsomeness with which the vilest debauchery can invest sensual love presented itself to her imagination. These ideas essayed to pollute the divinely tender image which she was fashioning of Julien and of the happiness of loving him. The future began to be painted in terrible colours. She began to regard herself as contemptible. That moment was awful. Her soul was arriving in unknown countries. During the evening she had tasted a novel happiness. Now she found herself suddenly plunged in an atrocious unhappiness. She had never had any idea of such sufferings. They troubled her reason. She thought for a moment of confessing to her husband that she was apprehensive of loving Julien. It would be an opportunity of speaking of him. Fortunately, her memory threw up a maxim which her aunt had once given her on the eve of her marriage— the maxim dealt with the danger of making confidences to a husband, for a husband is, after all, a master. She wrung her hands in the excess of her grief. She was driven this way and that by clashing and painful ideas. At one moment she feared that she was not loved. The next, the awful idea of crime tortured her, as much as if she had been exposed in the pillory on the following day in the public square of Verrières with a placard to explain her adultery to the populace. Madame de Renal had no experience of life. Even in the full possession of her faculties, and when fully exercising her reason, she would never have appreciated any distinction between being guilty in the eyes of God and finding herself publicly overwhelmed with the crudest marks of universal contempt. When the awful idea of adultery, and of all the disgrace which in her view that crime brought in its train, left her some rest, she began to dream of the sweetness of living innocently with Julian as in the days that had gone by. She found herself confronted with the horrible idea that Julian loved another woman. She still saw his pallor when he had feared to lose her portrait or to compromise her by exposing it to view. For the first time she had caught fear on that tranquil and noble visage. He had never shown such emotion to her or her children. This additional anguish reached the maximum of unhappiness which the human soul is capable of enduring. Unconsciously, Madame de Renal uttered cries which woke up her maid. Suddenly she saw the brightness of a light appear near her bed and recognised Elisa. "'Is it you he loves?' she exclaimed in her delirium. Fortunately, the maid was so astonished by the terrible trouble in which she found her mistress that she paid no attention to this singular expression." Madame de Renal appreciated her imprudence. "'I have the fever,' she said to her, "'and I think I am a little delirious.' Completely woken up by the necessity of controlling herself, she became less unhappy. Reason regained that supreme control which the semi-somnolent state had taken away. To free herself from her maid's continual stare, she ordered her maid to read the paper, and it was as she listened to the monotonous voice of this girl reading a long article from the Quotidian that Madame de Renal made the virtuous resolution to treat Julien with absolute coldness when she saw him again. End of section 11section 12 of The Red and the Black by Stendhal Translated by Horace Barnett Samuel This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Chapter 12 A Journey Elegant people are to be found in Paris. People of character may exist in the provinces. C.A. At five o'clock the following day, before Madame de Renal was visible, Julien obtained a three days' holiday from her husband. Contrary to his expectation, Julien found himself desirous of seeing her again. He kept thinking of that pretty hand of hers. He went down into the garden, but Madame de Renal kept him waiting for a long time. But if Julien had loved her, he would have seen her forehead glued to the pane behind the half-closed blinds on the first floor. She was looking at him. Finally, in spite of her resolution, she decided to go into the garden. Her habitual pallor had been succeeded by more lively hues. 
This woman, simple as she was, was manifestly agitated. A sentiment of constraint and even of anger altered that expression of profound serenity which seemed, as it were, to be above all the vulgar interests of life and gave so much charm to that divine face. Julien approached her with eagerness, admiring those beautiful arms which were just visible through a hastily donned shawl. The freshness of the morning air seemed to accentuate still more the brilliance of her complexion, which the agitation of the past night rendered all the more susceptible to all impressions. This demure and pathetic beauty, which was at the same time full of thoughts which are never found in the inferior classes, seemed to reveal to Julien a faculty in his own soul which he had never before realised. Engrossed in his admiration of the charms on which his greedy gaze was riveted, Julien took for granted the friendly welcome which he was expecting to receive. He was all the more astonished at the icy coldness which she endeavoured to manifest to him, and through which he thought he could even distinguish the intention of putting him in his place. The smile of pleasure died away from his lips as he remembered his rank in society, especially from the point of view of a rich and noble heiress. In a single moment his face exhibited nothing but haughtiness and anger against himself. He felt violently disgusted that he could have put off his departure for more than an hour, simply to receive so humiliating a welcome. "'It is only a fool,' he said to himself, "'who is angry with others. A stone falls because it is heavy. Am I going to be a child all my life?' How on earth is it that I managed to contract the charming habit of showing my real self to those people simply in return for their money? If I want to win their respect and that of my own self, I must show them that it is simply a business transaction between my poverty and their wealth, but that my heart is a thousand leagues away from their insolence, and is situated in too high a sphere to be affected by their petty marks of favour or disdain. While these feelings were crowding the soul of the young tutor, his mobile features assumed an expression of ferocity and injured pride. Madame de Renal was extremely troubled. The virtuous coldness that she had meant to put into her welcome was succeeded by an expression of interest, an interest animated by all the surprise brought about by the sudden change which she had just seen. The empty morning platitudes about their health and the fineness of the day suddenly dried up. Julien's judgment was disturbed by no passion, and he soon found a means of manifesting to Madame de Renal how light was the friendly relationship that he considered existed between them. He said nothing to her about the little journey that he was going to make, saluted her, and went away. As she watched him go, she was overwhelmed by the sombre haughtiness which she read in that look which had been so gracious the previous evening. Her eldest son ran up from the bottom of the garden and said as he kissed her, we have a holiday. Monsieur Julien is going on a journey. At these words, Madame de Renal felt seized by a deadly coldness. She was unhappy by reason of her virtue, and even more unhappy by reason of her weakness. This new event engrossed her imagination, and she was transported far beyond the good resolutions which she owed to the awful night she had just passed. It was not now a question of resisting that charming lover, but of losing him for ever. It was necessary to appear at breakfast. To complete her anguish, Monsieur de Renal and Madame de Ville talked of nothing but Julien's departure. The mayor of Verrières had noticed something unusual in the firm tone in which he had asked for a holiday. That little peasant has no doubt got somebody else's offer up his sleeve, but that somebody else, even though it's Monsieur Valenot, is bound to be a little discouraged by the sum of six hundred francs which the annual salary now tots up to. He must have asked yesterday at Verrières for a period of three days to think it over, and our little gentleman runs off to the mountains this morning so as not to be obliged to give me an answer. Think of having to reckon with a wretched workman who puts on airs, but that's what we've come to. If my husband, who does not know how deeply he has wounded Julien, thinks that he will leave us, what can I think myself? said Madame de Renal to herself. Yes, that is all decided. In order to be able at any rate to be free to cry and to avoid answering Madame de Ville's questions, she pleaded an awful headache and went to bed. "'That's what women are,' repeated Monsieur de Renal. "'There is always something out of order in those complicated machines,' and went off, jeering. While Madame de Renal was a prey to all the poignancy of the terrible passion in which chance had involved her, Julien went merrily on his way, surrounded by the most beautiful views that mountain scenery can offer. 
he had to cross the great chain north of Vergy. The path which he followed rose gradually among the big beech woods and ran into infinite spirals on the slope of the high mountain which forms the northern boundary of the Doob Valley. Soon the traveller's view, as he passed over the lower slopes bounding the course of the Doob towards the south, extends as far as the fertile plains of Burgundy and Beaujolais. However insensible was the soul of this ambitious youth to this kind of beauty, he could not help stopping from time to time to look at a spectacle at once so vast and so impressive. Finally he reached the summit of the great mountain, near which he had to pass in order to arrive by this cross-country route at the solitary valley where lived his friend Fouquet, the young wood merchant. Julien was in no hurry to see him, either him or any other human being. Hidden like a bird of prey amid the bare rocks which crowned the great mountain, he could see a long way off anyone coming near him. He discovered a little grotto in the middle of the almost vertical slope of one of the rocks. He found a way into it, and was soon ensconced in this retreat. Here, he said, with eyes brilliant with joy, men cannot hurt me. It occurred to him to indulge in the pleasure of writing down those thoughts of his which were so dangerous to him everywhere else. A square stone served him for a desk. His pen flew. He saw nothing of what was around him. He noticed at last that the sun was setting behind the distant mountains of Beaujolais. "'Why shouldn't I pass the night here?' he said to himself. "'I have bread, and I am free.' He felt a spiritual exaltation at the sound of that great word. The necessity of playing the hypocrite resulted in his not being free, even at Fouquet's. Leaning his head on his two hands, Julien stayed in the grotto, more happy than he had ever been in his life, thrilled by his dreams and by the bliss of his freedom. Without realising it, he saw all the rays of the twilight become successively extinguished. Surrounded by this immense obscurity, his soul wandered into the contemplation of what he imagined that he would one day meet in Paris. First it was a woman, much more beautiful and possessed of a much more refined temperament than anything he could have found in the provinces. He loved with passion, and was loved. If he separated from her for some instance, it was only to cover himself with glory, and to deserve to be loved still more. A young man brought up in the environment of the sad truths of Paris society would, on reaching this point in his romance, even if we assume him possessed of Julien's imagination, have been brought back to himself by the cold irony of the situation. Great deeds would have disappeared from out his ken, together with hope of achieving them, and have been succeeded by the platitude, If one leave one's mistress, one runs, alas, the risk of being deceived two or three times a day but the young peasant saw nothing but the lack of opportunity between himself and the most heroic feats. But a deep night had succeeded the day, and there were still two leagues to walk before he could descend to the cabin in which Fouquet lived. Before leaving the little cave, Julien made a light and carefully burnt all that he had written. He quite astonished his friend when he knocked at his door at one o'clock in the morning. He found Fouquet engaged in making up his accounts, he was a young man of high stature, rather badly made, with big, hard features, a never-ending nose, and a large fund of good nature concealed beneath this repulsive appearance. "'Have you quarrelled with Monsieur de Renal, then, that you turn up unexpectedly like this?' Julien told him, but in a suitable way, the events of the previous day. "'Stay with me,' said Fouquet to him. I see that you know Monsieur de Renal, Monsieur Valenot, the sub-prefect, Maugeron, the curé Chalin. You have understood the subtleties of the character of those people. So there you are, then, quite qualified to attend auctions. You know arithmetic better than I do. You will keep my accounts. I make a lot in my business. The impossibility of doing everything myself and the fear of taking a rascal for my partner prevents me daily from undertaking excellent business. It's scarcely a month since I put Monsieur de Saint-Amand, whom I haven't seen for six years, and whom I ran across at the sale at Portalier in the way of making six thousand francs. Why shouldn't it have been you who made those six thousand francs, or at any rate three thousand? For if I had had you with me that day, I would have raised the bidding for that lot of timber, and everybody else would have run away. Be my partner. This offer upset Julian. It spoilt the train of his mad dreams. Fouquet showed his accounts to Julien during the whole of the supper, which the two friends prepared themselves like the Homeric heroes, for Fouquet lived alone, and proved to him all the advantages offered by his timber business. 
Fouquet had the highest opinion of the gifts and character of Julien. When, finally, the latter was alone in his little room of Pinewood, he said to himself, It is true, I can make some thousands of francs here, and then take up with advantage the profession of a soldier or of a priest, according to the fashion then prevalent in France. The little hoard that I shall have amassed will remove all petty difficulties. In the solitude of this mountain I shall have dissipated to some extent my awful ignorance of so many of the things which make up the life of all those men of fashion. But Fouquet has given up all thoughts of marriage, and at the same time keeps telling me that solitude makes him unhappy. It is clear that if he takes a partner who has no capital to put into his business, he does so in the hopes of getting a companion who will never leave him. "'Shall I deceive my friend?' exclaimed Julien petulantly. This being, who found hypocrisy and complete callousness his ordinary means of self-preservation, could not, on this occasion, endure the idea of the slightest lack of delicate feeling towards a man whom he loved. But suddenly Julien was happy. He had a reason for a refusal. "'What? Shall I be coward enough to waste seven or eight years? I shall get to twenty-eight in that way. But at that age Bonaparte had achieved his greatest feats.' when I shall have made in obscurity a little money by frequenting timber sales and earning the good graces of some rascally understrappers, who will guarantee that I shall still have the sacred fire with which one makes a name for oneself? The following morning, Julien, with considerable sang-froid, said in answer to the good Fouquet, who regarded the matter of the partnership as settled, that his vocation for the holy ministry of the altars would not permit him to accept it. Fouquet did not return to the subject. But just think, he repeated to him, I'll make you my partner, or if you prefer it, I'll give you four thousand francs a year, and you want to return to that Monsieur de Renal of yours who despises you like the mud on his shoes. When you've got two hundred louis in front of you, what is to prevent you from entering the seminary? I'll go further. I will undertake to procure for you the best living in the district, for, added Fouquet, lowering his voice, I supply firewood to Monsieur Le... Blank, Monsieur Le Blanc, Monsieur Blanc. I provide them with first quality oak, but they only pay me for plain wood, but never was money better invested. Nothing could conquer Julien's vocation. Fouquet finished by thinking him a little mad. The third day, in the early morning, Julien left his friend and passed the day among the rocks of the great mountain. He found his little cave again, but he had no longer peace of mind. His friend's offers had robbed him of it. He found himself, not between vice and virtue, like Hercules, but between mediocrity, coupled with an assured prosperity, and all the heroic dreams of his youth. So I have not got real determination after all, he said to himself, and it was his doubt on this score which pained him the most. I am not of the stuff of which great men are made, because I fear that eight years spent in earning a livelihood will deprive me of that sublime energy which inspires the accomplishment of extraordinary feats. End of section 12. Section 13 of The Red and the Black by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 13. The Open Work Stockings. A novel, a mirror which one takes out on one's walk along the high road. saint when Julien perceived the picturesque ruins of the old church at Vergy, he noticed that he had not given a single thought to Madame de Renal since the day before yesterday. The other day, when I took my leave, that woman made me realise the infinite distance which separated us. She treated me like a labourer's son. No doubt she wished to signify her repentance for having allowed me to hold her hand the evening before. It is, however, very pretty, is that hand. What a charm! What a nobility is there in that woman's expression! The possibility of making a fortune with Fouquet gave a certain facility to Julien's logic. It was not spoilt quite so frequently by the irritation and the keen consciousness of his poverty and low estate in the eyes of the world. Placed, as it were, on a high promontory, he was able to exercise his judgment, and had a commanding view, so to speak, of both extreme poverty and that competence which he still called wealth. He was far from judging his position really philosophically, but he had enough penetration to feel different after this little journey into the mountain. 
He was struck with the extreme uneasiness with which Madame de Renal listened to the brief account which he had asked for of his journey. Fouquet had had plans of marriage, and unhappy love affairs, and long confidences on this subject had formed the staple of the two friends' conversation. Having found happiness too soon, Fouquet had realised that he was not the only one who was loved. All these accounts had astonished Julian. He had learnt many new things. His solitary life of imagination and suspicion had kept him remote from anything which could enlighten him. During his absence, life had been nothing for Madame de Renal but a series of tortures, which, though different, were all unbearable. She was really ill. Now mind, said Madame de Villa to her when she saw Julien arrive, that you don't go into the garden this evening in your weak state. The damp air will make your complaint twice as bad. Madame de Villa was surprised to see that her friend, who was always scolded by Monsieur de Renal by reason of the excessive simplicity of her dress, had just got some open-work stockings and some charming little shoes which had come from Paris. For three days Madame de Renal's only distraction had been to cut out a summer dress of a pretty little material which was very fashionable and get it made with express speed by Elisa. This dress could scarcely have been finished a few moments before Julien's arrival, but Madame de Renal put it on immediately. Her friend had no longer any doubt. She loves, unhappy woman, said Madame de Ville to herself. She understood all the strange symptoms of the malady. She saw her speak to Julien. The most violent blush was succeeded by pallor. Anxiety was depicted in her eyes, which were riveted on those of the young tutor. Madame de Renal expected every minute that he would give an explanation of his conduct and announce that he was either going to leave the house or stay there. Julien carefully avoided that subject and did not even think of it. After terrible struggles, Madame de Renal eventually dared to say to him in a trembling voice that mirrored all her passion, "'Are you going to leave your pupils to take another place?' Julien was struck by Madame de Renal's hesitating voice and look. "'That woman loves me,' he said to himself. "'But after this temporary moment of weakness for which her pride is no doubt reproaching her, "'and as soon as she has ceased fearing that I shall leave, she will be as haughty as ever.' This view of their mutual position passed through Julien's mind as rapidly as a flash of lightning. He answered, with some hesitation, "'I shall be extremely distressed to leave children who are so nice and so well born, but perhaps it will be necessary. One has duties to oneself as well.' As he pronounced the expression, "'well born,' it was one of those aristocratic phrases which Julien had recently learnt, he became animated by a profound feeling of antipathy. I am not well born, he said to himself, in that woman's eyes. As Madame de Renal listened to him, she admired his genius and his beauty, and the hinted possibility of his departure pierced her heart. All her friends at Verrieres, who had come to dine at Vergy during Julien's absence, had complimented her almost jealously on the astonishing man whom her husband had had the good fortune to unearth. It was not that they understood anything about the progress of children. The feat of knowing his Bible by heart, and what is more of knowing it in Latin, had struck the inhabitants of Verrieres with an admiration which will last perhaps a century. Julien, who never spoke to anyone, was ignorant of all this. If Madame de Renal had possessed the slightest presence of mind, she would have complimented him on the reputation which he had won, and Julien's pride, once satisfied, he would have been sweet and amiable towards her, especially as he thought her new dress charming. Madame de Renal was also pleased with her pretty dress, and with what Julien had said to her about it, and wanted to walk round the garden. But she soon confessed that she was incapable of walking. She had taken the traveller's arm, and the contact of that arm, far from increasing her strength, deprived her of it completely. It was night. They had scarcely sat down before Julien, availing himself of his old privilege, dared to bring his lips near his pretty neighbour's arm, and to take her hand. He kept thinking of the boldness which Fouquet had exhibited with his mistresses and not of Madame de Renal. The word well-born was still heavy on his heart. He felt his hand pressed, but experienced no pleasure. So far from his being proud or even grateful for the sentiment that Madame de Renal was betraying that evening by only two evident signs, he was almost insensible to her beauty, her elegance and her freshness. Purity of soul and the absence of all hateful emotion doubtless prolonged the duration of youth. 
It is the face which ages first with the majority of women. Julian sulked all the evening. Up to the present he had only been angry with the social order, but from that time that Fouquet had offered him an ignoble means of obtaining a competency, he was irritated with himself. Julian was so engrossed in his thoughts that although from time to time he said a few words to the ladies, he eventually let go Madame de Renal's hand without noticing it. This action overwhelmed the soul of the poor woman. She saw in it her whole fate. If she had been certain of Julien's affection, her virtue would possibly have found strength to resist him. But trembling lest she should lose him for ever, she was distracted by her passion to the point of taking again Julien's hand, which he had left in his absent-mindedness leaning on the back of the chair. This action woke up this ambitious youth. He would have liked to have had for witnesses all those proud nobles who had regarded him at meals when he was at the bottom of the table with the children with so condescending a smile. That woman cannot despise me. In that case, he said to himself, I ought to show my appreciation of her beauty. I owe it to myself to be her lover. That idea would not have occurred to him before the naive confidences which his friend had made. The sudden resolution which he had just made formed an agreeable distraction. He kept saying to himself, I must have one of those two women. He realised that he would have very much preferred to have paid court to Madame de Ville. It was not that she was more agreeable, but that she had always seen him as the tutor distinguished by his knowledge, and not as the journeyman carpenter with his cloth jacket folded under his arm as he had first appeared to Madame de Renal. It was precisely as a young workman, blushing up to the whites of his eyes, standing by the door of the house and not daring to ring, that he had made the most alluring appeal to Madame de Renal's imagination. As he went on reviewing his position, Julien saw that the conquest of Madame de Ville, who had probably noticed the taste which Madame de Renal was manifesting for him, was out of the question. He was thus brought back to the latter lady. "'What do I know of the character of that woman?' said Julien to himself. Only this, before my journey, I used to take her hand, and she used to take it away. Today, I take my hand away, and she seizes it and presses it. A fine opportunity to pay her back all the contempt she had had for me. God knows how many lovers she has had. Probably she is only deciding in my favour by reason of the easiness of assignations. Such, alas, is the misfortune of an excessive civilization. The soul of a young man of twenty possessed of any education is a thousand leagues away from that abandon without which love is frequently but the most tedious of duties. I owe it all the more to myself, went on the petty vanity of Julien, to succeed with that woman, by reason of the fact that if I ever make a fortune, and I am reproached by anyone with my menial position as a tutor, I shall then be able to give out that it was love which got me the post. Julien again took his hand away from Madame de Renal, and then took her hand again and pressed it. As they went back to the drawing-room about midnight, Madame de Renal said to him in a whisper, "'You are leaving us? You are going?' Julien answered with a sigh, "'I absolutely must leave, for I love you passionately. It is wrong. How wrong, indeed, for a young priest!' Madame de Renal leant upon his arm, and with so much abandon that her cheek felt the warmth of Julien's. The nights of these two persons were quite different. Madame de Renal was exalted by the ecstasies of the highest moral pleasure. A coquettish young girl who loves early in life gets habituated to the trouble of love, and when she reaches the age of real passion, finds the charm of novelty lacking. As Madame de Renal had never read any novels, all the refinements of her happiness were new to her. No mournful truth came to Cella, not even the spectre of the future. She imagined herself as happy in ten years' time as she was at the present moment. Even the idea of virtue and of her sworn fidelity to Monsieur de Renal, which had agitated her some days past, now presented itself in vain and was sent about its business like an importunate visitor. "'I will never grant anything to Julien,' said Madame de Renal. "'We will live in the future like we have been living for the last month. He shall be a friend.' End of section 13。section 14 of the red and the black by Stendhal。translated by Horace Barnett Samuel。this librivox recording is in the public domain。read by Peter Dan。
the English scissors. A young girl of sixteen had a pink complexion and yet used red rouge. Polidori. Fouquet's offer had, as a matter of fact, taken away all Julien's happiness. He could not make up his mind to any definite course. Alas, perhaps I am lacking in character. I should have been a bad soldier of Napoleon. At least, he added, my little intrigue with the mistress of the house will distract me a little. Happily for him, even in this little subordinate incident, his inner emotions quite failed to correspond with his flippant words. He was frightened of Madame de Renal because of her pretty dress. In his eyes, that dress was a vanguard of Paris. His pride refused to leave anything to chance in the inspiration of the moment. He made himself a very minute plan of campaign, moulded on the confidences of Fouquet, and a little that he had read about love in the Bible. As he was very nervous, though he did not admit it to himself, he wrote down this plan. Madame de Renal was alone with him for the moment in the drawing-room on the following morning. "'Have you no other name except Julien?' she said. Our hero was at a loss to answer, so nattering a question. This circumstance had not been anticipated in his plan. If he had not been stupid enough to have made a plan, Julien's quick wit would have served him well, and the surprise would only have intensified the quickness of his perception. He was clumsy, and exaggerated his clumsiness. Madame de Renal quickly forgave him. She attributed it to a charming frankness and an air of frankness was the very thing which, in her view, was just lacking in this man who was acknowledged to have so much genius. "'That little tutor of yours inspires me with a great deal of suspicion,' said Madame de Villa to her sometimes. "'I think he looks as if he were always thinking, and he never acts without calculation. He is a sly fox.' Julien remained profoundly humiliated by the misfortune of not having known what answer to make to Madame de Renal. A man like I am ought to make up for this check. And seizing the moment when they were passing from one room to another, he thought it was his duty to give Madame de Renal a kiss. Nothing could have been less tactful, nothing less agreeable, and nothing more imprudent both for him and for her. They were within an inch of being noticed. Madame de Renal thought him mad. She was frightened, and above all, shocked. This stupidity reminded her of Monsieur Valenod. What would happen to me, she said to herself, if I were alone with him? All her virtue returned, because her love was waning. She so arranged it that one of her children always remained with her. Julien found the day very tedious, and passed it entirely in clumsily putting into operation his plan of seduction. He did not look at Madame de Renal on a single occasion without that look having a reason, but nevertheless he was not sufficiently stupid to fail to see that he was not succeeding at all in being amiable, and was succeeding even less in being fascinating. Madame de Renal did not recover from her astonishment at finding him so awkward, and at the same time so bold. "'It is the timidity of love in men of intellect,' she said to herself with an inexpressible joy. "'Could it be possible that he had never been loved by my rival?' After breakfast, Madame de Renal went back to the drawing-room to receive the visit of Monsieur Charcot de Maugiron, the sub-prefect of Bray. She was working at a little frame of fancy-work some distance from the ground. Madame de Ville was at her side. That was how she was placed when our hero thought it suitable to advance his boot in the full light and press the pretty foot of Madame de Renal, whose open-work stockings and pretty Paris shoe were evidently attracting the looks of the gallant sub-prefect. Madame de Renal was very much afraid, and let fall her scissors, her ball of wool, and her needles, so that Julien's movement could be passed for a clumsy effort intended to prevent the fall of the scissors, which presumably he had seen slide. Fortunately, these little scissors of English steel were broken, and Madame de Renal did not spare her regrets that Julien had not succeeded in getting nearer to her. "'You noticed them falling before I did. You could have prevented it.' Instead, all your zealousness only succeeded in giving me a very big kick. All this took in the sub-prefect, but not Madame de Ville. That pretty boy has very silly manners, she thought. The social code of a provincial capital never forgives this kind of lapse. Madame de Renal found an opportunity of saying to Julien, Be prudent, I order you. Julien appreciated his own clumsiness. He was upset. 
He deliberated with himself for a long time, in order to ascertain whether or not he ought to be angry at the expression, I order you. He was silly enough to think she might have said, I order you, as if it were some question concerning the children's education, but in answering my love she puts me on an equality. It is impossible to love without equality, and all his mind ran riot in making commonplaces on equality. He angrily repeated to himself that verse of Corneille which Madame de V had taught him some days before. L'amour les égalités et ne les cherche pas. Julien, who had never had a mistress in his whole life, but yet insisted on playing the role of a Don Juan, made a shocking fool of himself all day. He had only one sensible idea. Bored with himself and Madame de Renal, he viewed with apprehension the advance of the evening when he would have to sit by her side in the darkness of the garden. He told Monsieur de Renal that he was going to Verrières to see the curé. He left after dinner and only came back in the night. At Verrières, Julien found M. Chalin involved in moving. He had just been deprived of his living. The curé de Maslon was replacing him. Julien helped the good curé, and it occurred to him to write to Fouquet that the irresistible mission which he felt for the holy ministry had previously prevented him from accepting his kind offer, but that he had just seen an instance of injustice, and that perhaps it would be safer not to enter into holy orders. Julien congratulated himself on his subtlety in exploiting the dismissal of the curé of Verrières so as to leave himself a loophole for returning to commerce in the event of a gloomy prudence routing the spirit of heroism from his mind. End of section 14「Section 15 of The Red and the Black by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 15. The Cock's Song. Amour en latin fait amour, au don provient d'amour la mar, et par avant sous les qui mourent, doi plus piège pour faire le mot. Blason d'amour. If Julien had possessed a little of that adroitness on which he so gratuitously plumed himself, he could have congratulated himself the following day on the effect produced by his journey to Verrières. His absence had caused the clumsiness to be forgotten. But on that day he was also rather sulky. He had a ludicrous idea in the evening, and with singular courage he communicated it to Madame de Renal. They had scarcely sat down in the garden before Julien brought his mouth near Madame de Renal's ear without waiting till it was sufficiently dark, and at the risk of compromising her terribly, said to her, Madame, tonight, at two o'clock, I shall go into your room. I must tell you something. Julien trembled lest his request should be granted. His rakish pose weighed him down so terribly that if he could have followed his own inclination he would have returned to his room for several days and refrained from seeing the ladies any more. He realised that he had spoiled by his clever conduct of last evening all the bright prospects of the day that had just passed, and was at his wit's end what to do. Madame de Renal answered the impertinent declaration which Julien had dared to make to her with indignation which was real and in no way exaggerated. He thought he could see contempt in her curt reply. The expression, for shame, had certainly occurred in that whispered answer. Julien went to the children's room under the pretext of having something to say to them, and on his return he placed himself beside Madame de Ville, and very far from Madame de Renal. He thus deprived himself of all possibility of taking her hand. The conversation was serious, and Julien acquitted himself very well, apart from a few moments of silence during which he was cudgelling his brains. Why can't I invent some pretty manoeuvre, he said to himself, which will force Madame de Renal to vouchsafe to me those unambiguous signs of tenderness which a few days ago made me think that she was mine. Julien was extremely disconcerted by the almost desperate plight to which he had brought his affairs. Nothing, however, would have embarrassed him more than success. When they separated at midnight, his pessimism made him think that he enjoyed Madame de Ville's contempt, and that probably he stood no better with Madame de Renal. Feeling in a very bad temper, and very humiliated, Julien did not sleep. He was leagues away from the idea of giving up all intriguing and planning, and of living from day to day with Madame de Renal, and of being contented like a child with the happiness brought by every day. 
He racked his brains, inventing clever manoeuvres, which an instant afterwards he found absurd, and to put it shortly, he was very unhappy when two o'clock rang from the castle clock. The noise woke him up like the cock's crow woke up St. Peter. The most painful episode was now time to begin. He had not given a thought to his impertinent proposition since the moment when he had made it, and it had been so badly received. "'I have told her that I will go to her at two o'clock,' he said to himself as he got up. "'I may be inexperienced and coarse, as the son of a peasant naturally would be. Madame de Vere has given me to understand as much, but at any rate I will not be weak.' Julien had reason to congratulate himself on his courage, for he had never put his self-control to so painful a test. As he opened his door he was trembling to such an extent that his knees gave way under him, and he was forced to lean against the wall. He was without shoes. He went and listened at Monsieur de Renal's door, and could hear his snoring. He was disconsolate. He had no longer any excuse for not going to her room. But, great heaven, what was he to do there? He had no plan, and even if he had one, he felt himself so nervous that he would have been incapable of carrying it out. Eventually, suffering a thousand times more than if he had been walking to his death, he entered the little corridor that led to Madame de Renal's room. He opened the door with a trembling hand and made a frightful noise. There was a light, a night light, was burning on the mantelpiece. He had not expected this new misfortune. As she saw him enter, Madame de Renal got quickly out of bed. Wretch! she cried. There was a little confusion. Julien forgot his useless plans and turned to his natural role. To fail to please so charming a woman appeared to him the greatest of misfortunes. His only answer to her reproaches was to throw himself at her feet while he kissed her knees. As she was speaking to him with extreme harshness, he burst into tears. When Julien came out of Madame de Renal's room some hours afterwards, one could have said, adopting the conventional language of the novel, that there was nothing left to be desired. In fact, he owed to the love he had inspired and to the unexpected impression which her alluring charms had produced upon him a victory to which his own clumsy tactics would never have led him. But, victim that he was of a distorted pride, he pretended even in the sweetest moments to play the role of a man accustomed to the subjugation of women. He made incredible but deliberate efforts to spoil his natural charm. Instead of watching the transports which he was bringing into existence, and those pangs of remorse which only set their keenness into fuller relief, the idea of duty was continually before his eyes. He feared a frightful remorse and internal ridicule if he departed from the ideal model he proposed to follow. In a word, the very quality which made Julian into a superior being was precisely that which prevented him from savouring the happiness which was placed within his grasp. It's like the case of a young girl of sixteen with a charming complexion who is mad enough to put on rouge before going to a ball. Mortally terrified by the apparition of Julien, Madame de Renal was soon a prey to the most cruel alarm. The prayers and despair of Julien troubled her keenly. Even when there was nothing left for her to refuse him, she pushed Julien away from her with a genuine indignation and straightway threw herself into his arms. There was no plan apparent in all this conduct. She thought herself eternally damned, and tried to hide from herself the sight of hell by loading Julian with the wildest caresses. In a word, nothing would have been lacking in our hero's happiness, not even an ardent sensibility in the woman whom he had just captured, if he had only known how to enjoy it. Julian's departure did not in any way bring to an end those ecstasies which thrilled her in spite of herself, and those troubles of remorse which lacerated her. "'My God!' being happy, being loved. Is that all it comes to? This was Julien's first thought as he entered his room. He was a prey to the astonishment and nervous anxiety of the man who has just obtained what he has long desired. He has been accustomed to desire and has no longer anything to desire, and nevertheless has no memories. Like a soldier coming back from parade, Julien was absorbed in rehearsing the details of his conduct. Have I failed in nothing which I owe to myself? Have I played my part well? And what a part! The part of a man accustomed to be brilliant with women. End of section 15
Translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 16. The Day After. He turned his lips to hers, and with his hand called back the tangles of her wandering hair. Don Juan, Canto 1, Stanza 170. Happily for Julien's fame, Madame de Renal had been too agitated and too astonished to appreciate the stupidity of the man who had in a single moment become the whole world to her. "'Oh, my God!' she said to herself as she pressed him to retire when she saw the dawn break. "'If my husband has heard the noise, I am lost!' Julien, who had had the time to make up some phrases, remembered this one. "'Would you regret your life?' Oh, very much at a moment like this, but I should not regret having known you. Julian thought it incumbent on his dignity to go back to his room in broad daylight and with deliberate imprudence. The continuous attention with which he kept on studying his slightest actions with the absurd idea of appearing a man of experience had only one advantage. When he saw Madame de Renal again at breakfast, his conduct was a masterpiece of prudence. As for her... She could not look at him without blushing up to the eyes, and could not live a moment without looking at him. She realised her own nervousness, and her efforts to hide it redoubled. Julien only lifted his eyes towards her once. At first Madame de Renal admired his prudence. Soon, seeing that this single look was not repeated, she became alarmed. "'Could it be that he does not love me?' she said to herself. "'Alas, I am quite old for him. I am ten years older than he is.' As she passed from the dining-room to the garden, she pressed Julian's hand. In the surprise caused by so singular a mark of love, he regarded her with passion, for he had thought her very pretty over breakfast, and while keeping his eyes downcast he had passed his time in thinking of the details of her charms. This look consoled Madame de Renal. It did not take away all her anxiety, but her anxiety tended to take away nearly completely all her remorse towards her husband. The husband had noticed nothing at breakfast. It was not so with Madame de Ville. She thought she saw Madame de Renal on the point of succumbing. During the whole day her bold and incisive friendship regaled her cousin with those innuendos which were intended to paint in hideous colours the dangers she was running. Madame de Renal was burning to find herself alone with Julien. She wished to ask him if he still loved her. In spite of the unalterable sweetness of her character, she was several times on the point of notifying her friend how officious she was. Madame de Ville arranged things so adroitly that evening in the garden that she found herself placed between Madame de Renal and Julien. Madame de Renal, who had thought in her imagination how delicious it would be to press Julien's hand and carry it to her lips, was not able to address a single word to him. This hitch increased her agitation. She was devoured by one pang of remorse. She had so scolded Julian for his imprudence in coming to her room on the preceding night that she trembled lest he should not come to-night. She left the garden early and went and ensconced herself in her room, but not being able to control her impatience, she went and glued her ear to Julian's door. In spite of the uncertainty and passion which devoured her, she did not dare to enter. This action seemed to her the greatest possible meanness, for it forms the basis of a provincial proverb. The servants had not yet all gone to bed. Prudence at last compelled her to return to her room. Two hours of waiting were two centuries of torture. Julien was too faithful to what he called his duty to fail to accomplish stage by stage what he had mapped out for himself. As one o'clock struck, he escaped softly from his room, assured himself that the master of the house was soundly asleep, and appeared in Madame de Renal's room. Tonight he experienced more happiness by the side of his love, for he thought less constantly about the part he had to play. He had eyes to see and ears to hear. What Madame de Renal said to him about his age contributed to give him some assurance. "'Alas, I am ten years older than you. How can you love me?' she repeated vaguely, because the idea oppressed her. Julien could not realise her happiness, but he saw that it was genuine, and he forgot almost entirely his own fear of being ridiculous. The foolish thought that he was regarded as an inferior by reason of his obscure birth disappeared also. As Julien's transports reassured his timid mistress, she regained a little of her happiness and of her power to judge her lover. 
Happily, he had not on this occasion that artificial air which had made the assignation of the previous night a triumph rather than a pleasure. If she had realised his concentration on playing a part, that melancholy discovery would have taken away all her happiness for ever. She could only have seen in it the result of the difference in their ages. Although Madame de Renal had never thought of theories of love, Difference in age is next to difference in fortune, one of the great commonplaces of provincial witticisms whenever love is the topic of conversation. In a few days Julien surrendered himself with all the ardour of his age, and was desperately in love. One must own, he said to himself, that she has an angelic kindness of soul, and no one in the world is prettier. He had almost completely given up playing a part. In a moment of abandon he even confessed to her all his nervousness. This confidence raised the passion which he was inspiring to its zenith. "'And I have no lucky rival after all,' said Madame de Renal to herself with delight. She ventured to question him on the portrait in which he used to be so interested. Julien swore to her that it was that of a man. When Madame de Renal had enough presence of mind left to reflect, she did not recover from her astonishment that so great a happiness could exist, and that she had never had anything of. Oh, she said to herself, if I had only known Julien ten years ago, when I was still considered pretty. Julien was far from having thoughts like these. His love was still akin to ambition. It was the joy of possessing, poor, unfortunate, and despised as he was, so beautiful a woman. His acts of devotion and his ecstasies at the sight of his mistress's charm finished by reassuring her a little with regard to the difference of age. If she had possessed a little of that knowledge of life which the woman of thirty has enjoyed in the more civilised of countries for quite a long time, she would have trembled for the duration of a love which only seemed to thrive on novelty and the intoxication of a young man's vanity. In those moments when he forgot his ambition, Julien admired ecstatically even the hats and even the dresses of Madame de Renal. He could not sate himself with the pleasure of smelling their perfume. He would open her mirrored cupboard and remain hours on end admiring the beauty and the order of everything that he found there. His love leaned on him and looked at him. He was looking at those jewels and those dresses which had been her wedding presents. I might have married a man like that, thought Madame de Renal sometimes. What a fiery soul, what a delightful life one would have with him. As for Julien, he had never been so near to those terrible instruments of feminine artillery. It is impossible, he said to himself, for there to be anything more beautiful in Paris. He could find no flaw in his happiness. The sincere admiration and ecstasies of his mistress would frequently make him forget that silly pose which had rendered him so stiff and almost ridiculous during the first moments of the intrigue. There were moments where, in spite of his habitual hypocrisy, he found an extreme delight in confessing to this great lady who admired him his ignorance of a crowd of little usages. His mistress's rank seemed to lift him above himself. Madame de Renal, on her side, would find the sweetest thrill of intellectual voluptuousness in thus instructing, in a number of little things, this young man who was so full of genius, and who was looked upon by everyone as destined one day to go so far. Even the sub-prefect and Monsieur Valenot could not help admiring him. She thought it made them less foolish. As for Madame de Ville, she was very far from being in a position to express the same sentiments rendered desperate by what she thought she divined, and seeing that her good advice was becoming offensive to a woman who had literally lost her head, she left Vergy without giving the explanation which her friend carefully refrained from asking. Madame de Renal shed a few tears for her, and soon found her happiness greater than ever. As a result of her departure, she found herself alone with her lover nearly the whole day. Julien abandoned himself all the more to the delightful society of his sweetheart, since, whenever he was alone, Fouquet's fatal proposition still continued to agitate him. During the first days of his novel life, there were moments when the man who had never loved, who had never been loved by anyone, would find so delicious a pleasure in being sincere that he was on the point of confessing to Madame de Renal that ambition which, up to then, had been the very essence of his existence. He would have liked to have been able to consult her on the strange temptation which Fouquet's offer held out to him, but a little episode rendered any frankness impossible. 
End of section 16. Section 17 of The Red and the Black by Stendhal. Translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 17. The First Deputy. Oh, how this spring of love resembleth the uncertain glory of an April day, which now shows all the beauty of the sun, and by and by a cloud takes all away. Two gentlemen of Verona. One evening when the sun was setting, and he was sitting near his love at the bottom of the orchard, far from all intruders, he meditated deeply. Will such sweet moments, he said to himself, last for ever? His soul was engrossed in the difficulty of deciding on a calling. He lamented that great attack of unhappiness which comes at the end of childhood and spoils the first years of youth in those who are not rich. Ah, he exclaimed, was not Napoleon the heaven-sent saviour for young Frenchmen? Who is to replace him? What will those unfortunate youths do without him, who, even though they are richer than I am, have only just the few crowns necessary to procure an education for themselves, but have not, at the age of twenty, enough money to buy a man and advance themselves in their career? Whatever one does, he added with a deep sigh, this fatal memory will always prevent our being happy. He suddenly saw Madame de Renal frown. She assumed a cold and disdainful air. She thought his way of looking at things typical of a servant. Brought up as she was with the idea that she was very rich, she took it for granted that Julien was so also. She loved him a thousand times more than life and set no store by money. Julien was far from guessing these ideas, but that frown brought him back to earth. He had sufficient presence of mind to manipulate his phrases and to give the noble lady who was sitting so near him on the grass seat to understand that the words he had just repeated had been heard by him during his journey to his friend the wood merchant. It was the logic of infidels. Well, have nothing to do with those people, said Madame de Renal, still keeping a little of that icy air which had suddenly succeeded an expression of the warmest tenderness. This frown, or rather his remorse for his own imprudence, was the first check to the illusion which was transporting Julien. He said to himself, She is good and sweet, she has a great fancy for me, but she has been brought up in the enemy's camp. They must be particularly afraid of that class of men of spirit who, after a good education, have not enough money to take up a career. What would become of those nobles if we had an opportunity of fighting them with equal arms? Suppose me, for example, mayor of Verrières, and as well-meaning and honest as Monsieur de Renal is at bottom. What short shrift I should make of the vicaire, Monsieur Valenot, and all their jobberies. How justice would triumph in Verrières. It is not their talents which would stop me. They are always fumbling about. That day Julien's happiness almost became permanent. Our hero lacked the power of daring to be sincere. He ought to have had the courage to have given battle, and on the spot, Madame de Renal had been astonished by Julien's phrase, because the men in her circle kept on repeating that the return of Robespierre was essentially possible by reason of those educated young persons of the lower classes. Madame de Renal's coldness lasted a longish time, and struck Julien as marked. The reason was that the fear that she had said something in some way or other disagreeable to him succeeded her annoyance for his own breach of taste. This unhappiness was vividly reflected in those features which looked so pure and so naive when she was happy and away from intruders. Julien no longer dared to surrender himself to his dreams. Growing calmer and less infatuated, he considered that it was imprudent to go and see Madame de Renal in her room. It was better for her to come to him. If a servant noticed her going about the house, a dozen different excuses could explain it. But this arrangement had also its inconveniences. Julien had received from Fouquet some books, which he, as a theology student, would never have dared to ask for in a bookshop. He only dared to open them at night. He would often have found it much more convenient not to be interrupted by a visit the very waiting for which had even on the evening before the little scene in the orchard completely destroyed his mood for reading. He had Madame de Renal to thank for understanding books in quite a new way. 
He had dared to question her on a number of little things, the ignorance of which cuts quite short the intellectual progress of any young man born out of society, however much natural genius one may choose to ascribe to him. This education, given through sheer love by a woman who was extremely ignorant, was a piece of luck. Julian managed to get a clear insight into society, such as it is today. His mind was not bewildered by the narration of what it had been once, two thousand years ago, or even sixty years ago, in the time of Voltaire and Louis XV. The scales fell from his eyes to his inexpressible joy, and he understood at last what was going on in Verrières. In the first place, there was the very complicated intrigues which had been woven for the last two years around the prefect of Bessinson. They were backed up by letters from Paris, written by the cream of the aristocracy. The scheme was to make Monsieur de Moirot, he was the most devout man in the district, the first and not the second deputy of the mayor of Verrières. He had, for a competitor, a very rich manufacturer, whom it was essential to push back into the place of second deputy. Julien understood at last the innuendos which he had surprised when the high society of the locality used to come and dine at Monsieur de Renal's. This privileged society was deeply concerned with the choice of a first deputy, while the rest of the town, and above all the liberals, did not even suspect its possibility. The factor which made the matter important was that, as everybody knows, the east side of the main street of Verrières has to be put more than nine feet back since that street has become a royal route. Now, if Monsieur de Moirot, who had three houses liable to have their frontage put back, succeeded in becoming first deputy, and consequently mayor in the event of Monsieur de Renal being selected for the chamber, he would shut his eyes, and it would be possible to make little imperceptible repairs in the houses projecting onto the public roads, as the result of which they would last a hundred years. In spite of the great piety and proved integrity of Monsieur de Moirot, Everybody was certain that he would prove amenable, because he had a great many children. Among the houses liable to have their frontage put back, nine belonged to the cream of Verrières society. In Julien's eyes, this intrigue was much more important than the history of the Battle of Fontenoy, whose name he now came across for the first time in one of the books which Fouquet had sent him. There had been many things which had astonished Julien since the time, five years ago, when he had started going to the cure's in the evening. But discretion and humility of spirit being the primary qualities of a theological student, it had always been impossible for him to put questions. One day Madame de Renal was giving an order to her husband's valet, who was Julien's enemy. But Madame, today is the last day in the month, the man answered in a rather strange manner. Go, said Madame de Renal. Well, said Julien, I suppose he's going to go to that corn shop which was once a church and has recently been restored to religion, but what is he going to do there? That's one of the mysteries which I have never been able to fathom. It's a very literary institution, but a very curious one, answered Madame de Renal. Women are not admitted to it. All I know is that everybody uses the second person singular. This servant, for example, will go and meet Monsieur Valenot there, and the haughty prig will not be a bit offended at hearing himself addressed by Saint Jean in that familiar way, and will answer him in the same way. If you are keen on knowing what takes place, I will ask Monsieur de Moiseron and Monsieur Valenot for details. We pay twenty francs for each servant, to prevent their cutting our throats one fine day. Time flew. The memory of his mistress's charms distracted Julien from his black ambition. The necessity of refraining from mentioning gloomy or intellectual topics, since they both belonged to opposing parties, added, without his suspecting it, to the happiness which he owed her, and to the dominion which she acquired over him. On the occasions when the presence of the precocious children reduced them to speaking the language of cold reason, Julien, looking at her with eyes sparkling with love, would listen with complete docility to her explanations of the world as it is. Frequently, in the middle of an account of some cunning piece of jobbery with reference to a road or a contract, Madame de Renal's mind would suddenly wander to the very point of delirium. Julien found it necessary to scold her. She indulged, when with him, in the same intimate gestures which she used with her own children. The fact was that there were days when she deceived herself that she loved him like her own child. 
Had she not repeatedly to answer his naive questions about a thousand simple things that a well-born child of fifteen knows quite well? An instant afterwards she would admire him like her master. His genius would even go so far as to frighten her. She thought she should see more clearly every day the future great man in this young abbé. She saw him pope. She saw him first minister like Richelieu. Shall I live long enough to see you in your glory, she said to Julien. There is room for a great man. Church and state have need of one. End of section 17「Section 18 of The Red and the Black by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 18. A King at Verrieres. Do you not deserve to be thrown aside like a plebeian corpse which has no soul and whose blood flows no longer in its veins? Sermon of the Bishop at the Chapel of St. Clement. On the 3rd of September, at ten o'clock in the evening, a gendarme woke up the whole of Verrieres by galloping up the main street. He brought the news that His Majesty, the King of Blank, would arrive the following Sunday, and it was already Tuesday. The prefect authorised, that is to say, demanded the forming of a guard of honour. They were to exhibit all possible pomp. An express messenger was sent to Vergy. Monsieur de Renal arrived during the night and found the town in a commotion. Each individual had his own pretensions. Those who were less busy hired balconies to see the king. Who was to command the guard of honour? M. de Renal at once realised how essential it was, in the interests of the houses liable to have their frontage put back, that M. de Boirot should have the command. That might entitle him to the post of first deputy mayor. There was nothing to say against the devoutness of M. de Boirot. It brooked no comparison, but he had never sat on a horse. He was a man of thirty-six, timid in every way, and equally frightened of falling and of looking ridiculous. The mayor had summoned him as early as five o'clock in the morning. "'You see, monsieur, I ask your advice, as though you already occupy that post to which all the people on the right side want to carry you. In this unhappy town, manufacturers are prospering. The Liberal Party is becoming possessed of millions. It aspires to power. It will manage to exploit everything to its own ends.' Let us consult the interest of the king, the interest of the monarchy, and above all, the interest of our holy religion. Who do you think, monsieur, could be entrusted with the command of the guard of honour? In spite of the terrible fear with which horses inspired him, Monsieur de Moirot finished by accepting this honour like a martyr. I shall know how to take the right tone, he said to the mayor. There was scarcely time enough to get ready the uniforms which had served seven years ago on the occasion of the passage of a prince of the blood. At seven o'clock, Madame de Renal arrived at Vergy with Julien and the children. She found her drawing-room filled with liberal ladies who preached the union of all parties and had come to beg her to urge her husband to grant a place to theirs in the guard of honour. One of them actually asserted that if her husband was not chosen, he would go bankrupt out of chagrin. Madame de Renal quickly got rid of all these people. She seemed very engrossed. Julien was astonished, and what was more, angry that she should make a mystery of what was disturbing her. I had anticipated it, he said bitterly to himself. Her love is being overwhelmed by the happiness of receiving a king in her house. All this hubbub overcomes her. She will love me once more when the ideas of her caste no longer trouble her brain. An astonishing fact... He only loved her the more. The decorators began to fill the house. He watched a long time for the opportunity to exchange a few words. He eventually found her as she was coming out of his own room, carrying one of his suits. They were alone. He tried to speak to her. She ran away, refusing to listen to him. I'm an absolute fool to love a woman like that, whose ambition renders her as mad as her husband. She was madder. One of her great wishes, which she had never confessed to Julien for fear of shocking him, was to see him leave off, if only for one day, his gloomy black suit. 
With an adroitness which was truly admirable in so ingenuous a woman, she secured first from Monsieur de Marot, and subsequently from Monsieur the sub-prefect de Maugiron, an assurance that Julien should be nominated a guard of honour in preference to five or six young people, the sons of very well-off manufacturers, of whom two at least were models of piety. Monsieur de Valenot, who reckoned on lending his carriage to the prettiest women in the town, and on showing off his fine Norman steeds, consented to let Julien, the being he hated most in the whole world, have one of his horses. But all the guards of honour either possessed or had borrowed one of those pretty sky-blue uniforms with two silver colonel epaulettes, which had shone seven years ago. Madame de Renal wanted a new uniform, and she only had four days in which to send to Bessinson and get from there the uniform, the arms, the hat, etc., everything necessary for a guard of honour. The most delightful part of it was that she thought it imprudent to get Julien's uniform made at Verrières. She wanted to surprise both him and the town. Having settled the questions of the Guard of Honour and of the public welcome finished, the mayor had now to organise a great religious ceremony. The King of Blank did not wish to pass through Verrières without visiting the famous relic of Saint Clement, which is kept at bray le haut barely a league from the town. The authorities wanted to have a numerous attendance of the clergy, but this matter was the most difficult to arrange. M. Maislon, the new curé, wanted to avoid at any price the presence of M. Chélin. It was in vain that M. de Renal tried to represent to him that it would be imprudent to do so. M. le Marquis de la Mole, whose ancestors had been governors of the province for so many generations, had been chosen to accompany the King of Blanc. He had known the Abbé Chélin for thirty years, he would certainly ask news of him when he arrived at Verrières, and if he found him disgraced, he was the very man to go and rout him out in the little house to which he had retired, accompanied by all the escort that he had at his disposition. What a rebuff that would be! I shall be disgraced both here and at Bessinson, answered the Abbe Maslon, if he appears among my clergy, a Jansenist by the Lord. "'Whatever you can say, my dear Abbe,' replied M. de Renal, "'I'll never expose the administration of Verrier "'to receiving such an affront from M. de la Mole. "'You do not know him. "'He is orthodox enough at court, "'but here in the provinces he is a satirical wit and cynic "'whose only object is to make people uncomfortable. "'He is capable of covering us with ridicule "'in the eyes of the Liberals, "'simply in order to amuse himself.' It was only on the night between the Saturday and the Sunday, after three whole days of negotiations, that the pride of the Abbe Maslon bent before the fear of the mayor, which was now changing into courage. It was necessary to write a honeyed letter to the Abbe Chalin, begging him to be present at the ceremony in connection with the relic of bray le if, of course, his great age and his infirmity allowed him to do so. M. Chelan asked for and obtained a letter of invitation for Julien, who was to accompany him as his subdeacon. From the beginning of the Sunday morning, thousands of peasants began to arrive from the neighbouring mountains and to inundate the streets of Verrières. It was the finest sunshine. Finally, about three o'clock, a thrill swept through all this crowd. A great fire had been perceived on a rock two leagues from Verrières. This signal announced that the king had just entered the territory of the department. At the same time, the sound of all the bells and the repeated volleys from an old Spanish cannon which belonged to the town testified to its joy at this great event. Half the population climbed onto the roofs. All the women were on the balconies. The Guard of Honour started to march. The brilliant uniforms were universally admired. Everybody recognised a relative or a friend. They made fun of the timidity of M. de Moirot, whose prudent hand was ready every single minute to catch hold of his saddle-bow. But one remark resulted in all the others being forgotten. The first cavalier in the ninth line was a very pretty, slim boy, who was not recognised at first. He soon created a general sensation, as some uttered a cry of indignation, and others were dumbfounded with astonishment. They recognised in this young man, who was sitting on one of the Norman horses of Monsieur Valeno, little Sorel, the carpenter's son. There was a unanimous outcry against the mayor, above all on the part of the Liberals. What, because this little labourer, who masqueraded as an abbe, was tutor to his brats, he had the audacity to nominate him guard of honour to the prejudice of rich manufacturers like so-and-so and so-and-so? Those 
gentleman,' said a banker's wife, "'ought to put that insolent gutter-boy in his proper place.' "'He is cunning and carries a sabre," answered her neighbour. "'He would be dastardly enough to slash them in the face.' The conversation of aristocratic society was more dangerous. The ladies began to ask each other if the mayor alone was responsible for this grave impropriety. Speaking generally, they did justice to his contempt for lack of birth. Julian was the happiest of men while he was the subject of so much conversation. Bold by nature, he sat a horse better than the majority of the young men of this mountain town. He saw that, in the eyes of the women, he was the topic of interest. His epaulets were more brilliant than those of the others because they were new. His horse pranced at every moment. He reached the zenith of joy. His happiness was unbounded when, as they passed by the old rampart, the noise of the little cannon made his horse prance outside the line. By a great piece of luck he did not fall. From that moment he felt himself a hero. He was one of Napoleon's officers of artillery and was charging a battery. One person was happier than he. She had first seen him pass from one of the folding windows in the Hôtel de Ville. Then, taking her carriage and rapidly making a long detour, she arrived in time to shudder when his horse took him outside the line. Finally, she put her carriage to the gallop, left by another gate of the town, succeeded in rejoining the route by which the king was to pass, and was able to follow the guard of honour at twenty paces' distance in the midst of a noble dust. Six thousand peasants cried, Long live the king, when the mayor had the honour to harangue his majesty. An hour afterwards, when all the speeches had been listened to and the king was going to enter the town, the little cannon began again to discharge its spasmodic volleys. But an accident ensued, the victim being not one of the cannoneers who had proved their mettle at Leipzig and at Montreuil, but the future deputy mayor, Monsieur de Moirot. His horse gently laid him in the one heap of mud on the high road, a somewhat scandalous circumstance, inasmuch as it was necessary to extricate him to allow the king to pass. His majesty alighted at the fine new church, which was decked out today with all its crimson curtains. The king was due to dine, and then afterwards to take his carriage again and go and pay his respects to the celebrated relic of Saint Clement. Scarcely was the king in the church than Julien galloped towards the house of Monsieur de Renal. Once there, he doffed with a sigh his fine sky-blue uniform, his sabre and his epaulets, to put on again his shabby little black suit. He mounted his horse again, and in a few moments was at bray le Haut, which was on the summit of a very pretty hill. Enthusiasm is responsible for these numbers of peasants, thought Julien. It was impossible to move a step at Verrières, and here there were more than ten thousand round this ancient abbey. Half ruined by the vandalism of the revolution, it had been magnificently restored since the restoration, and people were already beginning to talk of miracles. Julien rejoined the Abbe Chalin, who scolded him roundly and gave him a cassock and a surplice. He dressed quickly and followed M. Chalin, who was going to pay a call on the young Bishop of Agde. He was a nephew of M. de la Mole, who had been recently nominated, and had been charged with the duty of showing the relic to the king but the bishop was not to be found. The clergy began to get impatient. It was awaiting its chief in the sombre Gothic cloister of the ancient abbey. Twenty-four cures had been brought together so as to represent the ancient chapter of bray le Haut, which before 1789 consisted of twenty-four canons. The cure, having deplored the bishop's youth for three-quarters of an hour, thought it fitting for their senior to visit Monseigneur to appraise him that the king was on the point of arriving and that it was time to betake himself to the choir. The great age of Monsieur Chalin gave him the seniority. In spite of the bad temper which he was manifesting to Julien, he signed him to follow. Julien was wearing his surplice with distinction. By means of some trick or other of ecclesiastical dress, he had made his fine curling hair very flat, but by a forgetfulness which redoubled the anger of Monsieur Chalin, the spurs of the guard of honour could be seen below the long folds of his cassock. When they arrived at the bishop's apartment, the tall lackeys with their lace frills scarcely deigned to answer the old curé to the effect that Monseigneur was not receiving. They made fun of him when he tried to explain that in his capacity of senior member of the chapter of bray le Haut, he had the privilege of being admitted at any time to the officiating bishop. Julien's haughty temper was shocked by the lackey's insolence. 
He started to traverse the corridors of the ancient abbey and to shake all the doors which he found. A very small one yielded to his efforts and he found himself in a cell in the midst of Monseigneur's valets who were dressed in black suits with chains on their necks. His hurried manner made these gentlemen think that he had been sent by the bishop and they let him pass. He went some steps further on and found himself in an immense Gothic hall which was extremely dark and completely wainscoted in black oak. The ogive windows had all been walled in with brick except one. There was nothing to disguise the coarseness of this masonry which offered a melancholy contrast to the ancient magnificence of the woodwork. The two great sides of this hall, so celebrated among Burgundian antiquaries and built by the Duke Charles the Bold about 1470 in expiation of some sin, were adorned with richly sculptured wooden stalls. All the mysteries of the apocalypse were to be seen portrayed in wood of different colours. This melancholy magnificence, debased as it was by the sight of the bare bricks and the plaster, which was still quite white, affected Julien. He stopped in silence. He saw at the other extremity of the hall, near the one window which let in the daylight, a movable mahogany mirror. A young man in a violet robe and a lace surplice, but with his head bare, was standing still three paces from the glass. This piece of furniture seemed strange in a place like this, and had doubtless been only brought there on the previous day. Julien thought that the young man had the appearance of being irritated, He was solemnly giving benedictions with his right hand close to the mirror. What can this mean, he thought? Is this young priest performing some preliminary ceremony? Perhaps he is the bishop's secretary. He will be as insolent as the lackeys. Never mind, though. Let us try. He advanced and traversed somewhat slowly the length of the hall, with his gaze fixed all the time on the one window, and looking at the young man, who continued without any intermission, bestowing slowly an infinite number of blessings. The nearer he approached, the better he could distinguish his angry manner. The richness of the lace surplus stopped Julian in spite of himself some paces in front of the mirror. "'It is my duty to speak,' he said to himself at last." But the beauty of the hall had moved him, and he was already upset by the harsh words he anticipated. The young man saw him in the mirror, turned round, and suddenly discarding his angry manner, said to him in the gentlest tone, "'Well, monsieur, has it been arranged at last?' Julien was dumbfounded. As the young man began to turn towards him, Julien saw the pectoral cross on his breast. It was the Bishop of Argues. As young as that, thought Julien, at most six or eight years older than I am. He was ashamed of his spurs. Monseigneur, he said at last, I am sent by Monsieur Chalin, the senior of the chapter. Ah, he has been well recommended to me, said the bishop in a polished tone, which doubled Julien's delight. But I beg your pardon, monsieur, I mistook you for the person who was to bring me my mitre. It was badly packed at Paris. The silver cloth towards the top has been terribly spoiled. It will look awful, ended the young bishop sadly. And besides, I am being kept waiting. Monseigneur, I will go and fetch the mitre if your grace will let me. Julien's fine eyes did their work. Go, monsieur, answered the bishop with charming politeness. I need it immediately. I am grieved to keep the gentlemen of the chapter waiting. When Julien reached the centre of the hall, he turned round towards the bishop and saw that he had again commenced giving benedictions. "'What can it be?' Julien asked himself. "'No doubt it is a necessary ecclesiastical preliminary for the ceremony which is to take place.' When he reached the cell in which the valet were congregated, he saw the mitre in their hands. These gentlemen succumbed in spite of themselves to his imperious look and gave him Monseigneur's mitre. He felt proud to carry it. As he crossed the hall, he walked slowly. He held it with reverence. He found the bishop seated before the glass, but from time to time his right hand, although fatigued, still gave a blessing. Julien helped him to adjust his mitre. The bishop shook his head. "'Ah, it will keep on,' he said to Julien, with an air of satisfaction. "'Do you mind going a little way off?' Then the bishop went very quickly to the centre of the room, then approached the mirror again again resumed his angry manner and gravely began to give blessings. Julien was motionless with astonishment. He was tempted to understand, but did not dare. The bishop stopped, and suddenly abandoning his grave manner, looked at him and said, "'What do you think of my mitre, monsieur? Is it on right?' "'Quite right, monseigneur.' 
Is it not too far back? That would look a little silly, but I mustn't, on the other hand, wear it down over the eyes, like an officer's shaker. It seems to me to be on quite right. The king of blank is accustomed to a venerable clergy who are doubtless very solemn. I should not like to appear lacking in dignity, especially by reason of my youth. And the bishop started again to walk about and give benedictions. It is quite clear, said Julian, daring to understand at last. He is practising giving his benediction. I am ready, the bishop said after a few moments. Go, monsieur, and advise the senior and the gentleman of the chapter. Soon M. Chalin, followed by the two oldest cures, entered by a big, magnificently sculptured door which Julian had not previously noticed. But this time he remained in his place quite at the back and was only able to see the bishop over the shoulders of ecclesiastics who were pressing at the door in crowds. The bishop began slowly to traverse the hall. When he reached the threshold, the cures formed themselves into a procession. After a short moment of confusion, the procession began to march, intoning the psalm. The bishop, who was between Monsieur Chalin and a very old curé, was the last to advance. Julien, being in attendance on the Abbe Chalin, managed to get quite near Monseigneur. They followed the long corridors of the Abbe of bray le -Haut. In spite of the brilliant sun, they were dark and damp. They arrived finally at the portico of the cloister. Julian was dumbfounded with admiration for so fine a ceremony. His emotions were divided between thoughts of his own ambition, which had been reawakened by the bishop's youth, and thoughts of the latter's refinement and exquisite politeness. This politeness was quite different to that of Monsieur de Renal, even on his good days. The higher you lift yourself towards the first rank of society, said Julian to himself, the more charming manners you find. They entered the church by a side door. Suddenly an awful noise made the ancient walls echo. Julian thought they were going to crumble. It was the little piece of artillery again. It had been drawn at a gallop by eight horses and had just arrived. Immediately on its arrival it had been run out by the Leipzig cannoneers and fired five shots a minute as though the Prussians had been the target. But this admirable noise no longer produced any effect on Julien. He no longer thought of Napoleon and military glory. To be Bishop of Argues so young, he thought. But where is Argues? How much does it bring in? Two or three hundred thousand francs, perhaps. Monseigneur's lackeys appeared with a magnificent canopy. M. Chalin took one of the poles, but as a matter of fact it was Julien who carried it. The bishop took his place underneath. He had really succeeded in looking old, and our hero's admiration was now quite unbounded. What can't one accomplish with skill, he thought. The king entered. Julien had the good fortune to see him at close quarters. The bishop began to harangue him with unction, without forgetting a little nuance of very polite anxiety for his majesty. We will not repeat a description of the ceremony of bray le -Haut. They filled all the columns of the journals of the department for a fortnight on end. Julien learned from the bishops that the king was descended from Charles the Bold. At a later date, it was one of Julien's duties to check the accounts of the cost of this ceremony. M. de la Mole, who had succeeded in procuring a bishopric for his nephew, had wished to do him the favour of being himself responsible for all the expenses. The ceremony alone of bray le -Haut cost 3,800 francs. After the speech of the bishops and the answer of the king, His Majesty took up a position underneath the canopy and then knelt very devoutly on a cushion near the altar. The choir was surrounded by stalls, and the stalls were raised two steps from the pavement. It was at the bottom of these steps that Julien sat at the feet of Monsieur de Chalin, almost like a train-bearer sitting next to his cardinal in the Sixteen Chapel at Rome. There was a te deum, floods of incense, innumerable volleys of musketry and artillery. The peasants were drunk with happiness and piety. A day like this undoes the work of a hundred numbers of the Jacobin papers. Julien was six paces from the king, who was really praying with devotion. He noticed for the first time a little man with a witty expression who wore an almost plain suit, but he had a sky-blue ribbon over this very simple suit. He was nearer the king than many other lords whose clothes were embroidered with gold to such an extent that, to use Julien's expression, it was impossible to see the cloth. He learnt some minutes later that it was Monsieur de la Mole.
He thought he looked haughty and even insolent. I'm sure this Marquis is not so polite as my pretty bishop, he thought. Ah, the ecclesiastical calling makes men mild and good, but the king has come to venerate the relic, and I don't see a trace of the relic. Where has St. Clement got to? A little priest who sat next to him informed him that the venerable relic was at the top of the building in a chapelle à Dante. What is a chapelle à Dante? said Julien to himself but he was reluctant to ask the meaning of this word. He redoubled his attention. The etiquette on the occasion of a visit of a sovereign prince is that the canons do not accompany the bishop. But as he started on his march to the chapelle la Dante, my lord archbishop of Argues called the abbe Chalin. Julien dared to follow him. Having climbed up a long staircase, they reached an extremely small door whose gothic frame was magnificently gilded, this work looked as though it had been constructed the day before. Twenty-four young girls belonging to the most distinguished families in Verrières were assembled in front of the door. The bishop knelt down in the midst of these pretty maidens before he opened the door. While he was praying aloud, they seemed unable to exhaust their admiration for his fine lace, his gracious mien and his young and gentle face. This spectacle deprived our hero of his last remnants of reason. At this moment he would have fought for the Inquisition, and with a good conscience. The door suddenly opened. The little chapel was blazing with light. More than a thousand candles could be seen before the altar, divided into eight lines and separated from each other by a bouquet of flowers. The suave odour of the purest incense eddied out from the door of the sanctuary. The chapel, which had been newly gilded, was extremely small, but very high. Julian noticed that there were candles more than fifteen feet high upon the altar. The young girls could not restrain a cry of admiration. Only the twenty-four young girls, the two curés and Julian had been admitted into the little vestibule of the chapel. Soon the king arrived, followed by Monsieur de la Mole and his great chamberlain. The guards themselves remained outside, kneeling and presenting arms. His majesty precipitated rather than threw himself onto the stool, it was only then that Julien, who was keeping close to the gilded door, perceived over the bare arm of a young girl the charming statue of St. Clement. It was hidden under the altar, and bore the dress of a young Roman soldier. It had a large wound on its neck, from which the blood seemed to flow. The artist had surpassed himself. The eyes, which, though dying, were full of grace, were half-closed. A budding moustache adorned that charming mouth which, though half-closed, seemed notwithstanding to be praying. The young girl next to Julien wept warm tears at the sight. One of her tears fell on Julien's hand. After a moment of prayer in the profoundest silence that was only broken by the distant sound of the bells of all the villages within a radius of ten leagues, the Bishop of Argues asked the king's permission to speak. He finished a short but very touching speech with a passage, the very simplicity of which assured its effectiveness. Never forget, young Christian women, that you have seen one of the greatest kings of the world on his knees before the servants of this almighty and terrible God. These servants, feeble, persecuted, assassinated as they were on earth, as you can see by the still bleeding wounds of St. Clement, will triumph in heaven. You will remember them, my young Christian women, will you not, this day, forever, and will detest the infidel. You will be forever faithful to this God who is so great, so terrible, but so good. With these words, the bishop rose authoritatively. You promise me, he said, lifting his arm with an inspired air. We promise, said the young girls, melting into tears. I accept your promise in the name of the terrible God, added the bishop in a thunderous voice, and the ceremony was at an end. The king himself was crying. It was only a long time afterwards that Julian had sufficient self-possession to inquire where were the bones of the saint that had been sent from Rome to Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy. He was told that they were hidden in the charming waxen figure. His Majesty deigned to allow the young ladies who had accompanied him into the chapel to wear a red ribbon on which were embroidered these words, Hate of the Infidel, Perpetual Adoration. 
Monsieur de la Mole had ten thousand bottles of wine distributed among the peasants. In the evening at Verrieres, the Liberals made a point of having illuminations which were a hundred times better than those of the Royalists. Before leaving, the King paid a visit to Monsieur de Marot. End of section 18《セクション19 of the Red and the Black》by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 19 Thinking Produces Suffering. The grotesqueness of everyday events conceals the real unhappiness of the passions. Barnave. As he was replacing the usual furniture in the room which Monsieur de la Mole had occupied, Julien found a piece of very strong paper folded in four. He read at the bottom of the first page To His Excellency Monsieur le Marquis de la Mole, Peer of France, Chevalier of the Order of the King, etc., etc. It was a petition in the rough handwriting of a cook. Monsieur le Marquis, I have had religious principles all my life. I was in Lyon exposed to the bombs at the time of the siege in ninety three of execrable memory. I communicate. I go to Mass every Sunday in the parochial church. I have never missed the Paschal duty, even in ninety three of execrable memory. My cook used to keep servants before the revolution. My cook fasts on Fridays. I am universally respected in Verrieres, and I venture to say I deserve to be so. I walk under the canopy in the processions at the side of the cure and of the mayor. On great occasions I carry a big candle, bought at my own expense. I ask Monsieur the Marquis for the lottery appointment of Verrieres, which in one way or another is bound to be vacant shortly, as the beneficiary is very ill, and moreover votes on the wrong side at elections, etc. De Cholin. In the margin of this petition was a recommendation signed De Moiro, which began with this line I have had the honour, the worthy person who makes this request. So even that imbecile de Cholin shows me the way to go about things, said Julien to himself. Eight days after the passage of the King of Blank through Verrieres, the one question which predominated over the innumerable falsehoods, Foolish conjectures and ridiculous discussions, etc., etc., which had successively for their object the king, the Marquis de la Mole, the ten thousand bottles of wine, the fall of poor Dumarot, who, hoping to win a cross, only left his room a week after his fall, was the absolute indecency of having foisted Julien Sorel, a carpenter's son, into the guard of honour. You should have heard on this point the rich manufacturers of printed calico, the very persons who used to bawl themselves hoarse in preaching equality morning and evening in the cafe. That haughty woman, Madame de Renal, was, of course, responsible for this abomination. The reason? The fine eyes and fresh complexion of the little Abbe Sorel explained everything else. A short time after their return to Vergy, Stanislaus, the youngest of the children, caught the fever. Madame de Renal was suddenly attacked by an awful remorse. For the first time, she reproached herself for her love with some logic. She seemed to understand, as though by a miracle, the enormity of the sin into which she had let herself be swept. Up to that moment, although deeply religious, she had never thought of the greatness of her crime in the eyes of God. In former times, she had loved God passionately in the convent of the Sacred Heart. In the present circumstances, she feared him with equal intensity. The struggles which lacerated her soul were all the more awful in that her fear was quite irrational. Julien found that the least argument irritated instead of soothing her. She saw in the illness the language of hell. Moreover, Julien was himself very fond of the little Stanislaus. It soon assumed a serious character. Then incessant remorse deprived Madame de Renal of even her power of sleep. She ensconced herself in a gloomy silence. If she had opened her mouth, it would only have been to confess her crime to God and mankind. I urge you, said Julien to her as soon as they got alone, not to speak to anyone. Let me be the sole confidant of your sufferings. If you still love me, do not speak. Your words will not be able to take away our Stanislaus's fever. But his consolations produced no effect. 
He did not know that Madame de Renal had got it into her head that, in order to appease the wrath of a jealous god, it was necessary either to hate Julien or let her son die. It was because she felt she could not hate her lover that she was so unhappy. "'Fly from me,' she said one day to Julien. "'In the name of God, leave this house. It is your presence here which kills my son. God punishes me,' she added in a low voice. "'He is just. I admire his fairness.' "'My crime is awful, and I was living without remorse,' she exclaimed. "'That was the first sign of my desertion of God. "'I ought to be doubly punished.' "'Julien was profoundly touched. "'He could see in this neither hypocrisy nor exaggeration. "'She thinks that she is killing her son by loving me, "'and all the same the unhappy woman loves me more than her son. "'I cannot doubt it. "'It is remorse for that which is killing her. "'Those sentiments of hers have real greatness.' But how could I have inspired such a love, I who am so poor, so badly educated, so ignorant, and sometimes so coarse in my manners? One night the child was extremely ill. At about two o'clock in the morning, Monsieur de Renal came to see it. The child, consumed by fever and extremely flushed, could not recognize its father. Suddenly Madame de Renal threw herself at her husband's feet. Julien saw that she was going to confess everything and ruin herself for ever. Fortunately, this extraordinary proceeding annoyed M. de Renal. Adieu, adieu, he said, going away. No, listen to me, cried his wife on her knees before him, trying to hold him back. Hear the whole truth. It is I who am killing my son. I gave him life, and I am taking it back. Heaven is punishing me. In the eyes of God, I am guilty of murder. It is necessary that I should ruin and humiliate myself. Perhaps that sacrifice will appease the Lord. If M. de Renal had been a man of any imagination, he would then have realised everything. Romantic nonsense, he said, moving his wife away as she tried to embrace his knees. All that is romantic nonsense. Julien, go and fetch the doctor at daybreak. And he went back to bed. Madame de Renal fell on her knees, half fainting, repelling Julien's help with a hysterical gesture. Julien was astonished. So this is what adultery is, he said to himself. Is it possible that those scoundrels of priests should be right, that they who commit so many sins themselves should have the privilege of knowing the true theory of sin? How droll! For twenty minutes after Monsieur de Renal had gone back to bed, Julien saw the woman he loved with her head resting on her son's little bed, motionless and almost unconscious. There, he said to himself, is a woman of superior temperament, brought to the depths of unhappiness simply because she has known me. Time moves quickly. What can I do for her? I must make up my mind. I have not got simply myself to consider now. What do I care for men and their buffooneries? What can I do for her? Leave her? But I should be leaving her alone, and a prey to the most awful grief. That automaton of a husband is more harm to her than good. He is so coarse that he is bound to speak harshly to her. She may go mad and throw herself out of the window. If I leave her... If I cease to watch over her, she will confess everything, and who knows, in spite of the legacy which she is bound to bring him, he will create a scandal. She may confess everything. Great God, so that scoundrel of an abbe who makes the illness of a child of six an excuse for not budging from this house, and not without a purpose either. In her grief and her fear of God, she forgets all she knows of the man. She only sees the priest." "'Go away,' said Madame de Renal suddenly to him, opening her eyes. "'I would give my life a thousand times to know what could be of most use to you,' answered Julien. "'I have never loved you so much, my dear angel, "'or rather it is only from this last moment that I begin to adore you as you deserve to be adored. "'What would become of me far from you, and with the consciousness that you are unhappy, owing to what I have done?' But don't let my suffering come into the matter. I will go, yes, my love. But if I leave you, dear, if I cease to watch over you, to be incessantly between you and your husband, you will tell him everything. You will ruin yourself. Remember that he will hound you out of his house in disgrace. Besançon will talk of the scandal. You will be said to be absolutely in the wrong. You will never lift up your head again after that shame. "'That's what I ask,' she cried, standing up. "'I shall suffer. So much the better. "'But you will also make him unhappy through that awful scandal. 
but I shall be humiliating myself, throwing myself into the mire, and by those means perhaps I shall save my son. Such a humiliation in the eyes of all is perhaps to be regarded as a public penitence. So far as my weak judgment goes, is it not the greatest sacrifice that I can make to God? Perhaps he will deign to accept my humiliation and to leave me my son. Show me another sacrifice which is more painful, and I will rush to it. Let me punish myself. I too am guilty. Do you wish me to retire to the Trappist monastery? The austerity of that life may appease your God. Oh, heaven, why cannot I take Stanislas's illness upon myself? Ah, you do love him, then, said Madame de Renal, getting up and throwing herself in his arms. At the same time she repelled him with horror. I believe you, I believe you. Oh, my one friend, she cried, falling on her knees again. Why are you not the father of Stanislas? In that case it would not be a terrible sin to love you more than your son. Won't you allow me to stay and love you henceforth like a brother? It is the only rational atonement. It may appease the wrath of the Most High. Am I? she cried, getting up and taking Julien's head between her two hands and holding it some distance from her. Am I to love you as if you were a brother? Is it in my power to love you like that? Julien melted into tears. I will obey you, he said, falling at her feet. I will obey you in whatever you order me. That is all there is left for me to do. My mind is struck with blindness. I do not see any course to take. If I leave you, you will tell your husband everything. You will ruin yourself and him as well. He will never be nominated deputy after incurring such ridicule. If I stay, you will think I am the cause of your son's death, and you will die of grief. Do you wish to try the effect of my departure? If you wish, I will punish myself for our sin by leaving you for eight days. I will pass them in any retreat you like, in the Abbey of bray le for instance. But swear that you will say nothing to your husband during my absence. Remember that if you speak, I shall never be able to come back. She promised, and he left, but was called back at the end of two days. It is impossible for me to keep my oath without you. I shall speak to my husband if you are not constantly there to enjoin me to silence by your looks. Every hour of this abominable life seems to last a day. Finally, heaven had pity on this unfortunate mother. Little by little, Stanislaus got out of danger. But the ice was broken. Her reason had realised the extent of her sin. She could not recover her equilibrium again. Her pangs of remorse remained, and were what they ought to have been in so sincere a heart. Her life was heaven and hell, hell when she did not see Julien, heaven when she was at his feet. I do not deceive myself any more, she would say to him, even during the moments when she dared to surrender herself to his full love. I am damned, irrevocably damned. You are young, heaven may forgive you, but I, I am damned. I know it by a certain sign. I am afraid. Who would not be afraid at the sight of hell? But at the bottom of my heart I do not repent at all. I would commit my sin over again if I had the opportunity. If heaven will only forbear to punish me in this world and through my children, I shall have more than I deserve. But you, at any rate, my Julien, she would cry at other moments, are you happy? Do you think I love you enough? The suspiciousness and morbid pride of Julien, who needed above all a self-sacrificing love, altogether vanished when he saw at every hour of the day so great and indisputable a sacrifice. He adored Madame de Renal. It makes no difference her being noble and my being a labourer's son. She loves me. She does not regard me as a valet charged with the functions of a lover. That fear, once dismissed, Julien fell into all the madness of love, into all its deadly uncertainties. At any rate, she would cry, seeing his doubts of her love, let me feel quite happy during the three days we still have together. Let us make haste. Perhaps tomorrow will be too late. If heaven strikes me through my children, it will be in vain that I shall try only to live to love you and to be blind to the fact that it is my crime which has killed them. I could not survive that blow. Even if I wished I could not, I should go mad. Ah, if I could only take your sin on myself, as you so generously offered to take Stanislas's burning fever. 
This great moral crisis changed the character of the sentiment which united Julien and his mistress. His love was no longer simply admiration for her beauty and the pride of possessing her. Henceforth their happiness was of a quite superior character. The flame which consumed them was more intense. They had transports filled with madness. Judged by the worldly standard, their happiness would have appeared intensified, but they no longer found that delicious serenity, that cloudless happiness, that facile joy of the first period of their love, when Madame de Renal's only fear was that Julien did not love her enough. Their happiness had at times the complexion of crime. In their happiest and apparently most tranquil moments, Madame de Renal would suddenly cry out, "'Oh, great God, I see hell!' as she pressed Julian's hand with a convulsive grasp. What horrible tortures! I have well deserved them. She grasped him and hung on to him like ivy on to a wall. Julian would try in vain to calm that agitated soul. She would take his hand, cover it with kisses. Then, relapsing into a gloomy reverie, she would say, Hell itself would be a blessing for me. I should still have some days to pass with him on this earth, but hell on earth, the death of my children. Still, perhaps my crime will be forgiven me at that price. Oh, great God, do not grant me my pardon at so great a price. These poor children have in no way transgressed against you. I, I am the only culprit. I love a man who is not my husband. Julian subsequently saw Madame de Renal attain what were apparently moments of tranquillity. She was endeavouring to control herself. She did not wish to poison the life of the man she loved. They found the days pass with the rapidity of lightning amid these alternating moods of love, remorse and voluptuousness. Julian lost the habit of reflecting. Mademoiselle Elisa went to attend to a little lawsuit which she had at Verrieres. She found Valenot very piqued against Julian. She hated the tutor and would often speak about him. "'You will ruin me, monsieur, if I tell the truth,' she said one day to Valenot. "'All masters have an understanding amongst themselves with regard to matters of importance. There are certain disclosures which poor servants are never forgiven.' After these stereotyped phrases, which his curiosity managed to cut short, Monsieur Valenot received some information extremely mortifying to his self-conceit. This woman, who was the most distinguished in the district, the woman on whom he had lavished so much attention in the last six years and made no secret of it, more was the pity. This woman, who was so proud, whose disdain had put him to the blush times without number, had just taken for her lover a little workman masquerading as a tutor. And to fill the cup of his jealousy, Madame de Renal adored that lover. And, added the housemaid with a sigh, Julien did not put himself out at all to make his conquest. His manner was as cold as ever, even with Madame. Elisa had only become certain in the country, but she believed that this intrigue dated from much further back. That is no doubt the reason, she added spitefully, why he refused to marry me. And to think what a fool I was when I went to consult Madame de Renal and begged her to speak to the tutor. The very same evening, M. de Renal received from the town, together with his papers, a long anonymous letter which apprised him in the greatest detail of what was taking place in his house. Julien saw him pale as he read this letter written on blue paper, and looked at him with a malicious expression. During all that evening the mayor failed to throw off his trouble. It was in vain that Julien paid him court by asking for explanations about the genealogy of the best families in Burgundy. End of section 19《セクション twenty of the Red and the Black》by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter twenty, anonymous letters. Do not give dalliance too much the rein. The strongest oaths are straw to the fire in the blood. Tempest. As they left the drawing room about midnight, Julien had time to say to his love. Don't let us see each other tonight. Your husband has suspicions. I would swear that big letter he read with a sigh was an anonymous letter. Fortunately, Julien locked himself into his room. 
Madame de Renal had the mad idea that this warning was only a pretext for not seeing her. She absolutely lost her head and came to his door at the accustomed hour. Julien, who had heard the noise in the corridor, immediately blew out his lamp. Someone was trying to open the door. Was it Madame de Renal? Was it a jealous husband? Very early next morning, the cook, who liked Julien, brought him a book, on the cover of which he read these words, written in Italian. Guardate alla pagina 130. Julien shuddered at the imprudence, looked for page 130, and found pinned to it the following letter hastily written, bathed with tears and full of spelling mistakes. Madame de Renal was usually very correct. He was touched by this circumstance, and somewhat forgot the awfulness of the indiscretion. So, did you not want to receive me tonight? There are moments when I think that I have never read down to the depths of your soul. Your looks frighten me. I am afraid of you. Great God, perhaps you have never loved me. In that case, let my husband discover my love, and shut me up in a prison in the country, far away from my children. Perhaps God wills it so. I shall die soon, but you will have proved yourself a monster. Do you not love me? Are you tired of my fits of folly and of remorse, you wicked man? Do you wish to ruin me? I will show you an easy way. Go and show this letter to all Verrieres, or rather show it to Monsieur Valeno. Tell him that I love you. Nay, do not utter such a blasphemy. Tell him I adore you, that it was only on the day I saw you that my life commenced, that even in the maddest moments of my youth I never even dreamt of the happiness that I owe to you, that I have sacrificed my life to you, and that I am sacrificing my soul. You know that I am sacrificing much more. But does that man know the meaning of sacrifice? Tell him, I say, simply to irritate him, that I would defy all evil tongues, that the only misfortune for me in the whole world would be to witness any change in the only man who holds me to life. What a happiness it would be to me to lose my life, to offer it up as a sacrifice, and to have no longer any fear for my children. Have no doubt about it, dear one. If it is an anonymous letter, it comes from that odious being who has persecuted me for the last six years with his loud voice, his stories about his jumps on horseback, his fatuity, and the never-ending catalogue of all his advantages. Is there an anonymous letter? I should like to discuss that question with you, you wicked man, but no, you acted rightly clasping you in my arms perhaps for the last time, I should never have been able to argue as coldly as I do now, now that I am alone. From this moment our happiness will no longer be so easy. Will that be a vexation for you? Yes, on those days when you haven't received some amusing book from Monsieur Fouquet, the sacrifice is made tomorrow, whether there is or whether there is not any anonymous letter. I myself will tell my husband I have received an anonymous letter, and that it is necessary to give you a golden bridge at once, find some honourable excuse, and send you back to your parents without delay. Alas, dear one, we are going to be separated for a fortnight, perhaps a month. Go, I will do you justice. You will suffer as much as I, but anyway... This is the only means of disposing of this anonymous letter. It is not the first that my husband has received, and on my score too. Alas, how I used to laugh over them. My one aim is to make my husband think that the letter comes from Monsieur Valenot. I have no doubt that he is its author. If you leave the house, make a point of establishing yourself at Verrieres. I will manage that my husband should think of passing a fortnight there in order to prove to the fools there was no coldness between him and me. Once at Verrieres, establish ties of friendship with everyone, even with the liberals. I am sure that all their ladies will seek you out. Do not quarrel with Monsieur Valenot, or cut off his ears as you said you would one day. Try, on the contrary, to ingratiate yourself with him. The essential point is that it should be notorious in Verrieres that you are going to enter the household either of Valenot or of someone else to take charge of the children's education. That is what my husband will never put up with. If he does feel bound to resign himself to it, well, at any rate, you will be living in Verrieres, and I shall be seeing you sometimes. My children, who love you so much, will go and see you. Great God, I feel that I love my children all the more because they love you. How is all this going to end? I am wandering. Anyway, you understand your line of conduct. Be nice, polite, but not in any way disdainful to those coarse persons. I ask you on my knees. 
They will be the arbiters of our fate. Do not fear for a moment, but that, so far as you are concerned, my husband will conform to what public opinion lays down for him. It is you who will supply me with the anonymous letter. Equip yourself with patience and a pair of scissors. Cut out from a book the words which you will see, then stick them with the mouth glue onto the leaf of loose paper which I am sending you. It comes to me from Monsieur Valeno. Be on your guard against a search in your room. Burn the pages of the book which you are going to mutilate. If you do not find the words ready-made, have the patience to form them letter by letter. I have made the anonymous letter too short. Anonymous letter. Madame, all your little goings-on are known, but the persons interested in stopping have been warned. I have still sufficient friendship left for you to urge you to cease all relations with the little peasant. If you are sensible enough to do this, your husband will believe that the notification he has received is misleading and he will be left in his illusion. Remember that I have your secret. Tremble, unhappy woman. You must now walk straight before me. As soon as you have finished gluing together the words that make up this letter, have you recognised the director's special style of speech? Leave the house. I will meet you. I will go into the village and come back with a troubled face. As a matter of fact, I shall be very much troubled. Great God, what a risk I run, and all because you thought you guessed an anonymous letter. Finally, looking very much upset, I shall give this letter to my husband and say that an unknown man handed it to me. As for you... Go for a walk with the children, on the road to the great woods, and do not come back before dinner time. You will be able to see the tower of the dovecote from the top of the rocks. If things go well for us, I will place a white handkerchief there. In case of the contrary, there will be nothing at all. Ungrateful man, will not your heart find out some means of telling me that you love me before you leave for that walk? Whatever happens, be certain of one thing. I shall never survive our final separation by a single day. Oh, you bad mother. But what is the use of my writing those two words, dear Julien? I do not feel them. At this moment I can only think of you. I have only written them so as not to be blamed by you. But what is the good of deception now that I find myself face to face with losing you? Yes, let my soul seem monstrous to you. But do not let me lie to the man whom I adore. I have already deceived only too much in this life of mine. Go. I forgive you if you love me no more. I have not the time to read over my letter. It is a small thing in my eyes to pay for the happy days that I have just passed in your arms with the price of my life. You know that they will cost me more. End of section 20「チャプター21ダーイオグ・ウィッド・マスター」Alas, our frailty is the cause, not we, for such as we are made of, such we be. Twelfth Night It was with a childish pleasure that for a whole hour Julien put the words together. As he came out of his room, he met his pupils with their mother. She took the letter with a simplicity and a courage whose calmness terrified him. Is the mouth glue dry enough yet? she asked him. And is this the woman who was so maddened by remorse? he thought. What are her plans at this moment? He was too proud to ask her, but she had never perhaps pleased him more. If this turns out badly, she added with the same coolness, I shall be deprived of everything. Take charge of this, and bury it in some place of the mountain. It will perhaps one day be my only resource. She gave him a glass case in red Morocco, filled with gold and some diamonds. Now go, she said to him. She kissed the children, embracing the youngest twice. Julien remained motionless. She left him at a rapid pace without looking at him. From the moment that Monsieur de Renal had opened the anonymous letter, his life had been awful. He had not been so agitated since a duel which he had just missed having in 1816, and to do him justice, the prospect of receiving a bullet would have made him less unhappy. He scrutinised the letter from every standpoint. Is that not a woman's handwriting, he said to himself? In that case, what woman had written it? He reviewed all those whom he knew at Verrier without being able to fix his suspicions on anyone. Could a man have dictated that letter? Who was that man? 
equal uncertainty on this point. The majority of his acquaintances were jealous of him and no doubt hated him. I must consult my wife, he said to himself through habit as he got up from the armchair in which he had collapsed. Great God, he said aloud before he got up, striking his head. It is she, above all, of whom I must be distrustful. At the present moment she is my enemy. And tears came into his eyes through sheer anger. By a poetic justice for that hardness of heart which constitutes the provincial idea of shrewdness, the two men whom M. de Renal feared the most at the present moment were his two most intimate friends. I have ten friends, perhaps, after those and he passed them in review, gauging the degree of consolation which he could get from each one. "'All of them, all of them,' he exclaimed in a rage, "'will derive the most supreme pleasure from my awful experience.' As luck would have it, he thought himself envied, and not without reason. Apart from his town mansion, in which the King of Blank had recently spent the night, and thus conferred on it an enduring honour, he had decorated his chateau at Vergy extremely well. The façade was painted white and the windows adorned with fine green shutters. He was consoled for a moment by the thought of this magnificence. The fact was that this chateau was seen from three or four leagues off to the great prejudice of all the country houses or so-called chateau of the neighbourhood which had been left in the humble grey colour given them by time. There was one of his friends on whose pity and whose tears M. de Renal could count, the churchwarden of the parish, but he was an idiot who cried at everything. This man, however, was his only resource. "'What unhappiness is comparable to mine!' he exclaimed with rage. "'What isolation!' "'Is it possible,' said this truly pitiable man to himself, "'is it possible that I have no friend in my misfortune of whom I can ask advice? "'For my mind is wandering. I feel it. "'Oh, Falco! Oh, Ducro!' he exclaimed with bitterness. Those were the names of two friends of his childhood whom he had dropped owing to his snobbery in 1814. They were not noble, and he had wished to change the footing of equality on which they had been living with him since their childhood. One of them, Falco, a paper merchant of Verrier, was a man of intellect and spirit, had bought a printing press in the chief town of the department and undertaken the production of a journal. The priestly congregation had resolved to ruin him, his journal had been condemned, and he had been deprived of his printer's diploma. In these sad circumstances, he ventured to write to Monsieur de Renal for the first time in ten years. The mayor of Verrieres thought it his duty to answer in the old Roman style. If the king's minister were to do me the honour of consulting me, I should say to him, ruin ruthlessly all the provincial printers and make printing a monopoly like tobacco. M. de Renal was horrified to remember the terms of this letter to an intimate friend, whom all Verrieres had once admired. Who would have said that I, with my rank, my fortune, my decorations, would ever come to regret it? It was in these transports of rage, directed now against himself, now against all his surroundings, that he passed an awful night, but fortunately it never occurred to him to spy on his wife. "'I am accustomed to Louise,' he said to himself." She knows all my affairs. If I were free to marry tomorrow, I should not find any one to take her place. Then he began to plume himself on the idea that his wife was innocent. This point of view did not require any manifestation of character and suited him much better. How many calumniated women has one not seen? But, he suddenly exclaimed as he walked about feverishly, Shall I put up with her making a fool of me with her lover, as though I were a man of no account, some mere ragamuffin? Is all very air to make merry over my complaisance? What have they not said about Shamir? He was a husband in the district who was notoriously deceived. Was there not a smile on every lip at the mention of his name? He is a good advocate, but whoever said anything about his talent for speaking? Oh, Shamir, they say, Bernard Shamir. He is thus designated by the name of the man who disgraces him. I have no daughter, thank heaven, M. de Renal would say at other times, and the way in which I am going to punish the mother will consequently not be so harmful to my children's household. I could surprise this little peasant with my wife and kill them both. In that case, the tragedy of the situation would perhaps do away with the grotesque element. This idea appealed to him. He followed it up in all its details. The penal code is on my side, and whatever happens, our congregation and my friends on the jury will save me. 
He examined his hunting knife, which was quite sharp, but the idea of blood frightened him. I could thrash this insolent tutor within an inch of his life and hound him out of the house, but what a sensation that would make in very air and even over the whole department. After Falco's journal had been condemned and when its chief editor left prison, I had a hand in making him lose his place of six hundred francs a year. They say that this scribbler has dared to show himself again in Bessinson. He may lampoon me adroitly and in such a way that it will be impossible to bring him up before the courts. Bring him up before the courts, the insolent wretch will insinuate in a thousand and one ways that he has spoken the truth. A well-born man who keeps his place like I do is hated by all the plebeians. I shall see my name in all those awful Paris papers. Oh, my God, what depths! To see the ancient name of Renal plunged in the mire of ridicule. If I ever travel, I shall have to change my name. What? Abandon that name, which is my glory and my strength? Could anything be worse than that? If I do not kill my wife, but turn her out in disgrace, she has her aunt in Besançon, who is going to hand all her fortune over to her. My wife will go and live in Paris with Julien. It will be known at Verrières, and I shall be taken for a dupe. The unhappy man then noticed from the paleness of the lamplight that the dawn was beginning to appear. He went to get a little fresh air in the garden. At this moment he had almost determined to make no scandal, particularly in view of the fact that a scandal would overwhelm with joy all his good friends in Verrières. The promenade in the garden calmed him a little. No, he exclaimed. I shall not deprive myself of my wife. She is too useful to me. He imagined with horror what his house would be without his wife. The only relative he had was the Marquise of R, old, stupid and malicious. A very sensible idea occurred to him, but its execution required a strength of character considerably superior to the small amount of character which the poor man possessed. If I keep my wife, he said to himself, I know what I shall do one day. On some occasion, when she makes me lose patience, I shall reproach her with her guilt. She is proud, we shall quarrel, and all this will happen before she has inherited her aunt's fortune, and how they will all make fun of me then. My wife loves her children. The result will be that everything will go to them, but as for me, I shall be the laughing stock of Verrier. What, I will say, he could not even manage to revenge himself on his wife. Would it not be better to leave it and verify nothing? In that case, I tie my hands and cannot afterwards reproach her with anything. An instant afterwards, Monsieur de Renal, once more a prey to wounded vanity, set himself laboriously to recollect all the methods of procedure mentioned in the billiard room of the casino or the nobles' club in Verrières, when some fine talker interrupted the pool to divert himself at the expense of some deceived husband. How cruel these pleasantries appeared to him at the present moment. My God! Why is my wife not dead? Then I should be impregnable against ridicule. Why am I not a widower? I should go and pass six months in Paris in the best society. After this moment of happiness, occasioned by the idea of widowerhood, his imagination reverted to the means of assuring himself of the truth. Should he put a slight layer of bran before the door of Julien's room at midnight, after everyone had gone to bed? He would see the impression of the feet in the following morning. But that's no good, he suddenly exclaimed with rage. That inquisitive Elisa will notice it, and they will soon know all over the house that I am jealous. In another casino tale, a husband had assured himself of his misfortune by tying a hair with a little wax so that it shut the door of the gallant as effectually as a seal. After so many hours of uncertainty, this means of clearing up his fate seemed to him emphatically the best, and he was thinking of availing himself of it when, in one of the turnings of the avenue, he met the very woman whom he would like to have seen dead. She was coming back from the village. She had gone to hear Mass in the Church of Vergy, a tradition, extremely doubtful in the eyes of the cold philosopher, but in which she believed, alleges that the little church was once the chapel of the Chateau of the Lord of Vergy. This idea obsessed Madame de Renal all the time in the church that she had counted on spending in prayer. She kept on imagining to herself the spectacle of her husband killing Julien without hunting as though by accident, and then making her eat his heart in the evening. My fate, she said to herself, depends on what he will think when he listens to me. It may be I shall never get another opportunity of speaking to him after this fatal quarter of an hour. He is not a reasonable person who is governed by his intellect. 
In that case, with the help of my weak intelligence, I could anticipate what he will do or say. He will decide our common fate. He has the power. But this fate depends on my adroitness, on my skill in directing the ideas of this crank who is blinded by his rage and unable to see half of what takes place. Great God, I need talent and coolness. Where shall I get it? She regained her calmness as though by magic, and she entered the garden and saw her husband in the distance. His dishevelled hair and disordered dress showed that he had not slept. She gave him a letter with a broken seal, but folded. As for him, without opening it, he gazed at his wife with the eyes of a madman. "'Here's an abominable thing,' she said to him, "'which an evil-looking man who makes out that he knows you "'and is under an obligation to you handed to me "'as I was passing behind the notary's garden. "'I insist on one thing, and that is that you send back this Monsieur Julien "'to his parents, and without delay.' Madame de Renal hastened to say these words, perhaps a little before the psychological moment, in order to free herself from the awful prospect of having to say them. She was seized with joy on seeing that which she was occasioning to her husband. She realised from the fixed stare which he was riveting on her that Julien had surmised rightly. What a genius he is to be so brilliantly diplomatic, instead of succumbing to so real a misfortune, she thought. He will go very far in the future. Alas, his successors will only make him forget me. This little act of admiration for the man whom she adored quite cured her of her trouble. She congratulated herself on her tactics. I have not been worthy of Julien, she said to herself with a sweet and secret pleasure. Monsieur de Renal kept examining the second anonymous letter, which the reader may remember was composed of printed words glued onto a paper verging on blue. He did not say a word for fear of giving himself away. "'They still make fun of me in every possible way,' said Monsieur de Renal to himself, overwhelmed with exhaustion. "'Still more new insults to examine, and all the time on account of my wife.' He was on the point of heaping on her the coarsest insults. He was barely checked by the prospect of the Bessinson legacy. Consumed by the need of venting his feeling on something, he crumpled up the paper of the second anonymous letter and began to walk about with huge strides. He needed to get away from his wife. A few moments afterwards he came back to her in a quieter frame of mind. "'The thing is to take some definite line and send Julien away,' she said immediately. "'After all, it is only a labourer's son. You will compensate him by a few crowns.' And besides, he is clever and will easily manage to find a place with Monsieur Valeno, for example, or with the sub-prefect de Montgiron, who both have children. In that way, you will not be doing him any wrong. There you go, talking like the fool that you are, exclaimed Monsieur de Renal in a terrible voice. How can one hope that a woman will show any good sense? You never bother yourself about common sense. How can you ever get to know anything? Your indifference and your idleness give you no energy except for hunting those miserable butterflies which we are unfortunate to have in our house. Madame de Renal let him speak, and he spoke for a long time. He was working off his anger, to use the local expression. Monsieur, she answered him at last, I speak as a woman who has been outraged in her honour, that is to say, in what she holds most precious. Madame de Renal preserved an unalterable sang-froid during all this painful conversation on the result of which depended the possibility of still living under the same roof as Julian. She sought for the ideas which she thought most adapted to guide her husband's blind anger into a safe channel. She had been insensible to all the insulting imputations which he had addressed to her. She was not listening to them. She was then thinking about Julian. Will he be pleased with me? This little peasant whom we have loaded with attentions, and even with presents, may be innocent, she said to him at last, but he is none the less the occasion of the first affront that I have ever received. Monsieur, when I read this abominable paper, I vowed to myself that either he or I should leave your house. Do you want to make a scandal so as to dishonour me and yourself as well? You will make things hum in very air, I can assure you. It is true the degree of prosperity in which your prudent management has succeeded in placing you, yourself, your family and the town as the subject of general envy. Well, I will urge Julien to ask you for a holiday to go and spend the month with that wood merchant of the mountains, a fit friend to be sure for this little labourer. Mind you do nothing at all, resumed Monsieur de Renal, with a fair amount of tranquillity. 
I particularly insist on your not speaking to him. You will put him into a temper and make him quarrel with me. You know to what extent this little gentleman is always spoiling for a quarrel. That young man has no tact, resumed Madame de Renaud. He may be learned, you know all about that, but at bottom he is only a peasant. For my own part, I never thought much of him since he refused to marry Elisa. It was an assured fortune, and that on the pretext that sometimes she had made secret visits to Monsieur Valenot. Ah, said Monsieur de Renal, lifting up his eyebrows inordinately. What, did Julian tell you that? Not exactly. He always talked of the vocation which calls him to the holy ministry, but believe me, the first vocation for those lower-class people is getting their bread and butter. He gave me to understand that he was quite aware of her secret visits. And I, I was ignorant, exclaimed Monsieur de Renal, growing as angry as before and accentuating his words. Things take place in my house which I know nothing about. What, has there been anything between Elisa and Valenot? Oh, that's old history, my dear, said Madame de Renal with a smile, and perhaps no harm has come of it. It was at the time when your good friend Valenot would not have minded their thinking at very air that a perfectly platonic little affection was growing up between him and me. I had that idea once myself, exclaimed Monsieur de Renal, furiously striking his head as he progressed from discovery to discovery. And you told me nothing about it. Should one set two friends by the ears on account of a little fit of vanity on the part of our dear director? What society woman has not had addressed to her a few letters which were both extremely witty and even a little gallant? He has written to you. He writes a great deal. Show me those letters at once. I order you. And M. de Renal pulled himself up to his six feet. I will do nothing of the kind, he was answered with a sweetness verging on indifference. I will show you them one day when you are in a better frame of mind. This very instant, odds life, exclaimed M. de Renal, transported with rage and yet happier than he had been for twelve hours. Will you swear to me, said Madame de Renal quite gravely, never to quarrel with the director of the workhouse about these letters? Quarrel or no quarrel, I can take these foundlings away from him. But, he continued furiously, I want those letters at once. Where are they? In a drawer in my secretary, but I shall certainly not give you the key. I'll manage to break it, he cried, running towards his wife's room. He did break, in fact, with a bar of iron, a costly secretary of veined mahogany which came from Paris, and which he had often been accustomed to wipe with the nap of his coat when he had thought he had detected a spot. Madame de Renal had climbed up at a run the hundred and twenty steps of the dovecote. She tied the corner of a white handkerchief to one of the bars of iron of the little window. She was the happiest of women. With tears in her eyes she looked towards the great mountain forest. Doubtless, she said to herself, Julien is watching for this happy signal. She listened attentively for a long time, and then she cursed the monotonous noise of the grasshopper and the song of the birds. Had it not been for that importunate noise, a cry of joy starting from the big rocks could have arrived here. The greedy eye devoured that immense slope of dark verdure, which was as level as a meadow. Why isn't he clever enough, she said to herself, quite overcome, to invent some signal to tell me that his happiness is equal to mine? She only came down from the dovecote when she was frightened of her husband's coming there to look for her. She found him furious. He was perusing the soothing phrases of Monsieur de Valenot and reading them with an emotion to which they were but little used. "'I always come back to the same idea,' said Madame de Renal, seizing a moment when a pause in her husband's ejaculations gave her the possibility of getting heard. "'It is necessary for Julien to travel. Whatever talents he may have for Latin, he is only a peasant after all, often coarse and lacking in tact.' Thinking to be polite, he addresses inflated compliments to me every day, which are in bad taste. He learns them by heart out of some novel or other. He never reads one, exclaimed Monsieur de Renal. I am assured of it. Do you think that I am the master of a house who is so blind as to be ignorant of what takes place in his own home? Well, if he doesn't read those droll compliments anywhere, he invents them, and that's all the worse so far as he is concerned. He must have talked about me in this tone in very air, and perhaps without going so far, said Madame de Renal, with the idea of making a discovery. He may have talked in the same strain to Elisa, which is almost the same as if he had said it to Monsieur Valenot. 
Ah, exclaimed Monsieur de Renal, shaking the table in the room with one of the most violent raps ever made by a human fist. The anonymous printed letter and Valenod's letters are written on the same paper. At last, thought Madame de Renal. She pretended to be overwhelmed at this discovery, and without having the courage to add a single word, went and sat down some way off on the divan at the bottom of the drawing room. From this point the battle was won. She had a great deal of trouble in preventing Monsieur de Renal from going to speak to the supposed author of the anonymous letter. What, can't you see that making a scene with Monsieur Valenot without sufficient proof would be the most signal mistake? You are envied, Monsieur, and who is responsible? Your talents, your wise management, your tasteful buildings, the dowry which I have brought you, and above all the substantial legacy which we are entitled to hope for from my good aunt, a legacy the importance of which is inordinately exaggerated, have made you into the first person in Verrières. You are forgetting my birth, said Monsieur de Renal, smiling a little. You are one of the most distinguished gentlemen in the province, replied Madame de Renal emphatically. If the king were free and could give birth its proper due, you would no doubt figure in the chamber of peers, etc. And being in this magnificent position, you yet wish to give the envious a fact to take hold of. To speak about this anonymous letter to M. Valenot is equivalent to proclaiming over the whole of Verrières, nay, over the whole of Bessinson, over the whole province, that this little bourgeois, who has been admitted perhaps imprudently to intimacy with the Renal, has managed to offend him. At the time when those letters which you have just taken prove that I have reciprocated M. Valenot's love, you ought to kill me. I should have deserved it a hundred times over, but not to show him your anger. Remember that all our neighbours are only waiting for an excuse to revenge themselves for your superiority. Remember that in 1816 you had a hand in certain arrests. I think that you show neither consideration nor love for me, exclaimed M. de Renal, with all the bitterness evoked by such a memory, and I was not made a peer. I am thinking, my dear, resumed Madame de Renal with a smile, that I should be richer than you are that I have been your companion for twelve years, and that by virtue of those qualifications I am entitled to have a voice in the council, and above all in today's business. If you prefer Monsieur Julien to me, she added with a touch of temper which was but thinly disguised, I am ready to go and pass a winter with my aunt. These words proved a lucky shot. They possessed a firmness which endeavoured to clothe itself with courtesy. It decided Monsieur de Renal but following the provincial custom, he still thought for a long time, and went again over all his arguments. His wife let him speak. There was still a touch of anger in his intonation. Finally, two hours of futile rant exhausted the strength of a man who had been subject during the whole night to a continuous fit of anger. He determined on the line of conduct he was going to follow with regards to Monsieur Valenot, Julien, and even Elisa. Madame de Renal was on the point, once or twice during this great scene, of feeling some sympathy for the very real unhappiness of the man who had been so dear to her for twelve years. But true passions are selfish. Besides, she was expecting him every instant to mention the anonymous letter which he had received the day before, and he did not mention it. In order to feel quite safe, Madame de Renal wanted to know the idea which the letter had succeeded in suggesting to the man on whom her fate depended, for, in the provinces, the husbands are the masters of public opinion. A husband who complains covers himself with ridicule, an inconvenience which becomes no less dangerous in France with each succeeding year. But if he refuses to provide his wife with money, she falls to the status of a labouring woman at fifteen sous a day, while the virtuous souls have scruples about employing her. An odalisque in the seraglio can love the sultan with all her might, he is all-powerful, and she has no hope of stealing his authority by a series of little subtleties. The master's vengeance is terrible and bloody, but martial and generous. A dagger-thrust finishes everything. But it is by stabbing her with public contempt that a nineteenth-century husband kills his wife. It is by shutting against her the doors of all the drawing-rooms. When Madame de Renal returned to her room, her feeling of danger was vividly awakened. She was shocked by the disorder in which she found it. The locks of all the pretty little boxes had been broken. Many planks in the floor had been lifted up. He would have no pity on me, she said to herself. 
to think of his spoiling, like this, this coloured wood floor which he likes so much. He gets red with rage whenever one of his children comes into it with wet shoes, and now it is spoilt for ever. The spectacle of this violence immediately banished the last scruples which he was entertaining with respect to that victory which he had won only too rapidly. Julien came back with the children a little before the dinner bell. Madame de Renal said to him very dryly at dessert when the servants had left the room, "'You have told me about your wish to go and spend a fortnight at Verrières. Monsieur de Renal is kind enough to give you a holiday. You can leave as soon as you like, but the children's exercises will be sent to you every day, so that they do not waste their time.' "'I shall certainly not allow you more than a week,' said Monsieur de Renal, in a very bitter tone. Julien thought his visage betrayed the anxiety of a man who was seriously harassed. He has not yet decided what line to take, he said to his love during a moment when they were alone together in the drawing-room. Madame de Renal rapidly recounted to him all she had done since the morning. The details are for tonight, she added with a smile. Feminine perversity, thought Julien. What can be the pleasure, what can be the instinct which induces them to deceive us? I think you are both enlightened and at the same time blinded by your love, he said to her with some coldness. Your conduct today has been admirable, but is it prudent for us to try and see each other tonight? This house is paved with enemies. Just think of Elisa's passionate hatred for me. That hate is very like the passionate indifference which you no doubt have for me. Even if I were indifferent, I ought to save you from the peril in which I have plunged you. If chance so wills it that Monsieur de Renal should speak to Elisa, she can acquaint him with everything in a single word. What is to prevent him from hiding near my room, fully armed? What, not even courage, said Madame de Renal, with all the haughtiness of a scion of nobility. I would never demean myself to speak about my courage, said Julien coldly. It would be mean to do so. Let the world judge by the facts. But, he added, taking her hand, you have no idea how devoted I am to you, and how overjoyed I am at being able to say good-bye to you before this cruel separation. End of section 21section 22 of the red and the black by stendhal translated by horace barnett samuel this librivox recording is in the public domain read by peter dan chapter 22 manners of procedure in 1830 speech has been given to man to conceal his thought rp malagrida Julien had scarcely arrived at Verrières before he reproached himself with his injustice towards Madame de Renal. I should have despised her for a weakling of a woman if she had not had the strength to go through with her scene with Monsieur de Renal. But she has acquitted herself like a diplomatist, and I sympathise with the defeat of the man who is my enemy. There is a bourgeois prejudice in my action. My vanity is offended because Monsieur de Renal is a man. Men form a vast and illustrious body to which I have the honour to belong. I am nothing but a fool. M. Chalin had refused the magnificent apartments which the most important liberals in the district had offered him when his loss of his living had necessitated his leaving the parsonage. The two rooms which he had rented were littered with his books. Julien, wishing to show Verrier what a priest could do, went and fetched a dozen pine-wood planks from his father, carried them on his back all along the Grand Rue, borrowed some tools from an old comrade, and soon built a kind of bookcase in which he arranged M. Chalin's books. "'I thought you were corrupted by the vanity of the world,' said the old man to him as he cried with joy. "'But this is something which will redeem all the childishness "'of that brilliant guard of honour uniform "'which has made you so many enemies.' "'Monsieur de Renal had ordered Julien to stay at his house. "'No one suspected what had taken place. "'The third day after his arrival, "'Julien saw no less a personage than Monsieur the sub-prefect de Maugeron "'come all the way up the stairs to his room. It was only after two long hours of fatuous gossip and long-winded lamentations about the wickedness of man, the lack of honesty among the people entrusted with the administration of the public funds, the dangers of his poor France, etc., etc., that Julien was at last vouchsafed a glimpse of the object of the visit. 
They were already on the landing of the staircase, and the poor half-disgraced tutor was escorting, with all proper deference, the future prefect of some prosperous department, when the latter was pleased to take an interest in Julien's fortune, to praise his moderation in money matters, etc., etc. Finally, M. de Morgeron, embracing him in the most paternal way, proposed that he should leave M. de Renal and enter the household of an official who had children to educate and who, like King Philippe, thanked heaven not so much that they had been granted to him, but for the fact that they had been born in the same neighbourhood as M. Julien. Their tutor would enjoy a salary of 800 francs, payable not from month to month, which is not at all aristocratic, said M. de Morgeron, but quarterly and always in advance. It was Julien's turn now. After he had been bored for an hour and a half by waiting for what he had to say, his answer was perfect, and above all as long as a bishop's charge. It suggested everything, and yet said nothing clearly. It showed at the same time respect for Monsieur de Renal, veneration for the public of Verrieres, and gratitude to the distinguished sub-prefect. The sub-prefect, astonished at finding him more Jesuitical than himself, tried in vain to obtain something definite. Julien was delighted, seized the opportunity to practice, and started his answer all over again in different language. Never has an eloquent minister who wished to make the most of the end of a session when the chamber really seemed desirous of waking up said less in more words. M. de Morgeron had scarcely left before Julien began to laugh like a madman. In order to exploit his Jesuitical smartness, he wrote a nine-page letter to Monsieur de Renal, in which he gave him an account of all that had been said to him, and humbly asked his advice. But the old scoundrel has not told me the name of the person who is making the offer. It is bound to be Monsieur Valeno, who, no doubt, sees in my exile at very air the result of his anonymous letter. Having sent off his dispatch, and feeling as satisfied as a hunter who at six o'clock in the morning on a fine autumn day comes out into a plain that abounds with game, he went out to go and ask advice of Monsieur Chalin. But before he had arrived at the good cure's, Providence, wishing to shower favours upon him, threw in his path Monsieur de Valeno, to whom he owned quite freely that his heart was torn in two. A poor lad such as he was owed an exclusive devotion to the vocation to which it had pleased heaven to call him. But vocation was not everything in this base world. In order to work worthily at the vine of the Lord, and not to be totally unworthy of so many worthy colleagues, it was necessary to be educated. It was necessary to spend two expensive years at the seminary of Bessinson, Saving, consequently, became an imperative necessity, and was certainly much easier with a salary of 800 francs paid quarterly than with 600 francs which one received monthly. On the other hand, did not heaven, by placing him by the side of the young de Renals, and especially by inspiring him with a special devotion to them, seem to indicate that it was not proper to abandon that education for another one? Julien reached such a degree of perfection in that particular kind of eloquence which has succeeded the drastic quickness of the empire that he finished by boring himself with the sound of his own words. On reaching home, he found a valet of Monsieur Valeno in full livery who had been looking for him all over the town with a card inviting him to dinner for that same day. Julien had never been in that man's house. Only a few days before he had been thinking of nothing but the means of giving him a sound thrashing without getting into trouble with the police. Although the time of the dinner was one o'clock, Julien thought it more deferential to present himself at half-past twelve at the offer of Monsieur the Director of the Workhouse. He found him parading his importance in the middle of a lot of dispatch boxes. His large black whiskers, his enormous quantity of hair, his Greek bonnet placed across the top of his head, his immense pipe, his embroidered slippers the big chains of gold crossed all over his breast, and the whole stock in trade of a provincial financier who considers himself prosperous failed to impose on Julien in the least. They only made him think the more of the thrashing which he owed him. He asked for the honour of being introduced to Madame Valenot. She was dressing, and was unable to receive him. By way of compensation, he had the privilege of witnessing the toilette of Monsieur the Director of the Workhouse. They subsequently went into the apartment of Madame Valeno, who introduced her children to him with tears in her eyes. This lady was one of the most important in Verrier, had a big face like a man's on which she put rouge in honour of this great function. 
she displayed all the maternal pathos of which she was capable. Julien thought all the time of Madame de Renal. His distrust made him only susceptible to those associations which are called up by their opposites, but he was then affected to the verge of breaking down. This tendency was increased by the sight of the house of the director of the workhouse. He was shown over it. Everything in it was new and magnificent, and he was told the price of every article of furniture. But Julien detected a certain element of sordidness which smacked of stolen money into the bargain. Everybody in it, down to the servants, had the air of setting his face in advance against contempt. The collector of taxes, the superintendent of indirect taxes, the officer of gendarmerie, and two or three other public officials arrived with their wives. They were followed by some rich liberals. Dinner was announced. It occurred to Julien, who was already feeling upset, that there were some poor prisoners on the other side of the dining-room wall, and that an illicit profit had perhaps been made over their rations of meat in order to purchase all that garish luxury with which they were trying to overwhelm him. Perhaps they are hungry at this very minute, he said to himself. He felt a choking in his throat. He found it impossible to eat, and almost impossible to speak. Matters became much worse a quarter of an hour afterwards. They heard in the distance some refrains of a popular song that was, it must be confessed, a little vulgar, which was being sung by one of the inmates. M. Valenot gave a look to one of his liveried servants, who disappeared, and soon there was no more singing to be heard. At that moment a valet offered Julien some Rhine wine in a green glass, and Madame Valenot made a point of asking him to note that this wine cost nine francs a bottle in the market. Julien held up his green glass and said to Monsieur Valenot, "'They are not singing that wretched song any more.' "'Zounds! I should think not,' answered the triumphant governor. "'I have made the rascals keep quiet.' These words were too much for Julien. He had the manners of his new position, but he had not yet assimilated its spirit. In spite of all his hypocrisy and its frequent practice, he felt a big tear drip down his cheek. He tried to hide it in the green glass, but he found it absolutely impossible to do justice to the Rhine wine. Preventing singing, he said to himself, Oh, my God, and you suffer it. Fortunately, nobody noticed his ill-bred emotion. The collector of taxes had struck up a royalist song. So this, reflected Julian's conscience during the hubbub of the refrain which was sung in chorus, is the sordid prosperity which we will eventually reach, and you will only enjoy it under these conditions, and in company like this. You will perhaps have a post worth twenty thousand francs, but while you gorge yourself on meat you will have to prevent a poor prisoner from singing. You will give dinners with the money which you have stolen out of his miserable rations, and during your dinners he will be still more wretched. Oh, Napoleon, how sweet it was to climb to fortune in your way through the dangers of a battle, but to think of aggravating the pain of the unfortunate in this cowardly way. I own that the weakness which Julien had been manifesting in this soliloquy gives me a poor opinion of him. He is worthy of being the accomplice of those kid-gloved conspirators who purport to change the whole essence of a great country's existence without wishing to have on their conscience the most trivial scratch. Julien was sharply brought back to his role. He had not been invited to dine in such good company simply to moon dreamily and say nothing. A retired manufacturer of cotton prints, a corresponding member of the Academy of Besançon and that of Uze, spoke to him from the other end of the table and asked him what was said everywhere about his astonishing progress in the study of the New Testament was really true. A profound silence was suddenly inaugurated. A New Testament in Latin was found, as though by magic, in the possession of the learned member of the two academies. After Julien had answered, part of a sentence in Latin was read at random. Julien then recited. His memory proved faithful, and the prodigy was admired with all the boisterous energy of the end of dinner. Julien looked at the flushed faces of the ladies. A good many were not so plain. He recognised the wife of the collector, who was a fine singer. I'm ashamed, as a matter of fact, to talk Latin so long before these ladies, he said, turning his eyes on her. If Monsieur Rubignon, that was the name of the member of the two academies, will be kind enough to read a Latin sentence at random instead of answering by following the Latin text, I will try to translate it impromptu. This second test completed his glory. 
Several liberals were there, who, though rich, were nonetheless the happy fathers of children capable of obtaining scholarships, and had consequently been suddenly converted at the last mission. In spite of this diplomatic step, M. de Renal had never been willing to receive them in his house. These worthy people, who only knew Julien by name, and from having seen him on horseback on the day of the King of Blank's entry, were his most noisy admirers. When will those fools get tired of listening to this biblical language which they don't understand in the least, he thought. But on the contrary, that language amused them by its strangeness, and made them smile. But Julien got tired. As six o'clock struck, he got up gravely and talked about a chapter in Ligorio's new theology, which he had to learn by heart to recite on the following day to M. Cholin. For, he added pleasantly, my business is to get lessons said by heart to me, and to say them by heart myself. There was much laughter and admiration, such is the kind of wit which is customary in Verrières. Julien had already got up, and in spite of etiquette, everybody got up as well, so great is the dominion exercised by genius. Madame Valenot kept him for another quarter of an hour. He really must hear her children recite their catechisms. They made the most absurd mistakes, which he alone noticed. He was careful not to point them out. What ignorance of the first principles of religion, he thought. Finally he bowed and thought he could get away, but they insisted on his trying a fable of La Fontaine. That author is quite immoral, said Julien to Madame Valenot. A certain fable on Messire Jean Chouard dares to pour ridicule on all that we hold most venerable. He is shrewdly blamed by the best commentators. Before Julien left, he received four or five invitations to dinner. This young man is an honour to the department, cried all the guests in chorus. They even went so far as to talk of a pension voted out of the municipal funds to put him in the position of continuing his studies at Paris. While this rash idea was resounding through the dining-room, Julien had swiftly reached the front door. "'You scum! You scum!' he cried three or four times in succession in a low voice, as he indulged in the pleasure of breathing in the fresh air. He felt quite an aristocrat at this moment, though he was the very man who had been shocked for so long a period by the haughty smile of disdainful superiority which he detected behind all the courtesies addressed to him at M. de Renal's. He could not help realising the extreme difference. Why let us even forget the fact of its being money stolen from the poor inmates, he said to himself as he went away. Let us forget also their stopping the singing. M. de Renal would never think of telling his guests the price of each bottle of wine with which he regales them, and as for this M. Valenot and his chronic cataloguing of his various belongings, he cannot talk of his house, his estate, etc., in the presence of his wife without saying, Your house, your estate. This lady, who was apparently so keenly alive to the delights of decorum, had just had an awful scene during the dinner with a servant who had broken a wine glass and spoilt one of her dozens and the servant, too, had answered her back with the utmost insolence. "'What a collection!' said Julian to himself. "'I would not live like they do were they to give me half of all they steal. I shall give myself away one fine day. I should not be able to restrain myself from expressing the disgust with which they inspire one.' It was necessary, however, to obey Madame de Renal's injunction, and be present at several dinners of the same kind. Julian was the fashion— he was forgiven his guard of honour uniform, or rather, that indiscretion was the real cause of his successes. Soon the only question in Verrières was whether Monsieur de Renal or Monsieur the Director of the Workhouse would be the victor in the struggle for the clever young man. These gentlemen formed, together with Monsieur Maslon, a triumvirate which had tyrannised over the town for a number of years. People were jealous of the mayor, and the Liberals had good cause for complaint, but, after all, he was noble and born for a superior position, while M. Valenot's father had not left him six hundred francs a year. His career had necessitated a transition from pitying the shabby green suit which had been so notorious in his youth, to envying the Norman horses, his gold chains, his Paris clothes, his whole present prosperity. Julien thought that he had discovered one honest man in the whirlpool of this novel world, he was a geometrist named Gros, and had the reputation of being a Jacobin. Julien, who had vowed to say nothing but that which he disbelieved himself, was obliged to watch himself carefully when speaking to Monsieur Gros. He received big packets of exercises from Vergy. He was advised to visit his father frequently, and he fulfilled his unpleasant duty. 
In a word, he was patching his reputation together pretty well when he was thoroughly surprised to find himself woken up one morning by two hands held over his eyes. It was Madame de Renal who had made a trip to the town and who, running up the stairs four at a time when she left her children playing with a pet rabbit, had reached Julien's room a moment before her son's. This moment was delicious but very short. Madame de Renal had disappeared when the children arrived with the rabbit which they wanted to show to their friend. Julien gave them all a hearty welcome, including the rabbit. He seemed at home again. He felt that he loved these children and that he enjoyed gossiping with them. He was astonished at the sweetness of their voices, at the simplicity and dignity of their little ways. He felt he needed to purge his imagination of all the vulgar practices and all the unpleasantnesses among which he had been living in Verrières. For there everyone was always frightened of being scored off, and luxury and poverty were at daggers drawn. The people with whom he would dine would enter into confidences over the joint which were as humiliating for themselves as they were nauseating to the hearer. "'You others, who are nobles, you are right to be proud,' he said to Madame de Renal, as he gave her an account of all the dinners which he had put up with. "'You're the fashion, then,' and she laughed heartily as she thought of the rouge which Madame Valenot thought herself obliged to put on each time she expected Julien. "'I think she has designs on your heart,' he added." The breakfast was delicious. The presence of the children, though apparently embarrassing, increased, as a matter of fact, the happiness of the party. The poor children did not know how to give expression to the joy at seeing Julien again. The servants had not failed to tell them that he had been offered two hundred francs a year more to educate the little Valenos. Stanislas Xavier, who was still pale from his illness, suddenly asked his mother, in the middle of the breakfast, the value of his silver cover and of the goblet in which he was drinking. Why do you want to know that? I want to sell them to give the price to Monsieur Julien, so that he shan't be done if he stays with us. Julien kissed him with tears in his eyes. His mother wept unrestrainedly, for Julien took Stanislas on his knees and explained to him that he should not use the word done, which, when employed in that meaning, was an expression only fit for the servants' hall. Seeing the pleasure which he was giving to Madame de Renal, he tried to explain the meaning of being done by picturesque illustrations, which amused the children. "'I understand,' said Stanislas. "'It's like the crow, who is silly enough to let his cheese fall and be taken by the fox who has been playing the flatterer.' Madame de Renal felt mad with joy and covered her children with kisses, a process which involved her leaning a little on Julien. Suddenly the door opened. It was Monsieur de Renal. His severe and discontented expression contrasted strangely with the sweet joy which his presence dissipated. Madame de Renal grew pale. She felt herself incapable of denying anything. Julien seized command of the conversation and commenced telling Monsieur the Mayor in a loud voice the incident of the silver goblet which Stanislas wanted to sell. He was quite certain this story would not be appreciated. Monsieur de Renal first of all frowned mechanically at the mere mention of money. Any allusion to that mineral, he was accustomed to say, is always a prelude to some demand made upon my purse. But this was something more than a mere money matter. His suspicions were increased. The air of happiness which animated his family during his absence was not calculated to smooth matters over with a man who was a prey to so touchy a vanity. Yes, yes, he said as his wife started to praise to him the combined grace and cleverness of the way in which Julien gave ideas to his pupils. I know he renders me hateful to my own children. It is easy enough to make himself a hundred times more lovable to them than I am myself, though after all I am the master. In this century everything tends to make legitimate authority unpopular. Poor France! Madame de Renal had not stopped to examine the fine shades of the welcome which her husband gave her. She had just caught a glimpse of the possibility of spending twelve hours with Julien. She had a lot of purchases to make in the town, and declared that she positively insisted on going to dine at the tavern. She stuck to her idea in spite of all her husband's protests and remonstrances. The children were delighted with the mere word, tavern, which our modern prudery denounces with so much gusto. Madame de Renal left his wife in the first draper's shop which she entered, and went to pay some visits. He came back more morose than he had been in the morning. He was convinced that the whole town was busy with himself and Julian. As a matter of fact, no one had yet given him any inkling as to the more offensive part of the public gossip. 
Those items which had been repeated to Monsieur the Mayor dealt exclusively with the question of whether Julien would remain with him with six hundred francs, or would accept the eight hundred francs offered by Monsieur the Director of the Workhouse. The director, when he met Monsieur de Renal in society, gave him the cold shoulder. These tactics were not without cleverness. There is no impulsiveness in the provinces. Sensations are so rare there that they are never allowed to be wasted. Monsieur Le Valineau was what is called a hundred miles from Paris a farol, that means a coarse, imprudent type of man. His triumphant existence since 1815 had consolidated his natural qualities. He reigned, so to say, in Verrières, subject to the orders of Monsieur de Renal, but as he was much more energetic, was ashamed of nothing, had a finger in everything, and was always going about writing and speaking, and was oblivious of all snubs, he had, although without any personal pretensions, eventually come to equal the mayor in reputation in the eyes of the ecclesiastical authorities. Monsieur Valineau had, as it were, said to the local tradesman, "'Give me the two biggest fools among your number.' To the men of law, show me the two greatest dunces. To the sanitary officials, point out to me the two biggest charlatans. When he had thus collected the most impudent members of each separate calling, he had practically said to them, Let us reign together. The manners of those people were offensive to Monsieur de Renal. The coarseness of Valineau took offence at nothing, not even the frequency with which the little Abbe Maslon would give the lie to him in public. But in the middle of all this prosperity, M. Valineau found it necessary to reassure himself by a number of petty acts of insolence on the score of the crude truths which he well realised that everybody was justified in addressing to him. His activity had redoubled since the fears which the visit of M. Appert had left him. He had made three journeys to Bessinson. He wrote several letters by each courier. He sent others by unknown men who came to his house at nightfall. Perhaps he had been wrong in securing the dismissal of the old curé Chalin, for this piece of vindictiveness had resulted in his being considered an extremely malicious man by several pious women of good birth. Besides, the rendering of this service had placed him in absolute dependence on Monsieur the Grand Vicar de Frier, from whom he received some strange commissions. He had reached this point in his intrigues when he had yielded to the pleasure of writing an anonymous letter and thus increasing his embarrassment. His wife declared to him that she wanted to have Julien in her house. Her vanity was intoxicated with the idea. Such being his position, M. Valineau imagined in advance a decisive scene with his old colleague, M. de Renal. The latter might address to him some harsh words, which he would not mind much, but he might write to Bessinson and even to Paris. Some minister's cousin might suddenly fall down on Verrières and take over the workhouse. Valineau thought of coming to terms with the Liberals. It was for that purpose that several of them had been invited to the dinner when Julien was present. He would have obtained powerful support against the mayor, but the elections might supervene, and it was only too evident that the directorship of the workhouse was inconsistent with voting on the wrong side. Madame de Renal had made a shrewd guess at this intrigue, and while she explained it to Julien as he gave her his arm to pass from one shop to another, they found themselves gradually taken as far as the Cour de la Fidelité, where they spent several hours nearly as tranquil as those at Vergy. At the same time, M. Valineau was trying to put off a definite crisis with his old patron by himself assuming the aggressive. These tactics succeeded on this particular day, but aggravated the mayor's bad temper. Never has vanity at close grips with all the harshness and meanness of a pettifogging love of money reduced a man to a more sorry condition than that of M. de Renal when he entered the tavern. The children, on the other hand, had never been more joyful and more merry. This contrast put the finishing touch on his peak. So far as I can see, I am not wanted in my family, he said as he entered, in a tone which he meant to be impressive. For answer, his wife took him on one side and declared that it was essential to send Julien away. The hours of happiness which he had just enjoyed had given her again the ease and firmness of demeanour necessary to follow out the plan of campaign which he had been hatching for a fortnight. The finishing touch to the trouble of the poor mayor of Verrier was the fact that he knew that they joked publicly in the town about his love for cash. Valineau was as generous as a thief, and on his side had acquitted himself brilliantly in the last five or six collections for the Brotherhood of St. Joseph, the Congregation of the Virgin, the Congregation of the Holy Sacrament, etc., etc. 
Monsieur de Renal's name had been seen more than once at the bottom of the list of gentlefolk of Verrières and the surrounding neighbourhood, who were adroitly classified in the list of the collecting brethren according to the amount of their offerings. It was in vain that he said that he was not making money. The clergy stands no nonsense in such matters. End of section 22《セクション23 of the Red and the Black》by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 23 Sorrows of an Official. Io piacere della sala testa tutta l'anno, e ben pagato da certi quarti d'ora che bisogna passare. Casti. Let us leave this petty man to his petty fears. Why did he take a man of spirit into his household when he needed someone with the soul of a valet? Why can't he select his staff? The ordinary trend of the nineteenth century is that when a noble and powerful individual encounters a man of spirit, he kills him, exiles him, and imprisons him, or so humiliates him that the other is foolish enough to die of grief. In this country, it so happens that it is not merely the man of spirit who suffers. The great misfortunes of the little towns of France and of representative governments, like that of New York, is that they find it impossible to forget the existence of individuals like Monsieur de Renal. It is these men who make public opinion in a town of twenty thousand inhabitants, and public opinion is terrible in a country which has a charter of liberty. A man, though of a naturally noble and generous disposition, who would have been your friend in the natural order of events, but who happens to live a hundred leagues off, judges you by the public opinion of your town, which is made by those fools who have chanced to be born noble, rich, and conservative. Unhappy is the man who distinguishes himself. Immediately after dinner they left for Vergy, but the next day but one, Julien saw the whole family return to Verrières. An hour had not passed before he discovered, to his great surprise, that Madame de Renal had some mystery up her sleeve. Whenever he came into the room, she would break off her conversation with her husband, and would almost seem to desire that he should go away. Julien did not need to be given this hint twice. He became cold and reserved. Madame de Renal noticed it, and did not ask for an explanation. Is she going to give me a successor? thought Julien. And to think of her being so familiar with me the day before yesterday. But that is how those great ladies are said to act. It's just like kings. One never gets any more warning than the disgraced minister who enters his house to find his letter of dismissal. Julien noticed that these conversations, which left off so abruptly at his approach, often dealt with a big house which belonged to the municipality of Verrières, a house which, though old, was large and commodious, and situated opposite the church in the most busy commercial district of the town. What connection can there be between this house and a new lover? said Julien to himself. In his chagrin, he repeated to himself the pretty verses of Francis I, which seemed novel to him, for Madame de Renal had only taught him them a month before. Souvent femme varie, bien folle et qui s'y vit. M. de Renal took the mail to Besançon. This journey was a matter of two hours. He seemed extremely harassed. On his return, he threw a big grey paper parcel on the table. Here's that silly business, he said to his wife. An hour afterwards, Julien saw the bill poster carrying the big parcel. He followed him eagerly. I shall learn the secret at the first street corner. He waited impatiently behind the bill poster, who was smearing the back of the poster with his big brush. It had scarcely been put in its place before Julien's curiosity saw the detailed announcement of the putting up for public auction of that big old house whose name had figured so frequently in Monsieur de Renal's conversations with his wife. The auction of the lease was announced for tomorrow at two o'clock in the town hall after the extinction of the third fire. Julien was very disappointed. He found the time a little short. How could there be time to apprise all the other would-be purchasers? But, moreover, the bill, which was dated a fortnight back, and which he read again in its entirety in three distinct places, taught him nothing. He went to visit the house which was to let. The porter, who had not seen him approach, was saying mysteriously to a neighbour, Poor, poor, waste of time. 
Monsieur Maslon has promised him that he shall have it for three hundred francs, and as the mayor kicked, he has been summoned to the bishop's palace by Monsieur the Grand Vicar de Friere. Julien's arrival seemed very much to disconcert the two friends, who did not say another word. Julien made a point of being present at the auction of the lease. There was a crowd in the badly lighted hall, but everybody kept quizzing each other in quite a singular way. All eyes were fixed on a table, where Julien perceived three little lighted candle ends on a tin plate. The usher was crying out, Three hundred francs, gentlemen! Three hundred francs, that's a bit too thick, said a man to his neighbour in a low voice. Julien was between the two of them. It's worth more than eight hundred. I will raise the bidding. It's cutting off your nose to spite your face. What will you gain by putting Monsieur Maslon, Monsieur Valeno, the bishop, this terrible grand vicar de Friere, and the whole gang on your track? Three hundred and twenty francs, shouted out the other. Damned brute, answered the neighbour. Why, here we have a spy of the mayor, he added, designating Julien. Julien turned sharply round to punish this remark, but the two, Franck Contois, were no longer paying any attention to him. Their coolness gave him back his own. At that moment the last candle end went out, and the usher's drawling voice awarded the house to Monsieur de saint Guru of the office of the prefecture of blank, for a term of nine years and for a rent of three hundred and twenty francs. As soon as the mayor had left the hall, the gossip began again. Here's thirty francs that Grosio's recklessness is landing the municipality in for, said one. But, answered another, Monsieur de saint Giraud will revenge himself on Grosio. How monstrous, said a big man on Julien's left. A house which I myself would have given eight hundred francs for my factory, and I would have got a good bargain. Poh, answered a young manufacturer, doesn't Monsieur de saint Giraud belong to the congregation? Haven't his four children got scholarships? Poor man, the community of Verrières must give him five hundred francs over and above his salary, that is all. And to say that the mayor was not able to stop it, remarked a third, for he's an ultra, he is, I'm glad to say, but he doesn't steal. Doesn't he? answered another. Suppose it's simply a mere game of snap, then. Everything goes into a big common purse, and everything is divided up at the end of the year. But here's that little Sorel. Let's go away. Julien got home in a very bad temper. He found Madame de Renal very sad. You come from the auction, she said to him. Yes, madame, where I had the honour of passing for a spy of Monsieur the Mayor. If he had taken my advice, he would have gone on a journey. At this moment, Monsieur de Renal appeared. He looked very dismal. The dinner passed without a single word. Monsieur de Renal ordered Julien to follow the children to Vergy. Madame de Renal endeavoured to console her husband. You ought to be used to it, my dear. That evening they were seated in silence around the domestic hearth. The crackle of the burnt pine wood was their only distraction. It was one of those moments of silence which happen in the most united families. One of the children cried out gaily, Somebody's ringing! Somebody's ringing! Zounds! Suppose it's Monsieur de saint Giraud who has come under the pretext of thanking me, exclaimed the mayor. I shall give him a dressing down. It is outrageous. It is Valeno to whom I'll feel under an obligation. It is I who get compromised. What shall I say if those damned Jacobin journalists get hold of this anecdote and turn me into a Monsieur Nonant Sank? A very good-looking man with big black whiskers entered at this moment, preceded by the servant. Monsieur the Mayor, I am Signor Geronimo. Here is a letter which Monsieur the Chevalier de Beauvoisy, who is attached to the Embassy of Naples, gave me for you on my departure. That is only nine days ago, added Signor Geronimo, gaily looking at Madame de Renal. Your cousin and my good friend, Signor de Beauvoisy, says that you know Italian, madame. The Neapolitan's good humour changed this gloomy evening into a very gay one. Madame de Renal insisted on giving him supper. She put the whole house on the go. She wanted to free Julien at any price from the imputation of espionage which she had heard already twice that day. Signor Geronimo was an excellent singer, excellent company, and had very gay qualities, which at any rate in France are hardly compatible with each other. After dinner he sang a little duet with Madame de Renal and told some charming tales. At one o'clock in the morning the children protested when Julien suggested that they should go to bed. "'Another of those stories,' said the eldest. "'It is my own, Signorino,' answered Signor Geronimo. 
Eight years ago, I was, like you, a young pupil of the Naples Conservatoire. I mean, I was your age, but I did not have the honour to be the son of the distinguished mayor of the pretty town of Verrières. This phrase made Monsieur de Renal sigh and look at his wife. Signor Zingarelli, continued the young singer, somewhat exaggerating his action and thus making the children burst into laughter, Signor Zingarelli was an excellent though severe master. He is not popular at the Conservatoire, but he insists on the pretense being kept up that he is. I went out as often as I could. I used to go to the little Teatro de San Calino, where I used to hear divine music. But heavens, the question was, to scrape together the eight sous which were the price of admission to the parterre? An enormous sum, he said, looking at the children and watching them laugh. Signor Giovannone, director of the San Carlino, heard me sing. I was sixteen. That child is a treasure, he said. Would you like me to engage you, my dear boy, he said. And how much will you give me? Forty ducats a month. That is one hundred and sixty francs, gentlemen. I thought the gates of heaven had opened. But, I said to Giovannone, how shall I get the strict Zingarelli to let me go out? Lascia far a me. Leave it to me, exclaimed the eldest of the children. Quite right, my young sir. Signor Giovannone, he says to me, first sign this little piece of paper, my dear friend. I sign. He gives me three ducats. I had never seen so much money. Then he told me what I had to do. Next day I asked the terrible Zingarelli for an audience. His old valet ushered me in. What do you want of me, you naughty boy, said Zingarelli. Maestro, I said, I repent of all my faults. I will never go out of the conservatoire by passing through the iron grill. I will redouble my diligence. If I were not frightened of spoiling the finest bass voice I have ever heard, I would put you in prison for a fortnight on bread and water, you rascal. Maestro, I answered, I will be the model boy of the whole school. Credete a me, but I would ask one favour of you. If anyone comes and asks permission for me to sing outside, refuse. As a favour, please say that you cannot let me. And who the devil do you think is going to ask for a ne'er-do-well like you? Do you think I should ever allow you to leave the conservatoire? Do you want to make fun of me? Clear out, clear out, he said, trying to give me a kick. Or look out for prison and dry bread. One thing astonished Julian. The solitary weeks passed at Verrieres and de Renal's house had been a period of happiness for him. He had only experienced revulsions and sad thoughts at the dinners to which he had been invited. And was he not able to read, write and reflect without being distracted in this solitary house? He was not distracted every moment from his brilliant reveries by the cruel necessity of studying the movement of a false soul in order to deceive it by intrigue and hypocrisy. To think of happiness being so near to me, the expense of a life like that is small enough. I could have my choice of either marrying Mademoiselle Elisa or of entering into partnership with Fouquet. But it is only the traveller who has just scaled a steep mountain and sits down on the summit who finds a perfect pleasure in resting. Would he be happy if he had to rest all the time? Madame de Renal's mind had now reached a state of desperation. In spite of her resolution, she had explained to Julien all the details of the auction. He will make me forget all my oaths, she thought. She would have sacrificed her life without hesitation to save that of her husband if she had seen him in danger. She was one of those noble, romantic souls who finds a source of perpetual remorse equal to that occasion by the actual perpetration of a crime in seeing the possibility of a generous action and not doing it. Nonetheless, there were deadly days when she was not able to banish the imagination of the excessive happiness which she would enjoy if she suddenly became a widow and were able to marry Julien. He loved her sons much more than their father did. In spite of his strict justice, they were devoted to him. She quite realised that if she married Julien, it would be necessary to leave that vergy whose shades were so dear to her. She pictured herself living at Paris and continuing to give her sons an education which would make them admired by everyone. Her children, herself and Julien, they would all be perfectly happy. Strange result of marriage such as the 19th century has made it. The boredom of matrimonial life makes love fade away inevitably when love has preceded the marriage. But nonetheless, said a philosopher, married life soon reduces those people who are sufficiently rich not to have to work to a sense of being utterly bored by all quiet enjoyments.
and among women it is only arid souls whom it does not predispose to love. The philosopher's reflection makes me excuse Madame de Renal, but she was not excused in very air, and without her suspecting it, the whole town found its sole topic of interest in the scandal of her intrigue. As a result of this great affair, the autumn was less boring than usual. The autumn and part of the winter passed very quickly. It was necessary to leave the woods of Vergy. Good Verrier society began to be indignant at the fact that its anathemas made so little impression on Monsieur de Renal. Within eight days, several serious personages who made up for their habitual gravity of demeanour by their pleasure in fulfilling missions of this kind gave him the most cruel suspicions, at the same time utilising the most measured terms. Monsieur Valenot, who was playing a deep game, had placed Elisa in an aristocratic family of great repute where there were five women. Elisa, fearing, so she said, not to find a place during the winter, had only asked from this family about two-thirds of what she had received in the house of the mayor. The girl hit upon the excellent idea of going to confession at the same time to both the old curé Chalin and also to the new one, so as to tell both of them in detail about Julien's amour. The day after his arrival, the Abbe Chalin summoned Julien to him at six o'clock in the morning. I ask you nothing, he said. I beg you, and if needs be, I insist that you either leave for the seminary of Bessinson or for your friend Fouquet, who is always ready to provide you with a splendid future. I have seen to everything and have arranged everything, but you must leave and not come back to Verrières for a year. Julien did not answer. He was considering whether his honour ought to regard itself offended at the trouble which Chalin, who, after all, was not his father, had taken on his behalf. "'I shall have the honour of seeing you again to-morrow at the same hour,' he said, finally, to the curé. Chalin, who reckoned on carrying so young a man by storm, talked a great deal. Julien, cloaked in the most complete humbleness, both of demeanour and expression, did not open his lips." Eventually he left, and ran to warn Madame de Renal, whom he found in despair. Her husband had just spoken to her with a certain amount of frankness. The weakness of his character found support in the prospect of the legacy, and had decided him to treat her as perfectly innocent. He had just confessed to her the strange state in which he had found public opinion in Verrières. The public was wrong, it had been misled by jealous tongues. But, after all, what was one to do? Madame de Renal was, for the moment, under the illusion that Julien would accept the offer of Valenot and stay at Verrières. But she was no longer the simple, timid woman that she had been the preceding year. Her fatal passion and remorse had enlightened her. She soon realised the painful truth, while at the same time she listened to her husband, that at any rate a temporary separation had become essential. When he is far from me, Julien will revert to those ambitious projects which are so natural when one has no money. And I, great God, I am so rich, and my riches are so useless for my happiness. He will forget me. Lovable as he is, he will be loved, and he will love. You unhappy woman, what can I complain of? Heaven is just. I was not virtuous enough to leave off the crime. Fate robs me of my judgment. I could easily have bribed Elisa if I had wanted to. Nothing was easier. I did not take the trouble to reflect for a moment. The mad imagination of love absorbed all my time. I am ruined. When Julien apprised Madame de Renal of the terrible news of his departure, he was struck with one thing. He did not find her put forward any selfish objections. She was evidently making efforts not to cry. We have need of firmness, my dear. She cut off a strand of her hair. I do not know what I shall do, she said to him, but promise me, if I die, never to forget my children. Whether you are far or near, try to make them into honest men. If there is a new revolution, all the nobles will have their throats cut. Their father will probably emigrate because of that peasant on the roof who got killed. Watch over my family. Give me your hand. Adieu, my dear. These are our last moments. Having made this great sacrifice, I hope I shall have the courage to consider my reputation in public. Julian had been expecting despair. The simplicity of this farewell touched him. No, I am not going to receive your farewell like this. I will leave you now as you yourself wish it. 
but three days after my departure I will come back to see you at night. Madame de Renal's life was changed. Sir Julien really loved her, since of his own accord he had thought of seeing her again. Her awful grief became changed into one of the keenest transports of joy which she had felt in her whole life. Everything became easy for her. The certainty of seeing her lover deprived these last moments of their poignancy. From that moment, both Madame de Renal's demeanour and the expression of her face were noble, firm and perfectly dignified. Monsieur de Renal soon came back. He was beside himself. He eventually mentioned to his wife the anonymous letter which he had received two months before. I will take it to the casino and show everybody that it has been sent by that brute Valano, whom I took out of the gutter and made into one of the richest tradesmen in Verrier. I will disgrace him publicly, and then I will fight him. This is too much. Great heavens, I may become a widow, thought Madame de Renal, and almost at the same time she said to herself, If I do not, as I certainly can, prevent this duel, I shall be the murderess of my own husband. She had never expended so much skill in honouring his vanity. Within two hours she made him see, and always by virtue of reasons which he discovered himself, that it was necessary to show more friendship than ever to Monsieur Valenot, and even to take Elisa back into the household. Madame de Renal had need of courage to bring herself to see again the girl who was the cause of her unhappiness. But this idea was one of Julien's. Finally, having been put on the track three or four times, M. de Renal arrived spontaneously at the conclusion, disagreeable though it was from the financial standpoint, that the most painful thing that could happen to him would be that Julien, in the middle of the effervescence of popular gossip throughout Verrières, should stay in the town as the tutor of Valenot's children. It was obviously to Julien's interest to accept the offer of the director of the workhouse. Conversely, it was essential for Monsieur de Renal's prestige that Julien should leave Verrier to enter the seminary of Bessinson or that of Dijon. But how to make him decide on that course? And then, how is he going to live? Monsieur de Renal, seeing a monetary sacrifice looming in the distance, was in deeper despair than his wife. As for her, she felt, after this interview, in the position of a man of spirit who, tired of life, has taken a dose of stramonium. He only acts mechanically, so to speak, and takes no longer any interest in anything. In this way, Louis the Fourteenth came to say on his deathbed, When I was king. An admirable epigram. Next morning, M. de Renal received quite early an anonymous letter. It was written in a most insulting style, and the coarsest words applicable to his position occurred on every line. It was the work of some jealous subordinate. This letter made him think again of fighting a duel with Valenot. Soon his courage went as far as the idea of immediate action. He left the house alone, went to the armourers, and got some pistols which he loaded. Yes, indeed, he said to himself, even though the strict administration of the Emperor Napoleon were to become fashionable again, I should not have one sou's worth of jobbery to reproach myself with. At the outside I have shut my eyes, and I have some good letters in my desk which authorise me to do so. Madame de Renal was terrified by her husband's cold anger. It recalled to her the fatal idea of widowhood, which she had so much trouble in repelling. She closeted herself with him. For several hours she talked to him in vain. The new anonymous letter had decided him. Finally she succeeded in transforming the courage which had decided him to box Valenot's ears into the courage of offering six hundred francs to Julien, which would keep him for one year in a seminary. M. de Renal cursed a thousand times the day that he had had the ill-starred idea of taking a tutor into his house, and forgot the anonymous letter. He consoled himself a little by an idea which he did not tell his wife. With the exercise of some skill, and by exploiting the romantic ideas of the young man, he hoped to be able to induce him to refuse M. Valenot's offer at a cheaper price. Madame de Renal had much more trouble in proving to Julien that, inasmuch as he was sacrificing the post of six hundred francs a year in order to enable her husband to keep up appearances, he need have no shame in accepting the compensation. But Julien would say each time, I have never thought for a moment of accepting that offer. You have made me so used to a refined life that the coarseness of those people would kill me. Cruel necessity bent Julien's will with its iron hand. 
His pride gave him the illusion that he only accepted the sum offered by M. de Renal as a loan, and induced him to give a promissory note, repayable in five years with interest. Madame de Renal had, of course, many thousands of francs which had been concealed in the little mountain cave. She offered them to him all a tremble, feeling only too keenly that they would be angrily refused. "'Do you wish,' said Julien to her, "'to make the memory of our love loathsome?' Finally, Julien left Ferrières. Madame de Renal was very happy, but when the fatal moment came to accept money from him, the sacrifice proved beyond Julien's strength. He refused point-blank. M. de Renal embraced him round the neck with tears in his eyes. Julien had asked him for a testimonial of good conduct, and his enthusiasm could find no terms magnificent enough in which to extol his conduct. Our hero had five louis of savings, and he reckoned on asking Fouquet for an equal sum. He was very moved. But, one league from Verrières, where he left so much that was dear to him, he only thought of the happiness of seeing the capital of a great military town like Bessinson. During the short absence of three days, Madame de Renal was the victim of one of the cruelest deceptions to which love is liable. Her life was tolerable, because between her and extreme unhappiness there was still that last interview which he was to have with Julien. Finally, during the night of the third day, she heard from a distance the preconcerted signal. Julien, having passed through a thousand dangers, appeared before her. In this moment she had only one thought, I see him for the last time. Instead of answering the endearments of her lover, she seemed more dead than alive. If she forced herself to tell him that she loved him, she said it with an embarrassed air which almost proved the contrary. Nothing could rid her of the cruel idea of eternal separation. The suspicious Julien thought for the moment that he was already forgotten. His pointed remarks to this effect were only answered by great tears which flowed down in silence and by some hysterical pressings of the hand. But, Julien would answer his mistress's cold protestations, Great heavens, how can you expect me to believe you? You would show one hundred times more sincere affection to Madame de Ville, to a mere acquaintance. Madame de Renal was petrified and at a loss for an answer. It is impossible to be more unhappy. I hope I am going to die. I feel my heart turn to eyes. Those were the longest answers which he could obtain. When the approach of the day rendered it necessary for him to leave Madame de Renal, her tears completely ceased. She saw him tie a knotted rope to the window without saying a word, and without returning her kisses. It was in vain that Julien said to her, So now we have reached the state of affairs which you wished for so much. Henceforward you will live without remorse. The slightest indisposition of your children will no longer make you see them in the tomb. I am sorry that you cannot kiss Stanislas she said coldly. Julien finished by being profoundly impressed by the cold embrace of this living corpse. He could think of nothing else for several leagues. His soul was overwhelmed, and before passing the mountain, and while he could still see the church tower of Verrières, he turned round frequently. End of section 23《Section 24 of the Red and the Black》by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 24. A Capital. What a noise! What busy people! What ideas for the future in a brain of twenty! What distraction offered by love! Barnave. Finally he saw some black walls near a distant mountain. It was the citadel of Bessinson. How different it would be for me, he said with a sigh, if I were arriving at this noble military town to be sub-lieutenant in one of the regiments entrusted with its defence. Bessinson is not only one of the prettiest towns in France, it abounds in people of spirit and brains. But Julien was only a little peasant and had no means of approaching distinguished people. He had taken a civilian suit at Fouquet's, and it was in this dress that he passed the drawbridge. Steeped as he was in the history of the siege of 1674, he wished to see the ramparts of the citadel before shutting himself up in the seminary. He was within an ace two or three times of getting himself arrested by the sentinel. 
He was penetrating into places which military genius forbids the public to enter in order to sell 12 or 15 francs worth of corn every year. The height of the walls, the depth of the ditches, the terrible aspect of the cannons had been engrossing him for several hours when he passed before the great café on the boulevard. He was motionless with wonder. It was in vain that he read the word café written in big characters above the two immense doors. He could not believe his eyes. He made an effort to overcome his timidity. He dared to enter, and found himself in a hall twenty or thirty yards long and with a ceiling at least twenty feet high. Today everything had a fascination for him. Two games of billiards were in progress. The waiters were crying out the scores. The players ran round the tables, encumbered by spectators. Clouds of tobacco smoke came from everybody's mouth and enveloped them in a blue haze. The high stature of these men, their rounded shoulders, their heavy gait, their enormous whiskers, the long-tailed coats which covered them, everything combined to attract Julien's attention. These noble children of the antique Byzantium only spoke at the top of their voices. They gave themselves terrible martial airs. Julien stood still and admired them. He kept thinking of the immensity and magnificence of a great capital like Bessinson. He felt absolutely devoid of the requisite courage to ask one of those haughty-looking gentlemen who were crying out the billiard scores for a cup of coffee. But the young lady at the bar had noticed the charming face of this young civilian from the country who had stopped three feet from the stove with his little parcel under his arm and was looking at the fine white plaster bust of the king. This young lady, a big franc comtoise, very well made and dressed with the elegance suitable to the prestige of the café, had already said two or three times in a little voice, not intended to be heard by anyone except Julien, Monsieur, Monsieur. Julien's eyes encountered big blue eyes full of tenderness and saw that he was the person who was being spoken to. He sharply approached the bar and the pretty girl as though he had been marching towards the enemy. In this great manoeuvre, the parcel fell. What pity will not our provincial inspire in the young lycée scholars of Paris, who at the early age of fifteen know already how to enter a café with so distinguished an air? But these children, who have such style at fifteen, turn commonplace at eighteen. The impassioned timidity which is met with in the provinces sometimes manages to master its own nervousness, and thus trains the will. I must tell her the truth, thought Julien, who was becoming courageous by dint of conquering his timidity as he approached this pretty girl, who deigned to address him. Madame, this is the first time in my life that I have come to Bessinson. I should like to have some bread and a cup of coffee in return for payment. The young lady smiled a little and then blushed. She feared the ironic attention and the jests of the billiard players might be turned against this pretty young man. He would be frightened and would not appear there again. Sit here near me, she said to him, showing him a marble table almost completely hidden by the enormous mahogany counter which extended into the hall. The young lady leant over the counter, and had thus an opportunity of displaying a superb figure. Julien noticed it. All his ideas changed. The pretty young lady had just placed before him a cup, some sugar, and a little roll. She hesitated to call a waiter for the coffee, as she realised that his arrival would put an end to her tete-a-tete with Julien. Julien was pensively comparing this blonde and merry beauty with certain memories which would often thrill him. The thought of the passion of which he had been the object nearly freed him from all his timidity. The pretty young woman had only one moment to save the situation. She read it in Julien's looks. This pipe smoke makes you cough. Come and have breakfast tomorrow before eight o'clock in the morning. I am practically alone then. What is your name? said Julien, with a caressing smile of happy timidity. Amanda Binet. Will you allow me to send you within an hour's time a little parcel about as big as this? The beautiful Amanda reflected a little. I am watched. What you ask may compromise me. All the same, I will write my address on a card, which you will put on your parcel. Send it boldly to me. My name is Julien Sorel, said the young man. I have neither relatives nor acquaintances at Bessinson. Ah, I understand, she said joyfully. You come to study law. Alas, no, answered Julien. I am being sent to the seminary. The most complete discouragement damped Amanda's features. She called a waiter. 
She had courage now. The waiter poured out some coffee for Julien without looking at him. Amanda was receiving money at the counter. Julien was proud of having dared to speak. A dispute was going on at one of the billiard tables. The cries and the protests of the players resounded over the immense hall and made a din which astonished Julian. Amanda was dreamy and kept her eyes lowered. If you like, mademoiselle, he said to her suddenly with assurance, I will say that I am your cousin. This little air of authority pleased Amanda. He is not a mere nobody, she thought. She spoke to him very quickly without looking at him because her eye was occupied in seeing if anybody was coming near the counter. I come from Jean-Li, near Dijon. Say that you are also from Jean-Li, and are my mother's cousin. I shall not fail to do so. All the gentlemen who go to the seminary pass here before the café every Thursday in the summer at five o'clock. If you think of me when I am passing, have a bunch of violets in your hand. Amanda looked at him with an astonished air. This look changed Julian's courage into audacity. Nevertheless, he reddened considerably as he said to her, I feel that I love you with the most violent love. Speak in lower tones, she said to him with a frightened air. Julien was trying to recollect phrases out of a volume of the Nouvelle Loise which he had found at Vergy. His memory served him in good stead. For ten minutes he recited the Nouvelle Loise to the delighted Mademoiselle Amanda. He was happy on the strength of his own bravery, when suddenly the beautiful Franck Contoise assumed an icy air. One of her lovers had appeared at the café door. He approached the bar, whistling and swaggering his shoulders. He looked at Julien. The latter's imagination, which always indulged in extremes, suddenly brimmed over with ideas of a duel. He paled greatly, put down his cup, assumed an assured demeanour, and considered his rival very attentively. As this rival lowered his head while he familiarly poured out on the counter a glass of brandy for himself, Amanda ordered Julien with a look to lower his eyes. He obeyed, and for two minutes kept motionless in his place, pale, resolute, and only thinking of what was going to happen. He was truly happy at this moment. The rival had been astonished by Julien's eyes. Gulping down his glass of brandy, he said a few words to Amanda, placed his two hands in the pockets of his big tail coat, and approached the billiard table, whistling and looking at Julien. The latter got up, transported with rage, but did not know what to do in order to be offensive. He put down his little parcel and walked towards the billiard table with all the swagger he could muster. It was in vain that Prudence said to him, but your ecclesiastical career will be ruined by a duel immediately on top of your arrival at Bessinson. What does it matter? It shall never be said that I let an insolent fellow go scot-free. Amanda saw his courage. It contrasted prettily with the simplicity of his manners. She instantly preferred him to the big young man with the tailcoat. She got up, and while appearing to be following with her eyes somebody who was passing in the street, she went and quickly placed herself between him and the billiard table. Take care not to look askance at that gentleman. He is my brother-in-law. What does it matter? He looked at me. Do you want to make me unhappy? No doubt he looked at you. Why, it may be, he is going to speak to you. I told him that you are a relative of my mother and that you had arrived from jean Lee. He is a franc comtois and has never gone beyond the Dolien, the Burgundy Road, so say what you like and fear nothing. Julien was still hesitating. Her barmaid's imagination furnished her with an abundance of lies, and she quickly added, No doubt he looked at you, but it was at a moment when he was asking me who you were. He is a man who is boorish with everyone. He did not mean to insult you. Julien's eyes followed the pretended brother-in-law. He saw him buy a ticket for the pool which they were playing at the further of the two billiard tables. Julien heard his loud voice shouting out in a threatening tone, My turn to play! He passed sharply before Madame Amanda and took a step towards the billiard table. Amanda seized him by the arm. Come and pay me first, she said to him. That is right, thought Julien. She is frightened that I shall leave without paying. Amanda was as agitated as he was, and very red. She gave him the change as slowly as she could, while she repeated to him in a low voice, Leave the café this instant, or I shall love you no more, and yet I do love you very much. Julien did go out, but slowly. Am I not in duty bound, he repeated to himself, to go and stare at that coarse person in my turn? 
This uncertainty kept him on the boulevard in the front of the café for an hour. He kept looking if his man was coming out. He did not come out, and Julien went away. He had only been at Besançon some hours, and already he had overcome one pang of remorse. The old surgeon major had formerly given him some fencing lessons, in spite of his gout. That was all the science which Julien could enlist in the service of his anger. But this embarrassment would have been nothing if he had only known how to vent his temper otherwise than by the giving of a blow, for if it had come to a matter of fisticuffs, his enormous rival would have beaten him and then cleared out. There is not much difference between a seminary and a prison, said Julien to himself, for a poor devil like me, without protectors and without money. I must leave my civilian clothes in some inn where I can put my black suit on again. If I ever manage to get out of the seminary for a few hours, I shall be able to see Mademoiselle Amanda again in my lay clothes. This reasoning was all very fine. Though Julien passed in front of all the inns, he did not dare to enter a single one. Finally, as he was passing again before the Hôtel des Ambassadeurs, his anxious eyes encountered those of a big woman, still fairly young, with a high colour and a gay, happy air. He approached her and told his story. "'Certainly, my pretty little abbe,' said the hostess of the ambassadeur to him. "'I will keep your lay clothes for you, and I will even have them regularly brushed. "'In weather like this it is not good to leave a suit of cloth without touching it.' "'She took a key and conducted him herself to a room, "'and advised him to make out a note of what he was leaving. "'Good heavens, how well you look in that, monsieur the abbe Sorel,' "'said the big woman to him when he came down to the kitchen. "'I will go and get a good dinner served up to you.' and she added in a low voice, "'It will only cost twenty sous instead of the fifty which everybody else pays, for one must really take care of your little purse-strings.' "'I have ten louis,' Julien replied with a certain pride. "'Oh, great heavens!' answered the good hostess in alarm. "'Don't talk so loud. There are quite a lot of bad characters in Besançon. They'll steal all that from you in less than no time, and above all, never go into the café. They are filled with bad characters.' "'Indeed,' said Julien, to whom those words gave food for thought. "'Don't go anywhere else except to my place. I will make coffee for you. Remember that you will always find a friend here and a good dinner for twenty sous. So, now you understand, I hope. Go and sit down at table. I will serve you myself.' "'I shan't be able to eat,' said Julien to her. "'I am too upset. I am going to enter the seminary as I leave you.' The good woman would not allow him to leave before she had filled his pockets with provisions. Finally, Julien took his road towards the terrible place. The hostess was standing at the threshold and showed him the way. End of section 24「Section 25 of The Red and the Black by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 25. The Seminary. 336 dinners at 85 centimes. 336 suppers at 50 centimes. Chocolate to those who are entitled to it. How much profit can be made on the contract? Valeno of Besançon. He saw in the distance the iron gilt cross on the door. He approached slowly. His legs seemed to give way beneath him. So here is this hell upon earth which I shall be unable to leave. Finally he made up his mind to ring. The noise of the bell reverberated as though through a solitude. At the end of ten minutes a pale man, clothed in black, came and opened the door. Julien looked at him and immediately lowered his eyes. This porter had a singular physiognomy. The green projecting pupils of his eyes were as round as those of a cat. The straight lines of his eyebrows betokened the impossibility of any sympathy. His thin lips came round in a semicircle over projecting teeth. Nonetheless, his physiognomy did not so much betoken crime as rather that perfect callousness which is so much more terrifying to the young. The one sentiment which Julien's rapid gaze surmised in this long and devout face was a profound contempt for every topic of conversation which did not deal with things celestial. Julien raised his eyes with an effort, and in a voice rendered quavering by the beating of his heart, explained that he desired to speak to Monsieur Perard, the director of the seminary. 
Without saying a word, the man in black signed to him to follow. They ascended two storeys by a large staircase with a wooden rail, whose warped stairs inclined to the side opposite the wall and seemed on the point of falling. A little door with a big cemetery cross of white wood painted black at the top was opened with difficulty, and the porter made him enter a dark low room, whose whitewashed walls were decorated with two big pictures blackened by age. In this room Julien was left alone. He was overwhelmed. His heart was beating violently. He would have been happy to have ventured to cry. A silence of death reigned over the whole house. At the end of a quarter of an hour, which seemed a whole day to him, the sinister-looking porter reappeared on the threshold of a door at the other end of the room, and without vouchsafing a word, signed to him to advance. He entered into a room even larger than the first, and very badly lighted. The walls also were whitened, but there was no furniture. Only in a corner near the door Julien saw as he passed a white wooden bed, two straw chairs, and a little pine wood armchair without any cushions. He perceived at the other end of the room, near a small window with yellow panes decorated with badly kept flower vases, a man seated at a table and covered with a dilapidated cassock. He appeared to be in a temper, and took one after the other a number of little squares of paper, which he arranged on his table after he had written some words on them. He did not notice Julien's presence. The latter did not move, but kept standing near the centre of the room, in a place where the porter, who had gone out and shut the door, had left him. Ten minutes passed in this way. The badly dressed man kept on writing all the time. Julien's emotion and terror were so great that he thought he was on the point of falling. A philosopher would have said, possibly wrongly, it is a violent impression made by ugliness on a soul intended by nature to love the beautiful. The man who was writing lifted up his head. Julien only perceived it after a moment had passed, and even after seeing it he still remained motionless, as though struck dead by the terrible look of which he was the victim. Julien's troubled eyes just managed to make out a long face, all covered with red blotches except the forehead, which manifested a mortal pallor. Two little black eyes, calculated to terrify the most courageous, shone between these red cheeks and that white forehead. The vast area of his forehead was bounded by thick, flat, jet-black hair. "'Will you come near, yes or no?' said the man at last, impatiently. Julien advanced with an uneasy step, and at last, paler than he had ever been in his life and on the point of falling, stopped three paces from the little white wooden table which was covered with the squares of paper. Nearer, said the man. Julien advanced still further, holding out his hand as though trying to lean on something. Your name? Julien Sorel. You are certainly very late, said the man to him, as he riveted again on him that terrible gaze. Julien could not endure this look. Holding out his hand as though to support himself, he fell all his length along the floor. The man rang. Julien had only lost the use of his eyes and the power of movement. He heard steps approaching. He was lifted up and placed on the little armchair of white wood. He heard the terrible man saying to the porter, He has had an epileptic fit, apparently, and this is the finishing touch. When Julien was able to open his eyes, the man with the red face was going on with his writing. The porter had disappeared. I must have courage, said our hero to himself, and above all hide what I feel. He felt violently sick. If anything happens to me, God knows what they will think of me. Finally the man stopped writing and looked sideways at Julien. Are you in a fit state to answer me? Yes, sir, said Julien in an enfeebled voice. Ah, that's fortunate. The man in black had half got up and was looking impatiently for a letter in the drawer of his pinewood table, which he opened with a grind. He found it, sat down slowly and looking again at Julien in a manner calculated to suck out of him the little life which he still possessed, said, "'You have been recommended to me by Monsieur Chelin. He was the best curé in the diocese. He was an upright man, if ever there was one, and my friend for thirty years.' "'Oh, it's to Monsieur Perard, then, that I have the honour of speaking?' said Julien, in a dying voice. "'Apparently,' replied the director of the seminary, as he looked at him disagreeably. The glitter of his little eyes doubled up and was followed by an involuntary movement of the muscles of the corner of the mouth. 
It was the physiognomy of the tiger, savouring in advance the pleasure of devouring its prey. Chalin's letter is short, he said, as though speaking to himself. Intelligenti parca. In the present time it is impossible to write too little. He read aloud. I recommend to you Julien Sorel of this parish, whom I baptised nearly twenty years ago, the son of a rich carpenter who gives him nothing. Julien will be a remarkable worker in the vineyard of the Lord. He lacks neither memory nor intelligence. He has some faculty for reflection. Will he persevere in his calling? Is he sincere? Sincere, repeated the Abbe Parade with an astonished air, looking at Julien. But the Abbe's look was already less devoid of all humanity. Sincere, he repeated, lowering his voice and resuming his reading. I ask you for a stipend for Julien Sorel. He will earn it by passing the necessary examinations. I have taught him a little theology, that old and good theology of the Bosway, the Arno, and the Fleuries. If the person does not suit you, send him back to me. The director of the workhouse, whom you know well, offers him eight hundred to be tutor to his children. My inner self is tranquil, thanks to God. I am accustoming myself to the terrible blow. Vale et me ama. The Abbe Perra, speaking more slowly as he read the signature, pronounced with a sigh the word Chalin. He is tranquil, he said. In fact, his righteousness deserves such a recompense. May God grant it to me in such a case. He looked up to heaven and made the sign of the cross. At the sight of that sacred sign, Julian felt an alleviation of the profound horror which had frozen him since his entry into the house. I have here 321 aspirants for the most holy state, said the Abbe Pirard at last in a tone which, though severe, was not malicious. Only seven or eight have been recommended to me by such men as the Abbe Chalin, so you will be the ninth of these among the 321. But my protection means neither favour nor weakness. It means doubled care and doubled severity against vice. Go and lock that door. Julien made an effort to walk and managed not to fall. He noticed that a little window near the entrance door looked out onto the country. He saw the trees. That sight did him as much good as the sight of old friends. La querisne linquam latinam? Do you speak Latin? said the Abbe Parade to him as he came back. Eta pate, optime. Yes, excellent father, answered Julien, recovering himself a little. But it was certain that nobody in the world had ever appeared to him less excellent than had Monsieur Parade for the last half hour. The conversation continued in Latin. The expression in the Abbe's eyes softened. Julien regained some self possession. How weak I am, he thought, to let myself be imposed on by these appearances of virtue. The man is probably nothing more than a rascal, like Monsieur Maslon, and Julien congratulated himself on having hidden nearly all his money in his boots. The Abbe Perard examined Julien in theology. He was surprised at the extent of his knowledge, but his astonishment increased when he questioned him in particular on sacred scriptures. But when it came to questions of the doctrines of the fathers, he perceived that Julien scarcely even knew the names of St. Jerome, St. Augustine, St. Bonaventure, St. Basile, etc., etc. As a matter of fact, thought the Abbe Perrin, this is simply that fatal tendency to Protestantism for which I have always reproached Chalin, a profound and only too profound knowledge of the Holy Scriptures. Julian had just started speaking to him, without being questioned on the point, about the real time when Genesis, the Pentateuch, etc. had been written. To what does this never-ending reasoning over the Holy Scriptures lead to, thought the Abbe Pirar, if not to self-examination, that is to say, the most awful Protestantism? And by the side of this imprudent knowledge, nothing about the fathers to compensate for that tendency but the astonishment of the director of the seminary was quite unbounded when, having questioned Julien about the authority of the Pope and expecting to hear the maxims of the ancient Gallican Church, the young man recited to him the whole book of Monsieur de Maistre. Strange man, that Chalin, thought the Abbe Pirat. Does he show him the book simply to teach him to make fun of it? It was in vain that he questioned Julien and endeavoured to guess if he seriously believed in the doctrine of Monsieur de Maistre. 
The young man only answered what he had learnt by heart. From this moment Julien was really happy. He felt that he was master of himself. After a very long examination, it seemed to him that Monsieur Perrault's severity towards him was only affected. Indeed, the director of the seminary would have embraced Julien in the name of logic, for he found so much clearness, precision and lucidity in his answers, had it not been for the principles of austere gravity towards his theology pupils, which he had inculcated in himself for the last fifteen years. Here we have a bold and healthy mind, he said to himself, but corpus debile, the body is weak. Do you often fall like that? he said to Julien in French, pointing with his finger to the floor. It's the first time in my life the porter's face unnerved me, added Julien, blushing like a child. The Abbe Perrard almost smiled. That's the result of vain worldly pomp. You are apparently accustomed to smiling faces, those veritable theatres of falsehood. Truth is austere, monsieur, but is not our task down here also austere? You must be careful that your conscience guards against that weakness of yours, too much sensibility to vain external graces. If you had not been recommended to me, said the Abbe Perrard, resuming the Latin language with an obvious pleasure, if you had not been recommended by a man, by the Abbe Chalin, I would talk to you the vain language of that world, to which it would appear you are only too well accustomed. I would tell you that the full stipend which you solicit is the most difficult thing in the world to obtain. But the fifty-six years which the Abbe Chalin has spent in apostolic work have stood him in poor stead if he cannot dispose of a stipend at the seminary. After these words, the Abbe Perard recommended Julien not to enter any secret society or congregation without his consent. I give you my word of honour, said Julien, with all an honest man's expansion of heart. The director of the seminary smiled for the first time. That expression is not used here, he said to him. It is too reminiscent of that vain honour of worldly people which leads them to so many errors and often to so many crimes. You owe me obedience by virtue of paragraph 17 of the bull Unam Ecclesiam of St. Pius V. I am your ecclesiastical superior. To hear in this house, my dear son, is to obey. How much money have you? So here we are, said Julian to himself. That was the reason for the, my very dear son. Thirty-five francs, my father. Write out carefully how you use that money. You will have to give me an account of it. This painful audience had lasted three hours. Julian summoned the porter. Go and install Julian Sorel in cell number 103, said the Abbe Perard to the man. As a great favour, he let Julien have the place all to himself. Carry his box there, he added. Julien lowered his eyes and recognised his box just in front of him. He had been looking at it for three hours and had not recognised it. As he arrived at number 103, which was a little room eight feet square on the top story of the house, Julien noticed that it looked out onto the ramparts, and he perceived beyond them the pretty plain which the Doube divides from the town. What a charming view, exclaimed Julien. In speaking like this, he did not feel what the words actually expressed. The violent sensations which he had experienced during the short time that he had been at Besançon had absolutely exhausted his strength. He sat down near the window on the one wooden chair in the cell and fell at once into profound sleep. He did not hear either the supper bell or the bell for benediction. They had forgotten him. When the first rays of the sun woke him up the following morning, he found himself lying on the floor. End of section 25section 26 of The Red and the Black by Stendhal, translated by Horace Barnett Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Chapter 26 the world, or what the rich lack. I am alone in the world, no one deigns to spare me a thought. All those whom I see make their fortune, have an insolence and hardness of heart which I do not feel in myself. They hate me by reason of kindness and good humour. Oh, I shall die soon, either from starvation or the unhappiness of seeing men so hard of heart. Young 
He hastened to brush his clothes and run down. He was late. Instead of trying to justify himself, Julien crossed his arms over his breast. Pecavi pata optime. I have sinned. I confess my fault, O oh my father, he said with a contrite air. This first speech was a great success. The clever ones among the seminarists saw that they had to deal with a man who knew something about the elements of the profession. The recreation hour arrived, and Julian saw that he was the object of general curiosity, but he only manifested reserved silence. Following the maxims he had laid down for himself, he considered his 321 comrades as enemies. The most dangerous of all in his eyes was the Abbe Pirard. A few days afterwards, Julien had to choose a confessor, and was given a list. Great heavens, what do they take me for, he said to himself. Do they think I don't understand what's what? Then he chose the Abbe Pirard. This step proved decisive without his suspecting it. A little seminarist who was quite young and a native of Verrières, and who had declared himself his friend since the first day, informed him that he would probably have acted more prudently if he had chosen Monsieur Castanede, the sub-director of the seminary. The Abbe Castanede is the enemy of Parade, who is suspected of Jansenism, added the little seminarist in a whisper. All the first steps of our hero were, in spite of the prudence on which he plumed himself, as much mistakes as his choice of a confessor. Misled as he was by all the self-confidence of a man of imagination, he took his projects for facts and believed that he was a consummate hypocrite. His folly went so far as to reproach himself for his success in this kind of weakness. Alas, it is my only weapon, he said to himself. At another period I should have earned my livelihood by eloquent deeds in the face of the enemy. Satisfied as he was with his own conduct, Julien looked around him. He found everywhere the appearance of the purest virtue. Eight or ten seminarists lived in the odour of sanctity and had visions like St. Teresa and St. Francis when he received his stigmata on Mount Vernia in the Apennines. But it was a great secret, and their friends concealed it. These poor young people who had visions were always in the infirmary. A hundred others combined an indefatigable application to a robust faith. They worked till they fell ill, but without learning much. Two or three were distinguished by a real talent, among others a student of the name of Chazelle, but both they and Julien felt mutually unsympathetic. The rest of these 321 seminarists consisted exclusively of coarse persons who were by no means sure of understanding the Latin words which they kept on repeating the live-long day. Nearly all were the sons of peasants, and they preferred to gain their livelihood by reciting some Latin words than by ploughing the earth. It was after this examination of his colleagues that Julien, during the first few days, promised himself a speedy success. Intelligent people are needed in every service, he said to himself, for after all there is work to be done. I should have been a sergeant under Napoleon. I should be a grand vicar among these future curés. All these poor devils, he added, manual labourers as they have been since their childhood, have lived on curded milk and black bread up till they arrived here. They would only eat five or six times a year in their hovels. Like the Roman soldiers who used to find war the time of rest, these poor peasants are enchanted with the delights of the seminary. Julien could never read anything in their gloomy eyes but the satisfaction of physical craving after dinner and the expectation of sensual pleasure before the meal. Such were the people among whom Julien had to distinguish himself, but the fact which he did not know, and which they refrained from telling him, was that coming out first in the different courses of dogma, ecclesiastical history, etc., etc., which are taken at the seminary, constituted in their eyes neither more nor less than a splendid sin. Since the time of Voltaire and two-chamber government, which is at bottom simply distrust and personal self-examination and gives the popular mind that bad habit of being suspicious, the Church of France seems to have realised that books are its real enemies. It is a submissive heart which counts for everything in its eyes. It suspects, and rightly so, any success in studies, even sacred ones. What is to prevent a superior man from crossing over to the opposite side, like Sierre or Gregory? The trembling church clings on to the Pope as its one chance of safety. 
The Pope alone is in a position to attempt to paralyse all personal self-examination and to make an impression by means of the pompous piety of his court ceremonial on the bored and morbid spirit of fashionable society. Julian, as he began to get some glimpse of these various truths, which are nonetheless in total contradiction to all the official pronouncements of any seminary, fell into a profound melancholy. He worked a great deal, and rapidly succeeded in learning things which were extremely useful to a priest, extremely false in his own eyes, and devoid of the slightest interest for him. He felt there was nothing else to do. Am I then forgotten by the whole world, he thought? He did not know that Monsieur Perard had received and thrown into the fire several letters with the Dijon stamp, in which the most lively passion would pierce through the most formal conventionalism of style. This love seems to be fought by great attacks of remorse. All the better, thought the Abbe Perard. At any rate, this lad has not loved an infidel woman. One day, the Abbe Perard opened a letter which seemed half blotted out by tears. It was an adieu forever. At last, said the writer to Julien, heaven has granted me the grace of hating not the author of my fall, but my fall itself. The sacrifice has been made, dear one, not without tears, as you see. The safety of those to whom I must devote my life and whom you love so much is the decisive factor. A just but terrible God will no longer see his way to avenge on them their mother's crimes. Adieu, Julien. Be just towards all men. The end of the letter was nearly entirely illegible. The writer gave an address at Dijon, but at the same time expressed the hope that Julien would not answer, or at any rate would employ language which a reformed woman could read without blushing. Julien's melancholy, aggravated by the mediocre nourishment which the contractor who gave dinners at thirteen centimes per head supplied to the seminary, began to affect his health when Fouquet suddenly appeared in his room one morning. I have been able to get in at last. I have duly been five times to Bessinson in order to see you. Could never get in. I put someone by the door to watch. Why the devil don't you ever go out? It is a test which I have imposed on myself. I find you greatly changed, but here you are again. I have just learned from a couple of good five-franc pieces that I was only a fool not to have offered them on my first journey. The conversation of the two friends went on forever. Julien changed colour when Fouquet said to him, Do you know, by the by, that your pupil's mother has become positively devout? And he began to talk in that offhand manner which makes so singular an impression on the passionate soul, whose dearest interests are being destroyed without the speaker having the faintest suspicion of it. Yes, my friend, the most exalted devoutness, she is said to make pilgrimages. But to the eternal shame of the Abbe Maslon, who has played the spy so long on that poor Monsieur Chelan, Madame de Renal would have nothing to do with him. She goes to confession to Dijon or Bessinson. She goes to Bessinson, says Julien, flushing all over his forehead. Pretty often, said Fouquet in a questioning manner. Have you got any constitutionals on you? What do you say? replied Fouquet. I am asking you if you've got any constitutionnels, went on Julien in the quietest tone imaginable. They cost thirty sous a number here. What? exclaimed Fouquet. Liberals, even in the seminary? Poor France, he added, assuming the Abbe Maslon's hypocritical voice and sugary tone. This visit would have made a deep impression on our hero if he had not been put on the track of an important discovery by some words addressed to him the following day by the little seminarist from Verrières. Julien's conduct, since he had been at the seminary, had been nothing but a series of false steps. He began to make bitter fun of himself. In point of fact, the important actions in his life had been cleverly managed, but he was careless about details, and cleverness in a seminary consists in attention to details. Consequently, he had already the reputation among his comrades of being a strong-minded person. He had been betrayed by a number of little actions. He had been convicted in their eyes of this enormity, he thought, and judged for himself instead of blindly following authority and example. The Abbe Pirard had been no help to him. He had not spoken to him on a single occasion apart from the confessional, and even there he listened more than he spoke. Matters would have been very different if he had chosen the Abbe Castanade. The moment that Julien realised his folly, he ceased to be bored. 
He wished to know the whole extent of the evil, and to effect this he emerged a little from that haughty, obstinate silence with which he had scrupulously rebuffed his comrades. It was now that they took their revenge on him. His advances were welcomed by a contempt verging on derision. He realised that there had not been one single hour from the time of his entry into the seminary, particularly during recreation time, which had not resulted in affecting him one way or another, which had not increased the number of his enemies, or won for him the good will of some seminarist who was either sincerely virtuous or of a fibre slightly less coarse than that of the others. The evil to repair was infinite, and the task very difficult. Henceforth, Julien's attention was always on guard. The problem before him was to map out a new character for himself. The moving of his eyes, for example, occasioned him a great deal of trouble. It is with good reason that they are carried lowered in these places. How presumptuous I was at Verrieres, said Julien to himself. I thought I lived, I was only preparing for life, and here I am at last in the world such as I shall find it, until my part comes to an end, surrounded by real enemies. What immense difficulties, he added, are involved in keeping up this hypocrisy every single minute. It is enough to put the labours of Hercules into the shade. The Hercules of modern times is the Pope Sixtus Quintus, who deceived by his modesty fifteen years on end forty cardinals who had seen the liveliness and haughtiness of his whole youth. So knowledge is nothing here, he said to himself with disgust. Progress in doctrine, in sacred history, etc., only seem to count. Everything said on these subjects is only intended to entrap fools like me. Alas, my only merit consists in my rapid progress and in the way in which I grasp all their nonsense. Do they really value those things at their true worth? Do they judge them like I do? And I had the stupidity to be proud of my quickness. The only result of my coming out top has been to give me inveterate enemies. Chazelle, who really knows more than I do, always throws some blunder in his compositions which get him put back to the fiftieth place. If he comes out first, it is only because he is absent-minded. Oh, how useful would one word, just one word, of Monsieur Parade have been to me. As soon as Julien was disillusioned, the long exercises in ascetic piety, such as the attendances in the chapel five times a week, the intonation of hymns at the chapel of the Sacré-Cœur, etc., etc., which had previously seemed to him so deadly boring, became his most interesting opportunities for action. Thanks to a severe introspection, and above all by trying not to overdo his methods, Julien did not attempt at the outset to perform significant actions, that is to say, actions which are proof of a certain Christian perfection, like those seminarists who served as a model to the rest. Seminarists have a special way even of eating a poached egg which betokens progress in the devout life. The reader who smiles at this will perhaps be good enough to remember all the mistakes which the Abbe de Lille made over the eating of an egg when he was invited to breakfast with a lady at the court of Louis XVI. Julien first tried to arrive at the state of non culpa, that is to say, the state of the young seminarist whose demeanour and manner of moving his arms, eyes, etc., while in fact without any trace of worldliness, do not yet indicate that the person is entirely absorbed by the conception of the other world and the idea of the pure nothingness of this one. Julien incessantly found such phrases as these, charcoaled on the walls of the corridors. What are sixty years of ordeals balanced against an eternity of delights or an eternity of boiling oil in hell? He despised them no longer. He realised that it was necessary to have them incessantly before his eyes. What am I going to do all my life, he said to himself. I shall sell to the faithful a place in heaven. How am I going to make that place visible to their eyes? By the difference between my appearance and that of a layman. After several months of absolutely unremitting application, Julien still had the appearance of thinking. The way in which he would move his eyes and hold his mouth did not betoken that implicit faith which is ready to believe everything and undergo everything, even at the cost of martyrdom. Julien saw with anger that he was surprised in this by the coarsest peasants. There was good reason for their not appearing full of thought. What pains did he not take to acquire that facial expression of blindly fervent faith which is found so frequently in the Italian convents and of which Le Gretchen has left such perfect models in his church pictures for the benefit of us laymen? 
On feast days, the seminarists were regaled with sausages and cabbage. Julien's table neighbours observed that he did not appreciate this happiness. That was looked upon as one of his paramount crimes. His comrades saw in this a most odious tray and the most foolish hypocrisy. Nothing made him more enemies. Look at this bourgeois, look at this stuck-up person, they would say, who pretends to despise the best rations there are, sausages and cabbage, shame on the villain, the haughty wretch, he is damned for ever. Alas, these young peasants who are my comrades find their ignorance an immense advantage, Julien would exclaim in his moments of discouragement. The professor has not got to deliver them on their arrival at the seminary from that awful number of worldly ideas which I brought into it and which they read on my face, whatever I do. Julien watched with an attention bordering on envy the coarsest of the little peasants who arrived at the seminary. From the moment when they were made to doff their shabby jackets to don the black robe, their education consisted of an immense and limitless respect for hard liquid cash, as they say in Franche Comte. That is the consecrated and heroic way of expressing the sublime idea of current money. These seminarists, like the heroes in Voltaire's novels, found their happiness in dining well. Julien discovered in nearly all of them an innate respect for the man who wears a suit of good cloth. This sentiment appreciates the distributive justice which is given us at our courts, at its value, or even above its true value. What can one gain, they would often repeat among themselves, by having a lawsuit with a big man? That is the expression current in the valleys of the Jura to express a rich man. One can judge of their respect for the richest entity of all, the government. Failure to smile deferentially at the mere name of Monsieur the Prefect is regarded as an imprudence in the eyes of the Franche Comte peasant, and imprudence in poor people is quickly punished by lack of bread. After having been almost suffocated at first by his feeling of contempt, Julien eventually experienced a feeling of pity. It often happened that the fathers of most of his comrades would enter their hovel in winter evenings and fail to find there either bread, chestnuts or potatoes. What is there astonishing then, Julien would say to himself, if in their eyes the happy man is in the first place the one who has just had a good dinner, and in the second place the one who possesses a good suit? My comrades have a lasting vocation. That is to say, they see in the ecclesiastical calling a long continuance of the happiness of dining well and having a warm suit. Julien happened to hear a young imaginative seminarist say to his companion, Why shouldn't I become Pope like Sixtus Quintus, who kept pigs? They only make Italians popes, answered his friend, but they will certainly draw lots among us for the great vicarships, canonries and perhaps bishoprics. Monsieur P., Bishop of Chalon, is the son of a cooper. That's what my father is. One day, in the middle of a theology lesson, the Abbe Pirard summoned Julien to him. The young fellow was delighted to leave the dark, moral atmosphere in which he had been plunged. Julien received from the director the same welcome which had frightened him so much on the first day of his entry. Explain to me what is written on this playing card he said, looking at him in a way calculated to make him sink into the earth. Julien read, Amanda Binet of the Giraffe Café before eight o'clock. Say you're from Jean Lee and my mother's cousin. Julien realised the immense danger. The spies of the Abbe Castanade had stolen the address. I was trembling with fear the day I came here, he answered, looking at the Abbe Parade's forehead, for he could not endure that terrible gaze. Monsieur Chalin told me that this is a place of informers and mischief-makers of all kinds, and that spying and tail-bearing by one comrade on another was encouraged by the authorities. Heaven wishes it to be so, so as to show life such as it is to the young priests, and fill them with disgust for the world and all its pomps. "'And it's to me that you make these fine speeches?' said the Abbe Pirard, furiously. "'You young villain!' "'My brothers used to beat me at Verrier,' answered Julien coldly when they had occasion to be jealous of me. "'Indeed, indeed!' exclaimed Monsieur Pirard, almost beside himself. Julien went on with his story without being in the least intimidated. "'The day of my arrival at Besançon I was hungry, and I entered a café. My spirit was full of revulsion for so profane a place, but I thought that my breakfast would cost me less than at an inn. 
A lady, who seemed to be the mistress of the establishment, took pity on my inexperience. Besançon is full of bad characters, she said to me. I fear something will happen to you, sir. If some mishap should occur to you, have recourse to me and send to my house before eight o'clock. If the porters of the seminary refuse to execute your errand, say you are my cousin and a native of Jeanly. I will have all this chatter verified, exclaimed the Abbe Pirard, unable to stand still and walking about the room. Back to the cell. The Abbe followed Julian and locked him in. The latter immediately began to examine his trunk, at the bottom of which the fatal cards had been so carefully hidden. Nothing was missing in the trunk, but several things had been disarranged. Nevertheless, he had never been without the key. What luck that during the whole time of my blindness, said Julian to himself, I never availed myself of the permission to go out that Monsieur Castanade would offer me so frequently, with a kindness which I now understand. Perhaps I should have had the weakness to have changed my clothes and gone to see the fair Amanda, and then I should have been ruined. When they gave up hope of exploiting that piece of information for the accomplishment of his ruin, they had used it to inform against him. Two hours afterwards the director summoned him. "'You did not lie,' he said to him, with a less severe look. "'But keeping an address like that is an indiscretion of a gravity which you are unable to realise. "'Unhappy child, it may perhaps do you harm in ten years' time.'" End of section 26